Preface and Chapter 1 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Preface to the original edition. It may be a recommendation to the lover of light literature to be told that the following story does not involve the complication of a plot. It is a mere continuous narrative of an almost everyday exaggeration, interspersed with sporting scenes and excellent illustrations by Leech. March 31st, 1858. Chapter 1. Our Hero and Co. A Sleeping Partner. Considering that Billy Pringle, or Fine Billy as his good-natured friends called him, was only an underbred chap, he was as good an imitation of a swell as ever we saw. He had all the airy dreaminess of a hereditary high flyer, while his big talk and offhand manner strengthened the delusion. It was only when you came to close quarters with him and found that though he talked in pounds he acted in pence, and marked his fine dictionary words and labored expletives, that you came to the conclusion that he was painfully gentlemanly. So few people, however, agree upon what a gentleman is that Billy was well calculated to pass muster with the million. Fine shirts, fine ties, fine talk, fine trinkets go a long way towards furnishing the character with many. Billy was liberal, not to say prodigal, in all these. The only infallible rule we know is that the man who is always talking about being a gentleman never is one. Just as the man who is always talking about honor, morality, fine feeling, and so on never knows anything of these qualities but the name. Nature had favored Billy's pretensions in the lady-killing way. In person, he was above the middle height, five feet eleven or so, slim and well-proportioned, with a finely shaped head and face, fair complexion, light brown hair, laughing blue eyes with long lashes, good eyebrows, regular pearly teeth, and delicately penciled mustache. Whiskers he did not aspire to. Nor did Billy abuse the gifts of nature by disguising himself in any of the vulgar, groomy, gamekeepery style of dress that so effectually reduce all mankind to the level of the laborer nor adopt any of the loud patterns that have lately figured so conspicuously in our streets. On the contrary, he studied the quiet, unobtrusive order of costume and the harmony of colors with a view of producing a perfectly elegant general effect. Neatly fitting frock or dress coats instead of baggy sacks with trouser legs for sleeves, quiet pattern vests, and equally quiet pattern trousers. If he could only have been easy in them, he would have done extremely well, but there was always a nervous twitching and jerking and feeling, as if he was wondering what people were thinking or saying of him. In the dress department, he was ably assisted by his mother, a lady of very considerable taste, who not only fashioned his clothes, but his mind. Indeed, we might add his person, Billy having taken after her, as they say. For his father, though an excellent man and warm, was rather of the suet-dumpling order of architecture. Short, thick, and round, with a neck that was rather difficult to find. His name, too, was William, and some, the good-natured ones again, of course, used to say that he might have been called Fine Billy the First, for under the auspices of his elegant wife he had assumed a certain indifference to trade and when in the grand strut at Ramsgate or Broadstairs or any of his watering places, if appealed to about any of the things made or dealt in by any of the concerns in which he was a co, he used to raise his brows and shrug his shoulders and say with a very deprecatory sort of air, "'Pon my life, I should say you're right, or indeed I should say it was so, just as if he was one of the other Pringles, the Pringles who have nothing to do with trade and in no ways connected with Pringle and Co., Pringle and Potts, Smith Sharp and Pringle, or any of the firms that the Pringles carried on under the titles of the original founders. He was neither a tradesman nor a gentleman. The Pringles, like the happy united family we meet upon wheels, the dove nestling with the gorged cat and so on, all pulled well together when there was a common victim to plunder and kept their hands in by what they called taking fair advantages of each other, that is to say, cheating each other when there was not. Nobody knew the ins and outs of the Pringles. If they let their own right hands know what their left hands did, they took care not to let anybody else's right hand know. In a multiplicity of concerns, they rivaled that great man, Co, who the country lad coming to London said seemed to be in partnership with almost everybody. The author of Who's Who would be puzzled to post people who are Brown in one place, Jones in a second, and Robinson in a third. Still, the Pringles were a most respectable family, mercantile morality being too often mere matter of moonshine. The only member of the family who was not exactly legally honest, legal honesty being much more elastic than common honesty, was cunning Jerry, who thought to cover by his piety the omissions of his practice. He was a fawning, sanctified, smooth-spoken, plausible, plump little man who seemed to be swelling with the milk of human kindness, anxious only to pour it out upon some deserving object. His manner was so frank and bland, and his front face smile so sweet that it was cruel of his side one to contradict the impression and show the cunning duplicity of his nature. 
Still he smirked and smiled, and bless you, dear, and hope you're happy, dear, the women, that being a bachelor, they all thought it best to put up with his mistakes, as he called his peculations, and sought his favor by frequent visits with appropriate presents to his elegant villa at Peckham Rye. Here he passed for quite a model man, twice to church every Sunday and to the lecture in the evening, and would not profane the sanctity of the day by having a hot potato to eat with his cold meat. He was a ripe rogue, and had been jointly or severally, as the lawyers say, in a good many little transactions that would not exactly bear inspection. And these mistakes, not tallying with the sanctified character he assumed, he had been obliged to wriggle out of them as best he could, with the loss of as few feathers as possible. At first, of course, he always tried the humbugging system, at which he was a great adept. That failing, he had recourse to bullying, at which he was not bad, declaring that the party complaining was an ill-natured, ill-conditioned, quarrelsome fellow who merely wanted a peg to hang a grievance upon, and that Jerry, so far from defrauding him, had been the best friend he ever had in his life, and that he would put him through every court in the kingdom before he would be imposed upon by him. If neither of these answered, and Jerry found himself pinned in a corner, he feigned madness, when his solicitor, Mr. Supple, appeared, and by dint of legal threats, and declaring that if the unmerited persecution was persisted in, it would infallibly consign his too sensitive client to a lunatic asylum, he generally contrived to get Jerry out of the scrape by some means or other best known to themselves. Then Jerry, of course, being clear, would innuendo his own version of the story as dexterously as he could, always taking care to avoid a collision with the party, but more than insinuating that he, Jerry, had been infamously used, and his well-known love of peace and quietness taken advantage of, and though men of the world generally suspect the party who is most anxious to propagate his story to be in the wrong, yet their number is but small compared to those who believe anything they are told, and who cannot put that and that together for themselves. So Jerry went on robbing and praying and passing for a very proper man. Some called him Cunning Jerry, to distinguish him from an uncle who was Jerry also, but as this name would not do for the family to adopt, he was generally designated by them as want nothing but what's right, Jerry, that being the form of words with which he generally prefaced his extortions. In the same way, they distinguish between a fat Joe and a thin one, calling the thin one merely Joe, and the fat one Joe who can't get within half a yard of the table. And between two clerks, each bearing the not uncommon name of Smith, one being called Smith, the other head and shoulders Smith, the latter, of course, taking his title from his figure. With this outline of the Pringle family, we will proceed to draw out such of its members as figure more conspicuously in our story. With Mrs. William Pringle's, nay willing, birth, parentage, and education, we would gladly furnish the readers of this work with some information. But unfortunately, it does not lie in our power to do so, for the simple reason that we do not know anything. We first find her located at that eminent court milliner and dressmakers, Madame Adelaide Van Boxany, in Furbelow Street, Berkeley Square, where her elegant manners and obliging disposition, to say nothing of her taste in torturing ribbons and wreaths, and her talent for making plain girls into pretty ones, earned for her a very distinguished reputation. She soon became first-hand or trier on, and unfortunately was afterwards tempted into setting up for herself, when she soon found that though fine ladies like to be cheated, it must be done in style and by someone, if not with a carriage, at all events with a name, and that a bonnet, though beautiful in Bond Street, loses all power of attraction if it is known to come out of Bloomsbury. Miss Willing was therefore soon sold up, and Madame Van Boxany, whose real name was Brown, Jane Brown, wife of John Brown, who was a billiard table maker until his wife's fingers set him up in a gig, Madame Van Boxany, we say, thinking to profit by Miss Willing's misfortunes, offered her a very reduced salary to return to her situation. But Miss Willing, having tasted the sweets of bed, a thing she very seldom did at Madame Van Boxney's, at least not during the season, stood out for more money, the consequence of which was she lost that chance and had the benefit of Madame's bad word at all the other establishments she afterwards applied to. In this dilemma, she resolved to turn her hand to ladies' maidism, and having mastered the science of hairdressing, she made the rounds of the accustomed servant shops, grocers, oilmen's, brushmen, and so on, asking if they knew of anyone wanting a perfect lady's maid. As usual in almost all the affairs of life, the first attempt was a failure. She got into what she thoroughly despised, an untitled family, where she had a great deal more to do than she liked and was grossly put upon both by the master and missus. She gave the place up because, as she said, the master would come into the missus's room with nothing but his nightshirt and spectacles on. But in reality, because the missus had some of her things made up for the children instead of passing them on, as of right they ought to have been to her. She deeply regretted ever having demeaned herself by taking such a situation. Being thus out of place, and finding that many applications she made for other situations when she gave a reference to her former one, always resulted in the ladies declining her services, sometimes on the plea of being already suited, or of another young person having applied just before her, or of her being too young, they never said too pretty, though one elderly lady on seeing her shook her head and said she had sons, and being tired of living on old tea leaves, Miss Willing resolved to sink her former place and advertise as if she had just left Madame Van Boxney's. 
Accordingly, she drew out a very specious advertisement headed to the nobility, offering the services of a lady's maid who thoroughly understood millinery, dressmaking, hairdressing, and getting up fine linen, with an address to a cheese shop, and made an arrangement to give Madame Bamboxany a lift with a heavy wedding order she was busy upon if she would recommend her as just fresh from her establishment. This advertisement produced a goodly crop of letters, and Miss Willing presently closed with the Honorable Mrs. Cavison, whose husband was a good deal connected with the turf, enjoying that certain road to ruin which so many have pursued. And it says much for Miss Willing's acuteness that though she entered Mrs. Cavison's service late in the day, when all the preliminaries for a smash had been perfected, her fine sensibilities and discrimination enabled her to anticipate the coming evil, and to deposit her mistress's jewelry in a place of safety three quarters of an hour before the bailiffs entered. This act of fidelity greatly enhanced her reputation, and as it was well known that poor dear Mrs. Cavison would not be able to keep her, there were several great candidates for this treasure of a maid. Miss Willing had now nothing to do but pick and choose, and after some consideration she selected what she called a high-quality family, one where there was a regular assessed taxpayer establishment of servants, where the butler sold his lord's wine custom to the highest bidder, and the heads of all the departments received their regulars upon the tradesmen's bills, the lady never demeaning herself by wearing the same gloves or ball shoes twice, or propitiating the nurse by presence of raiment that was undoubtedly hers, we mean the maids. She was a real lady in the proper acceptation of the term. This was the beautiful and then newly married Countess de Lacy, whose exquisite garniture will still live in the recollection of many of the now bald-headed beaux of that period. For these delightful successes, the Countess was mainly indebted to our hero's mother, Miss Willing, whose suggestive genius oft came to the aid of the perplexed and exhausted milliner. It was to the service of the Countess de Lacy that Miss Willing was indebted for becoming the wife of Mr. Pringle, afterwards Fine Billy I, an event that deserves to be introduced in a separate chapter. End of Preface and Chapter 1 Read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 2 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 2 The Road. It was on a cold, damp, raw December morning before the emancipating civilization of railways that our hero's father, then returning from a trading tour after stamping up and down the damp flags before the Lion and Unicorn Hotel and Posting House in Slopperton, waiting for the old true blue independent coach, Kuman Hoop, for whose cramped inside he had booked a preference seat, at length found himself bundled into the straw-bottomed vehicle to a very different companion to what he was accustomed to meet in those deplorable conveyances. Instead of a fusty old farmer or a crummy basket-encumbered market woman, he found himself opposite a smiling, radiant young lady, whose elegant dress and ring-bedizened hand proclaimed, as indeed was then generally the case with ladies, that she was traveling in a coach for the first time in her life. This was our fair friend Miss Willing. The Earl and Countess de Lacy had just received an invitation to spend the Christmas at Tiara Castle, where the Countess on the previous year had received, if not a defeat, at all events had not achieved a triumph, in the dressing way, over the Countess of Honiton, whose maid Miss Criblace, though now bribed to secrecy with a full set of very little the worse for wear chinchilla fur, had kept the fur and told the secret to Miss Willing, that their ladyships were to meet again. Miss Willing was now on her way to town to arrange with the Countess's milliner for an annihilating series of morning and evening dresses wherewith to extinguish Lady Honiton, it being utterly impossible, as our fair friends will avouch, for any lady to appear twice in the same attire. How thankful men ought to be that the same rule does not prevail with them! Miss Willing was extremely well got up, for being of nearly the same size as the Countess, her ladyship slightly worn things passed on to her with scarcely a perceptible diminution of freshness, it being remarkable how in even third- and fourth-rate establishments, dresses that were not fit for the misses to be seen in come out quite new and smart on the maid. On this occasion, Miss Willing ran entirely to the dark colors, just such as a lady traveling in her own carriage might be expected to wear. A black terry velvet bonnet with a single ostrich feather, a dark brown levantine silk dress with rich sable cuffs, muff, and boa, and a pair of well-fitting primrose-colored kid gloves, which, if they ever had been on before, had not suffered by the act. Billy, old Billy, that is to say, was quite struck in a heap at such an unwanted apparition, and after the then-usual salutations and inquiries how she would like to have the window, he popped the old question, how far was she going? with very different feelings to what it was generally asked when the traveler wished to calculate how soon he might hope to get rid of his vis-a-vis -vis and lay up his legs on the seat. To town, replied the lady, dimpling her pretty cheeks with a smile. And you, asked she, thinking to have as good as she gave. To 
replied the delighted Billy, divesting himself of a great coarse blue and white worsted comforter, and pulling up his somewhat dejected gills, abandoning the idea of economizing his Lincoln and Bennett by the substitution of an old Gregory's mixture colored fur cap, with his great ears tied over the top, in which he had snoozed and snored through many a long journey. Miss Willing then drew from her richly buckled belt a beautiful Geneva watch set round with pearls, her ladyship's which she was taking to town to have repaired, and Billy followed suit with his substantial gold repeater with which he struck the hour. Miss then ungloved the other hand and passed it down her glossy brown hair, all smooth and regular, for she had just been scrutinizing it in a pocket mirror she had in her gold-embroidered reticule. Billy's commercial soul was in ecstasies, and he was fairly over head and ears in love before they came to the first change of horses. He had never seen such a sample of a hand before, no, nor such a face, and he felt quite relieved when among the multiplicity of rings he failed to discover that thin, plain gold one that intimates so much. Whatever disadvantages old stagecoaches possessed, and their name certainly was Legion, it must be admitted that in a case of this sort their slowness was a recommendation. The old True Blue Independent did not profess to travel or trail above eight miles an hour, and this it only accomplished under favorable circumstances, such as light loads, good roads, and stout steeds, instead of the top heavy cargo that now plowed along the woolly turnpike after the weak jaded horses that seemed hardly able to keep their legs against the keen careening wind. If under such circumstances the wretched concern made the wild beast show looking place in London called an inn where it put up an hour or an hour and a half or so after its time, it was said to be all very well considering, and this perhaps in a journey of sixty miles. Posterity will know nothing of the misery their forefathers underwent in the traveling way, and whenever we hear, which we often do, unreasonable grumblings about the absence of trifling luxuries on railways, we are tempted to wish the parties consigned to a good long ride in an old stagecoach. Why, the worst third class that ever was put next to the engine is infinitely better than the inside of the best of them used to be, to say nothing of the speed. As to the outsides of the old coaches, with their roastings, their soakings, their freezings, and their smotherings with dust, one cannot but feel that the establishment of railways was a downright prolongation of life. Then the coach refreshments, or want of refreshments rather, the turning out at all hours to breakfast, dine, or sup, just as the coach reached the house of a proprietor, would all it, and the cool incivility of everybody about the place. Anything was good enough for a coach passenger. On this auspicious day, though Miss Willing had her reticule full of macaroons and sponge biscuits, and fine Billy the First had a great bulging paper of sandwiches in his brown overcoat pocket, they neither of them felt the slightest approach to hunger ere the lumbering vehicle, after a series of clumsy would-be dash-cutting lurches and evolutions over the rough inequalities of the country pavement, pulled up short at the arched doorway of the Salutation Inn, we beg pardon, hotel, in Bramford Rig and a many-coated, brandy-faced, blear-eyed guard let in a whole hurricane of wind while proclaiming that they dined here and stopped up an hour. Then, fine Billy the First had an opportunity of showing his gallantry and surveying the figure of his inamorata as he helped her down the perilous, mud-shut iron steps of the old independent, and certainly never countess descended from her carriage on a drawing-room day with greater elegance than Miss Willing displayed on the present occasion, showing a little circle of delicate white linen petticoat as she protected her clothes from the mud-begrimed wheel, and just as much fine open-worked stocking above the fringed top of her Adelaide boots. On reaching the ground, which she did with a curtsy, she gave such a sweet smile as emboldened our Billy to offer his arm, and amid the nudging of outsiders and staring of street loungers and make-weighing of in-hangers on, our Billy strutted up the archway with all the dignity of a drum major. His admiration increased as he now became sensible of the lady's height, for like all little men he was an admirer of tall women. As he caught a glimpse of himself in the unbecoming mirror between the drab and red-fringed window curtains of the little back room into which they were ushered, he wished he had had on his new blue coat and bright buttons with a buff vest, instead of the invisible green and black spot swans down one in which he was then attired. The outside passengers, having descended from their eminences, proceeded to flagellate themselves into circulation and throw off their husks, while Billy strutted consequentially in with the lady on his arm, and placed her in the seat of honor beside himself at the top of the table. The outsides then came swarming in, jostling the dishbearers and seating themselves as they could. All seemed bent upon getting as much as they could for their money. Pork was the repast. Pork in various shapes, roast at the top, boiled at the bottom, sausages on one side, fry on the other. And Miss Willing couldn't eat pork, and curious coincidence, neither could Billy. The lady having intimated this to Billy in the most delicate way possible, for she had a particular reason for not wishing to aggravate the new landlord, Mr. Bounceable, Billy gladly sallied forth to give battle as it were on his own account, and by way of impressing the household with his consequence, he ordered a bottle of Tenerife as he passed the bar, and then commenced a furious onslaught about the food when he got into the kitchen. This reading of the Riot Act brought Bounceable from his times, who, having been in the profession himself, took Billy for a nobleman's gentleman, or house steward at least, a class of men not so easily put upon as their masters. 
He therefore, after sundry regrets of the fair not being exactly to their mind, which he attributed to its being washing day, offered to let them have the first turn at a very nice dish of hashed venison that was then simmering on the fire for Mrs. B and himself, provided our travelers would have the goodness to call it hashed mutton so that it might not be devoured by the outsiders, a class of people whom all landlords held in great contempt. To this proposition Billy readily assented and returned triumphantly to the object of his adoration. He then slashed right and left at the roast pork and at every plate but hers full by the time the hashed mutton made its appearance. He then culled out all the delicate tidbits for his fair partner and decked her hot plate with sweet sauce and mealy potatoes. Billy's turn came next, and amidst demands for malt liquor and the arrival of smoking tumblers of brown brandy and water, clatter, platter, clatter, platter became the order of the day, with an occasional suspicious, not to say dissatisfied, glance of a pork-eating passenger of the savory dish at the top of the table. Mr. Bounceable, however, brought in the Tenerife just at the critical moment, when Billy, having replenished both plates, the pork-eaters might have expected to be let in and walked off with the dish in exchange for the decanter. Our friends then pledged each other in a bumper of cape. The pork was followed by an extremely large, strong-smelling Cheshire cheese and a high wooden cradle, which in its turn was followed by an extremely large, strong-smelling man in a mountainous, many-caped Greek coat, who with a bob of his head and a kick out behind intimated that paying time was come for him. Growls were then heard of its not being half an hour, of not having had their full time, accompanied by dives into the pockets and reticules for the needful, each person wondering how little he could give without a snubbing. Quite optional, of course. Billy, who was bent on doing the magnificent, produced a large green and gold tasseled purse almost as big as a stocking, and drew therefrom a great five-shilling piece, which, having tapped imposingly on his plate, he handed ostentatiously to the man, saying, For this lady and me, just as if she belonged to him. Whereupon down went the head, even with the table, with an undertoned intimation that Billy needn't tarry, for he would make it all right with the god. The waiter followed close on the heels of the coachman, drawing everybody for half a crown for the dinner, besides what they had had to drink, and what they pleased for himself. And Billy again anticipated the lady by paying for both. Instead, however, of disputing his right to do so, she seemed to take it as a matter of course, and bent a little forward, and said in a sort of half-whisper, though loud enough to be heard by a twinkling-eyed, clay-complexioned she-outsider sitting opposite, dressed in a puce-colored cloth pelisse and a pheasant-feather bonnet, I fear you will think me very troublesome, but do you think you can manage to get me a finger glass? Twiddling her pretty taper fingers as she spoke. Suddenly, replied Billy, all alacrity, suddenly. With little tepid water, continued Miss Willing, looking imploringly at Billy as he rose to fulfill her behests. Such as, growled Pheasant Feathers to her next neighbor with an indignant toss of her color-varying head. Billy presently appeared, bearing one of the old deep blue patterned finger glasses with a fine damask napkin marked with a ducal coronet, one of the usual perquisites of servitude. Miss then holding each pretty hand downwards, stripped her fingers of their rings just as a gardener strips a stalk of currants of its fruit, dropping, however, a large diamond ring belonging to her ladyship, which she was just airing, skillfully under the table, and for which fat Billy had to dive like a dog after an otter. Oh dear, she was quite ashamed at her awkwardness and the trouble she had given, she assured Billy as he rose red and panting from the pursuit. Done on purpose to show her finery, muttered Pheasant Feather Bonnet with a sneer. Miss, having just passed the wet end of the napkin across her cherry lips and pearly teeth, and dipped her fingers becomingly in the warm water, was restoring her manifold rings when the shrill twang, twang, twang of the horn, with the prancing of some of the newly harnessed cripples on the pavement as they tried to find their legs, sounded up the archway into the little room, and warned our travelers that they should be reinvesting themselves in their wraps. So, declining any more Tenerife, Miss Willing set the example by drawing on her pretty kid gloves and rising to give the time to the rest. Up they all got. End of chapter 2, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 3 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 3, The Road Resumed, Miss Pheasant Feathers. The room, as we said before, being crammed, and our fair friend Miss Willing taking some time to pass gracefully down the line of chairbacks, many of whose late occupants were now swinging their arms about in all the exertion of tying up their mouths and fighting their ways into their overcoats, Mr. Pringle, as he followed, had a good opportunity of examining her exquisite tournure, than which he thought he never saw anything more beautifully perfect. He was quite proud when a little more width of room at the end of the table enabled him to squeeze past a robing Dutch-built British lace-vending packwoman and reclaim his fair friend just as a gentleman does his partner at the end of an old country dance. 
How exultingly he marched her through the line of in-hangers-on, hostlers, waiters, porters, postboys, coachmen, and insatiable Matthews at home of an inestablishment, Boots, a gentleman who will undertake all characters in succession for a consideration. How thankful we ought to be to be done with these harpies. Bounceable, either mistaking the rank of his guests or wanting to have a better look at the lady, emerged from his glass-fronted den of a bar and salaamed them up to the dirty coach, where the highly feed coachman stood door in hand waiting to perform the last act of attention for his money. In went Billy and the beauty, or rather the beauty and Billy. Bang went the door. The outsiders scrambled up onto their perches and shelves as best they could. All right, sit tight, was presently heard, and whip, chip, crack, cut, three blindins and a bolter were again bumping the lumbering vehicle along the cobblestone street, bringing no end of cherry cheeks and corkscrew ringlets to the windows to mark that important epoch of the day, the coach passing by. Billy, feeling all the better for his dinner and inspirited by sundry gulps of wine, proceeded to make himself comfortable in order to open fire as soon as ever the coach got off the stones. He took a rapid retrospect of all the various angels he had encountered, those who had favored him, those who had frowned, and he was decidedly of opinion that he had never seen anything to compare to the fair lady before him. He was rich and thriving and would please himself without consulting what nothing but what's right Jerry, half a yard of the table Joe, or any of them. It wasn't like as if they were to be in co with him and the lady. She would never come into the balance sheets. No, she was to be all his, and they had no business with it. He believed want nothing but what's right would be glad if he never married. Just then, the coach glid from the noisy pavement onto the comparatively speaking silent macadamized road, and Billy and the lady opened fire simultaneously. The lady about the discomforts of coach traveling, which she had never tried before, and Billy about the smack of the Tenerife, which he thought very earthy. He had some capital wine at home, he said, as everybody has. This led him to London, the street conveniences or inconveniences as they then were of the metropolis, which subject he plied for the purpose of finding out as well where the lady lived as whether her carriage would meet her or not. But this she skillfully parried by asking Billy where he lived, and finding it was Doughty Street, Russell Square, she observed, as in truth it is, that it was a very airy part of the town, and proceeded to expatiate on the beauty of the flowers in Covent Garden from whence she got to the theatres, then to the opera, intimating a very considerable acquaintance as well with the capital as with that enchanted circle, the West End, comprising in its contracted limits what is called the world. Billy was puzzled. He wished she mightn't be a cut above him, such lords, such ladies, such knowledge of the court. Could she be a maid of honor? Well, he didn't care. No ask, no have, so he proceeded with the pumping process again. Did she live in town? Fair lady, quite at the year. Billy, during the season, I suppose. Fair lady, during the sitting of Parliament. There again, thought Billy, feeling the expectation funds fall ten per cent at least. Well, fight heart never won fair lady, continued he to himself, considering how next he should sound her. She was very beautiful, what pretty pearly teeth she had, and such a pair of rosy lips, such a fair forehead, too, and such nice hair. He'd give a five-pun note for a kiss. He'd give a ten-pun note for a kiss. Dashed if he wouldn't give a fifty-pun for a kiss. Then he wondered what head and shoulders Smith would think of her. As he didn't seem to be making much progress, however, in the information way, he now desisted from that consideration, and while contemplating her beauty, considered how best he should carry on the siege. Should he declare who and what he was, making the best of himself, of course, and ask her to be equally explicit, or should he beat about the bush a little longer and try to fish out what he could about her? They had a good deal of day before them yet, dark though the latter part of it would be, which, however, on second thoughts he felt might be rather favorable, inasmuch as she wouldn't see when he was taken aback by her answers. He would beat about the bush a little longer. It was very pleasant sport. Did you say you lived in Chelsea? At length asked Billy, in a stupid, self-convicting sort of way. No, replied the fair lady with a smile. I never mentioned Chelsea. Oh, no, no more you did, replied Billy, taken aback, especially as the lady led up to no other place. Did you like the country? At length asked he, thinking to try and fix her locality there if he could not earth her in London. Yes, she liked the country, at least out of the season. There was no place like London in the season, she thought. Billy thought so, too. It was the best place in summer and the only place in winter. Well, the lady didn't know, but if she had to choose either place for a permanency, she would choose London. This sent the Billy funds up a little. He forgot his intention of following her into the country and began to expatiate upon the luxuries of London, the capital fish they got, the cod and oyster sauce, for when excited he knocked his edges about a little. The cod and oyster sauce, the turbot, the mackerel, the mullet, the woodcock of the sea, as he exultingly called it, thinking what a tuck-out he would have in revenge for his country in abstinence. He then got upon the splendor of his own house in Doughty Street, the most agreeable in London. Its spacious entrance, its elegant stone staircase, his beautiful drawing room with its maroon and rose-colored brocaded satin damask curtains and rich tournay carpet, 
its beautiful chandelier of 18 lights and piccolo piano forte, and was describing a most magnificent mirror, we don't know its size, but most beautiful and becoming, when the pace of the vehicle was sensibly felt to relax, and before they had time to speculate on the cause, it had come to a standstill. Stopped, observed Billy, lowering the window to look out for squalls. No sooner was the window down than a head at the door proclaimed mischief. The tete-a-tete was at an end. The guard was going to put pheasant feather bonnet inside. Open sesame, whoosh! In came the cutting wind. Oh dear, what a day! Room for a lady, asked the guard, raising a great half-frozen grog-blossomy face out of the blue and white coil of a shawl cravat in which it was enveloped. Get in, continued he, shouldering the leddy up the steps without waiting for an answer, and in popped pheasant feathers when, slamming to the door, he cried right to the coachman, and on went the vehicle, leaving the enterer to settle into a seat by its shaking after the manner of the omnibus cads who seemed to think all they had to do is to see people pass the door. As it was, the newcomer alighted upon Billy, who cannoned her off against the opposite door, and then he made himself as big as he could, the better to incommode her. Pheasant Feathers, however, having effected an entrance, seemed to regard herself as good as her neighbors, and forthwith proceeded to adjust the window to her liking, despite the eyeing and staring of Miss Willing. Billy was indignant at the nasty peppermint-drop-smelling woman intruding between the wind and his beauty, and inwardly resolved he would dock the guard's fee for his presumption in putting her there. Miss Willing gathered herself together as if afraid of contamination and, forgetting her role, declared after a jolt received in one of her seat shiftings that it was just the smallest coat she had ever been in. She then began to scrutinize her female companion's attire. A cottage bonnet made of pheasant feathers. Was there ever such a frightful thing seen? All the colors of the rainbow combined. Must be a poacher's daughter or a poulterer's. Paste egg-colored ribbons. What a cloth pelisse. Puce color in some parts, bath brick color in others, nearly drab in others. The red bear all over. Dare say she thought herself fine with her braided waist up to her ears. Her glazy gloves might be any color, black, brown, green, gray. Then a qualm shot across Miss Willing's mind that she had seen the police before. Yes, no, yes, she believed it was the very one she had sold to Mrs. Pickle's nursery governess for eighteen shillings. So it was. She had stripped the fur edging off herself, and there were the marks. Who could the wearer be? Where could she have got it? She could not recollect ever having seen her unwholesome face before. And yet the little ferrety white-lashed eyes settled upon her as if they knew her. Who could she be? What if she had lived fellow, will not say what, with the creature somewhere? There was no knowing people out of their working clothes, especially when they set up to ride inside of coaches. Altogether, it was very unpleasant. Billy remarked his fair friend's altered mood and rightly attributed it to the intrusion of the nasty woman, whose gaudy headgear the few flickering rays of a December sun were now lighting up, making the feathers, so beautiful on a bird, look to Billy's mind so ugly on a bonnet, at least on the bonnet that now thatched the frightful face beside him. Billy saw the fair lady was not accustomed to these sort of companions and wished she had only had the sense to book the rest of the inside when the coach stopped to dine. However, it could not be helped now, so, having ascertained that Pheasant Feathers was going all the way to Lunen, as she called it, when the sun sunk behind its massive leaden cloud, preparatory to that long reign of darkness with which travelers were oppressed, for there were no oil lamps to the roofs of stagecoaches, Billy, being no longer able to contemplate the beauties of his charmer, now changed his seat for a little confidential conversation by her side. He then, after a few comforting remarks, not very flattering to Pheasant Feather's beauty, resumed his expatiations about his splendid house in Doty Street, Russell Square, omitting, of course, to mention that it had been fitted up to suit the taste of another lady who had jilted him. He began about his dining room, twenty-five feet by eighteen, with a polished steel fender and pictures all about the walls, for, like many people, he fancied himself a judge of the fine arts, and, of course, was very frequently fleeced. This subject, however, rather hung fire, a dining room being about the last room in a house that a lady cares to hear about, so she presently cajoled him into the more genial region of the kitchen, which, unlike would-be fine ladies of the present day, she was not ashamed to recognize. From the kitchen, they proceeded to the storeroom, which Billy explained was entered by a door at the top of the back stairs, six feet nine by two feet eight, covered on both sides with crimson cloth, brass molded in panels, and mortise latch. He then got upon the endless but never late tiring subject of bedrooms, his best bedroom with a most elegant five feet three canopy top, mahogany bedstead with beautiful French chinch furniture, lined with pink outer and inner valence, trimmed silk tassel fringe, etc., etc., etc. And so he went maundering on, paving the way most elaborately to an offer, as some men are apt to do, instead of getting briskly to the ask mama point, which the ladies are generally anxious to have them at. To be sure, Billy had been bowled over by a fair, or rather unfair, one, who had appeared quite as much interested about his furniture and all his belongings as Miss Willing did, 
and who, when she got the offer and found he was not nearly so well off as Jack Sanderson, declared she was never so surprised in her life as when Billy proposed. For though, as she politely said, everyone who knew him must respect him, yet he had never even entered her head in any other light than that of an agreeable companion. This was Miss Amelia Titterton, afterwards Mrs. Sanderson. Another lady, as we said before, Miss Bowerbank, had done worse, for she had regularly jilted him after putting him to no end of expense in furnishing his house, so that, upon the whole, Billy had cause to be cautious. The coach, too, with its jolts and its jerks and its brandy and water stoppages, is but ill-calculated for the delicate performance of offering, to say nothing of having a pair of nasty, white-lashed, inquisitive-looking ferrety eyes sitting opposite, with a pair of listening ears nestling under the thatch of a pheasant feather bonnet. All things considered, therefore, Billy may perhaps stand excused for his slowness, especially as he did not know but what he was addressing a countess. And so the close of a scarcely dawn December day was followed by the shades of night, and still the jip, jip, jipping, whip, whip, whipping, creak, creak, creaking of the heavy lumbering coach was accompanied by Billy's maunderings about his noble ebony this and splendid mahogany that, varied with here and there a judicious interpretation of an indeed or a how beautiful from Miss Willing, to show how interested she was in the recital, four ladies are generally good listeners, and Miss Willing was essentially so. The demeanor of the witness was lost, to be sure, in the chancery-like darkness that prevailed, and Billy felt it might be all blandishment, for nothing could be more marked or agreeable than the interest both the other ladies had taken in his family, furniture, and effects. Indeed, as he felt, they all took much the same course, for, for cool home questioning, there is no man can compete with an experienced woman. They get to the what-have-you-got-and-what-will-you-do point before a man has settled upon the line of inquiry, very likely before he has got done with that interesting topic of the weather. At length, a sudden turn of the road revealed to our friends, who were sitting with their faces to the horses, the first distant curve of glowworm-like lamps in the distance, and presently the great white invitations to try Warren's or Day and Martin's blacking began to loom through the darkness of the dead walls of the outskirts of London. They were fast approaching the metropolis, the gaunt elms and leafless poplars presently became pure, while castellated and sentry-box-looking summer-houses stood dark in the little paled-off gardens. At last, the villas and semi-detached villas collapsed into one continuous gaslit shop-dotted street. The shops soon became better and more frequent, more ribbons and flowers, and fewer periwinkle stalls. They now got upon the stones. Billy's heart jumped into his mouth at the jerk, for he knew not how soon his charmer and he might part, and as yet he had not even ascertained her locality. Now or never, thought he, rising to the occasion, and with difficulty of utterance he expressed a hope that he might have the pleasure of seeing her own. Thank you, no, replied Miss Willing emphatically, for it was just the very thing she most dreaded, letting him see her reception by the servants. Humph, grunted Billy, feeling his funds fall five and twenty per cent. Mr. De Tunnel must bow back over again, thought he. Not but that I most fully appreciate your kindness, whispered Miss Willing in the sweetest tone possible, right into his ear, thinking by Billy's silence that her vehemence had offended him. But, continued she, I am only going to the house of a friend a long way from you, and I expect a servant to meet me at the Green Man in Oxford Street. Well, let me say you to the gas Green Man, ejaculated Billy, the funds of hope rising more rapidly than his words. It's very kind, whispered Miss Willing, and I feel it very, very much, but... "'But if your servant shouldn't come,' interrupted Billy, "'you'd never find your way to Brompton in this nasty, dense yellow fog.' "'For they had now got into the thick of a fine, fat one. "'Oh, but I'm not going to Brompton,' exclaimed Miss Willing, "'amused at this second bad shot of Billy's at her abode. "'Well, wherever you're going, I shall only be too happy to escort you,' replied Billy. "'I know Lonin well.' "'So do I,' thought Miss Willing, with a sigh. "'And the coach, having now reached that elegant hostelry, "'the George and Blue Badger in High Holborn, "'Miss showed her knowledge of it by intimating to Billy "'that that was the place for him to alight. "'So taking off her glove, she tendered him her soft hand, "'which Billy grasped eagerly, "'still urging her to let him see her home, "'or at all events to the Green Man in Oxford Street. "'Miss, however, firmly but kindly declined his services, "'assuring him repeatedly that she appreciated his kindness, "'which she evinced by informing him "'that she was going to a friend's at Grosvenor Square,' that she would only be in town for a couple of nights, but that if he really wished to see her again, really wished it, she repeated with an emphasis, for she didn't want to be trifled with, she would be happy to see him to tea at eight o'clock on the following evening. Eight o'clock, gasped Billy. Grubna Square, repeated he. I knows it. I'll be with you to a certainty. I'll be with you to a p certainty. So saying, he made a sandwich of her fair taper-fingered hand, and then responded to the inquiry of the guard if there was anyone to get out there by alighting. And he was so excited that he walked off, leaving his new silk umbrella and all his luggage in the coach, exclaiming as he worked his way through the fog to Dowdy Street, Gordon Square, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, Gordon Square, 
was there ever such a beauty? Be with it to a certainty, be with it to a certainty. Saying which, he gave an ecstatic bound and next moment found himself sprawling atop of a murder-crying apple woman in the gutter. Leaving him there to get up at his leisure, let us return to his late companion in the coach. Scarcely was the door closed on his exit ere a sharp shrill, You don't know me! You don't know me! sounded from under the pheasant feather bonnet and shot through Miss Willing like a thrill. No, yes, who is it? ejaculated she, thankful they were alone. Sarah Grimes, to be sure, replied the voice in a semi-tone of exultation. Sarah Grimes, exclaimed Miss Willing, recollecting the various little imp of mischief that ever came about a place, the daughter of a most notorious poacher. So it is. Why, Sarah, who would have ever thought of seeing you grown into a great big woman? I thought you didn't know me, replied Sarah. I used often to run errands for you, added she. I remember, replied Miss Willing, feeling in her reticule for her purse. Sarah had carried certain delicate missives in the country that Miss Willing would now rather have forgotten. How thankful she was that the creature had not introduced herself when her fat friend was in the coach. What are you doing now? asked Miss Willing, jingling up the money at one end of the purse to distinguish between the gold and the silver. Sari explained that being now out of place, she had been recently dismissed from a cheesemonger's at Lutterworth for stealing a copper coal scoop, a pound of whitening, and a pair of gold spectacles, for which a donkey-traveling general merchant had given her seven and sixpence. The guard of the coach, who was her great-uncle, had given her a lift up to town to try what she could do there again. And Miss Willing's quick apprehension, seeing that there was some use to be made of such a sharp-witted thing, having selected a half-sovereign out of her purse, thus addressed her. Well, Sarah, I'm glad to see you again. You are very much improved and will be very good looking. There's half a sovereign for you, handing it to her. And if you'll come to me at six o'clock tomorrow evening in Grosvenor Square, I dare say I shall be able to look after some things that may be useful to you. Thank you, my thank you, exclaimed Sari, delighted at the idea. I'll be with you, you may depend. You know Big Ben, continued Miss Willing, who is my lord's own man. He's hall porter now. Ring and tell him you come for me and he'll let you in at the door. Certainly, mum, certainly, assented Pheasant Feathers, thinking how much more magnificent that would be than sneaking down the area. And the coach now having reached the green man, Miss Willing alighted and took a coach to Grosvenor Square, leaving Miss Grimes to pursue its peregrinations to the end of its journey. And Billy Pringle having, with the aid of the Paules, appeased the basket woman's wrath, was presently ensconced in his beautiful house in Doughty Street. So, tinkle, 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 down goes the curtain on this somewhat long chapter. End of chapter three, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 4 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 4. A Glass Coach. Miss Willing on Grand Costume. Next day, our friend Billy was buried in looking after his lost luggage and burnishing up the gilt buglehorn buttons of the coat, waistcoat, and shorts of the Royal Epping Archers, in which he meant to figure in the evening. Having, through the medium of his boil, ascertained the rank of the owner of the residence where he was going to be regaled, he ordered a glass coach, not a coach made of glass, juvenile readers, in which we could see a gentleman disparting himself like a goldfish in a glass bowl, but a better sort of hackney coach with a less filthy driver which by a beautiful fiction of the times used to be considered the hirer's private carriage. It was not the thing in those days to drive up to a gentleman's door in a public conveyance, and doing the magnificent was very expensive, for the glass fiction involved a pair of gaunt, raw-boned horses, which, with the napless-hatted drab turned up with grease-coated coachmen, left very little change out of a sovereign. How thankful we ought to be to Railways and Mr. Fitzroy for being able to cut about openly at the rate of six pence a mile. The first great man who drove up St. James's Street at high tide in a hansom deserves to have his portrait painted at the public expense, for he opened the door of common sense and utility. What a follow-my-leader world it is! People all took to street cabs simultaneously, just as they did to walking in the park on a Sunday when Count d'Orsay set up his handsomest ombrelle in the world, being no longer able to keep a horse. But we are getting into recent times instead of attending Mr. Pringle to his party. He is supposed to have ordered his glass phenomenon. Now Mr. Forage, the job master in Lamb's Conduit Street, with whom our friend did his magnificence, performed funerals also, as his yard doors indicated, and being rather full, or more properly speaking empty, he acted upon the principle of all coaches being black in the dark and sent a mourning one. So there was a striking contrast between the gaiety of the Royal Epping Archer uniform, pea-green coat with a blue collar, salmon-colored vest and shorts, in which Mr. Pringle was attired, and the gravity of the vehicle that conveyed him. 
However, our lover was so intent upon taking care of his pumps, for the fog had made the flags both slippery and greasy, that he popped in without noticing the peculiarity, and his stuttering knock-kneed hobbledehoy eclipped pole, having closed the door and mounted up behind, they were presently jingling away to the west, Billy putting up first one leg and then the other onto the opposite seat to admire his white gauze silk-encased calves by the gas and chemist windows as they passed. So he went fingering and feeling at his legs, and pulling and hauling at his coat, for the Epping Archer uniform had got rather tight, and moreover had been made on the George the Fourth principle of not being easily got into, along Oxford Street, through Hanover Square, and up Brook Street to the spacious region that contained the object of his adoration. The coach presently drew up at a stately Italian column porticoed mansion. Down goes Paul, but before he gets half through his meditated knock, the door opens suddenly in his face, and he is confronted by Big Ben in the full livery, we beg pardon, uniform of the De Lacy family, beetroot-colored coat with cherry-colored vest and shorts, the whole elaborately bedizened with gold lace. The unexpected apparition, rendered more formidable by the blazing fire in the background, throwing a lurid light over the giant, completely deprived little Paul of his breath, and he stood gaping and shaking as if he expected the monster to address him. Who may you please to want? At length demanded Ben, in a deep, sonorous tone of mingled defiance and contempt. People please would want, stuttered little Paul, now recollecting that he had never been told who to ask for. Yes, who do you wish to see? demanded Ben, in a clear, explanatory tone. For though he had agreed to dress up for the occasion on the reciprocity principle, of course, Miss Willing winking at his having two nephews living in the house, he by no means undertook to furnish civility to any of the undergraduates of life, as he called such apologies as Paul. I'll ask, replied Paul, glad to escape back to the coach, out of which the royal archer's bullhead was now protruding, anxious to be emancipated. Who, who am I to ask for, please? stuttered Paul, trembling all over with fear and excitement, for he had never seen such a sight except in a show. Oscar, muttered Billy, now recollecting for the first time that the fair lady and he were mutually ignorant of each other's names. Oscar, what if it should be a hoax, thought he, how foolish it would look. While these thoughts were revolving in Billy's mind, Big Ben, having thrust his hands deep into the pockets of his cherry-colored shorts, was contemplating the dismal-looking coach in the disdainful cock-up-nose sort of way that a high-life Johnny looks at what he considers a low-life equipage, wondering, we dare say, who was to be deceived by such a thing. Billy, seeing the case was desperate, resolved to put a bold face on the matter, especially as he remembered his person could not be seen in the glass coach. So, raising his crush hat to his face, he hollered out, I say, is this the Earl of Delices? It is, replied Ben, with a slight inclination of his gigantic person. Then let me out, demanded Billy of Paul. And this request being complied with, Billy skipped smartly across the flags and was presently alongside of Ben, whispering up into his now slightly inclined ear, I saw it was there a lady arrived here last night from the country. He was going to say, boy the coach, but he checked himself when he got to the word country. There was, sir, replied Ben, relaxing into something like condescension. Then I'm come to see her, whispered Billy with a grin. Your name, if you please, sir, replied Ben, still getting up the steam of politeness. Mr. Pringle, Mr. William Pringle, replied Billy with firmness. All right, sir, replied the blood-red monster, pretending to know more than he did, and motioning Billy onward into the black and white marble-flagged entrance hall, he was about to shut him in, when Billy, recollecting himself, hallowed Oom to his coachman, so that he mightn't be let in for the two days higher. The door then closed, and he was in for an adventure. It will be evident to our fair friends that the archer bold had the advantage over the lady in having all his raiment in town, while she had all hers, at least all the pick of hers, her first-class things, in the country. Now, everybody knows that what looks very smart in the country looks very seedy in London. And though the country cousins of life do get their new things to take back with them there, yet regular towncomers have theirs ready, or ready at all events to try on against they arrive, and so have the advantage of looking like civilized people while they are up. London, however, is one excellent place for remedying any little deficiency of any sort, at least if a person has only either money or credit, and a lady or gentleman can soon be rigged out by driving about to the different shops. Now, it so happened that Miss Willing had nothing of her own in town that she felt she would be doing herself justice to appear before Billy in, and had omitted bringing her ladyship's keys whereby she might have remedied the deficiency out of that wardrobe. However, with such a commission as she held, there could be no difficulty in procuring the loan of whatever was wanted from her ladyship's milliner. We may mention that on accepting office under the Lady de Lacy, Miss Willing, with the greatest spirit of fairness, had put her ladyship's custom in competition among three distinguished modesties, 
These are old friend Madame Adelaide Van Boxeny, Madame Celeste de Montmorency of Dover Street, and Miss Julia Fremantle of Cowslip Street, Mayfair. And Miss Fremantle, having offered the same percentage on the bill, fifteen pounds as the other two, and twenty pounds a year certain money more than Madame Van Boxeny, and twenty-five pounds more than Madame Celeste de Montmorency, Miss Fremantle had been duly declared the purchaser, as the auctioneers say. And in due time, as soon as a plausible quarrel could be picked with the then milliner, was in the enjoyment of a very good thing. For though the Countess de Lacy in the Gilpinian spirit of the age tried to tie Miss Fremantle down to price, yet she overlooked the extras, the little embroidery of a bill, if we may so call it, such as four pounds seventeen and sixpence for a buckle, worth perhaps the odd silver, and the surreptitious lace at no one knows what. So long as they were not all in one item, and were cleverly scattered about the bill in broken sums, just as the lady thought the ribbon dear at a shilling a yard, but took it when the counter-skipper replied, Spouse, mom, then we say thirteen pence. Miss Willing, having had a consultation with Miss Fremantle as to the most certain means of quashing the Countess of Honiton, broached her own little requirements, and Miss Fremantle, finding that she only wanted the dress for one night, agreed to lend her a very rich emerald green Genoa velvet evening dress, trimmed with broad Valenciennes lace she was on the point of furnishing for Alderman Boozy's son's brand new wife. Miss Fremantle, feeling satisfied, as she said, that Miss Willing would do it no harm, indeed, would rather benefit it by the sit her fine figure would give it, in the same way as shooters find it to their advantage to let their keepers have a day or two's wear out of their new shoes in order to get them to go easy for themselves. The reader will therefore have the goodness to consider Miss Willing arrayed in Alderman Boozy's son's brand new wife's brand new Genoa velvet dress, with a wreath of pure white canellius on her beautiful brown Madonna-dressed hair and a massive true lover's knot brooch and brilliance at her bosom. On her right arm she wears a magnificent pearl armlet, which Miss Fremantle had on sale or returned from that equitable diamond merchant Samuel Emmanuel Moses of the Minories, the price ranging with Miss Fremantle from eighty to two hundred and fifty guineas, according to the rank and paying properties of the inquirer, though as between Moses and Mantle the price was to be sixty guineas, or perhaps pounds, depending upon the humor Moses might happen to be in when she came in with the dear LSD. The reader will further imagine an elegant little boudoir with its amber-colored silk fittings and furniture lit up with the united influence of the best wax and wall scent, and Miss Willing sitting at an inlaid center table turning over the leaves of Heath's picturesque annual of the preceding year. Opposite the fire are large white and gold folding doors opening we know not where, outside of which lurks pheasant feathers placed there by Miss Willing on a service of delicacy. End of chapter 4, read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 5 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. June 14, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. The Lady's Boudoir, a Declaration. This way, sir, please, sir. Yes, sir, bowed the now obsequious Ben, guiding Billy by the light of a chamber candle through the intricacies of the half-lit inner entrance. Take care, sir. There's a step, sir, continued he, stopping and showing where the first stumbling block resided. Billy then commenced the gradual ascent of the broad, gently rising staircase, each step increasing his conviction of the magnitude of the venture, and making him feel that his was not the biggest house in town. As he proceeded, he wondered what nothing but what's right Jerry, or half a yard of the table Joe, above all Mrs. Half a Yard of the Table, would say if they could see him thus visiting at a nobleman's house. It seemed no more like summit in a book or a play than downright reality. Still, there was no reason why a fine lady should not take a fancy to him. Many deuced deal uglier fellows than he had married fine ladies, and he would take his chances along with the rest of them. So he labored up after Ben, hoping he might not come downstairs quicker than he went up. The top landing being gained, they passed through lofty folding doors into the suite of magnificent but now put-away drawing rooms, whose spectral half-collapsed canvas bags and covered statues and sofas threw a Kensal Green cemetery sort of gloom over Billy's spirits. 
speedily, however, to be dispelled by the radiance of the boudoir into which he was now passing through an invisible door in the gilt-papered wall. Mr. William Pringle, ma'am, whispered Ben in a tone that one could hardly reconcile to the size of the monster. And Miss Willing, having risen at the sound of the voice bowing, Billy and she were presently locked hand in hand, smiling and teeth showing most extravagantly. I'll ring for tea presently, observed she to Ben, who seemed disposed to fuss and loiter about the room. If you please, my lady, replied Ben, bowing himself backwards through the panel. Happy Bill was then left alone with his charmer, save that beetroot-colored Ben was now listening at one door on his own account, and pheasant feathers at the other on Miss Willings. Billy was quite taken aback. If he had been captivated in the coach, what chance had he now with all the aid of dress, scenery, and decorations? He thought he had never seen such a beauty. He thought he had never seen such a bust. He thought he had never seen such an arm. Miss Titterton Pooh wasn't to be mentioned in the same century. Hadn't half such a waist. Won't you be seated? At length asked Miss Willing as Billy stood staring and making a mental inventory of her charms. Seat. <gasps> Seat. <gasps> gasped Willie, looking around at the shining amber-colored magnificence by which he was surrounded, as if afraid to venture, even in his nice salmon-colored shorts. At length he got squatted on a gilt chair by his charmer's side, when taking to look at his toes, she let off the ball of conversation. She had had enough of the billing and cooing or gammon and spinach of matrimony, and knew if she could not bring him to book at once, time would not assist her. She soon probed his family circle, and was glad to find there was no mamma to ask, that dread parent having more than once been too many for her. She took in the whole range of connection with the precision of an auctioneer or an equity draftsman. There was no occasion for diplomacy on her part, for Billy came into the trap just like a fly to a catch him alive -o. The conversation soon waxed so warm that she quite forgot to ring for the tea, and Ben, who affected early hours in the winter, being slightly asthmatical, as a hall porter ought to be, at length brought it in of his own accord. Most polite he was, my lady, and you are late shipping. Miss Willing, with accidental intention every now and then, which raised Billy's opinion of her consequence very considerably. And so he sat, and sipped and sipped, and thought what a beauty she would be to transfer to Doty Street. Tea in due time was followed by the tray. Milton pie, oysters, sandwiches, anchovy toast, bottled stout, sherry and seltzer water for which the latter there was no demand. A profane medicine chest-looking mahogany case then made its appearance, which, being opened, proved to contain four cut-glass spirit bottles, labeled respectively rum, brandy, whiskey, gin, though they were not true inscriptions, for there were two whiskies and two brandies. A good old-fashioned black-bottomed kettle, having next mounted a stand, placed on the top bar, Miss intimated to Ben that if they had a few more coals, he need not trouble to sit up, and these being obtained, our friends made a brew, and then drew their chairs together to enjoy the feast of reason and the flow of soul. Miss, slightly raising Alder Mambuzi's son's brand new wife's brand new emerald green velvet dress to show her beautiful white satin slippered foot as it now rested on the polished steel fender. The awkwardness of resuming the interrupted address being at length overcome by sundry gulfs of the inspiring fluid, our friend Mr. Pringle was soon in full fervor again. He anathematized the lawyers and settlements and delay, and was all for being married offhand at the moment. Miss, on her part, was dignified and prudent. 
All she would say was that Mr. William Pringle was not indifferent to her. No, she sighed, he wasn't. But there were many, many considerations and many, many points to be discussed and many, many questions to be asked of each other before they could even begin to talk of such a thing as immediate. Hmm, <sighs> she wouldn't say the word, turning away her pretty head. Ask away, then, exclaimed Billy, helping himself to another beaker of brandy, for he saw he was approaching the catch em alive o Miss then put the home question, whether his family knew what he was about, and finding they did not, she saw there was no time to lose, so knocking off the expletives, she talked of many considerations and points, the main one being to know how she was likely to be kept whether she was to have a full-sized footman, or an undersized stripling, or a buttony boy of a page, or be waited upon by that greatest aversion to all female minds, one of her own sex. Not that she had the slightest idea of saying no, but her experience in life teaching her that all early grandeur may be mastered by footmen, she could very soon calculate what sort of a set-down she was likely to have by knowing the style of her attendant. Show me your footman, and I will tell you what you are, was one of her maxims. Moreover, it is well for all young ladies to have a sort of rough estimate, at all events, of what they are likely to have, which, we will venture to say, unlike estimates in general, will fall very short of the reality. Our friend Billy, however, was quite in the promising mood, and if she had asked for a half a dozen big bends, he would have promised her them, canes, powder, and all. Oh, she should have anything, everything she wanted. A tall man with good legs, and all right about the mouth. An Arab horse, an Erard harp, a royal piano forte, a silver tea urn, a gold coffee pot, a service of gold, eat gold if she liked. And as he declared she might eat gold if she liked, he dropped upon his salmon-colored knees, and with his glass of brandy in one hand and hers in the other, looked imploringly up at her, a beautiful specimen of heavy sentimentality, and miss thinking that she had got him far enough, and seeing it was nearly twelve o'clock now, urged him to rise and allow her maid to go and get him a coach. Saying which, she disengaged her hand, and slipping through the invisible door, was presently whispering her behest to the giggling pheasant feathers on the other side of the folding ones. Good half hour, however, elapsed before one of those drowsy vehicles could be found, during which time our suitor obtained the fair lady's consent to allow him to meet her at her friend Mrs. Fremantle's, as she called her, in Cowslip Street, Mayfair, at three o'clock in the following afternoon. And the coach having at length arrived, Miss Willing graciously allowed Mr. Pringle to kiss her hand, and then accompanied him to the second landing of the staircase, which commanded the hall, in order to check any communication between pheasant feathers and him. The reader will now perhaps accompany us to this famed milliner, dress and mantle makers, who will be happy to execute any orders our fair ones may choose to favor her with. Despite the anathemas of a certain law lord, match forwarding is quite the natural prerogative and instinct of women. They all like it, from the duchess downwards, and you might as well try to restrain a cat from mousing as a woman from matchmaking. Miss Fremantle, who acted Mrs. on this occasion, was as fond of the pursuit as anyone. She looked Billy over with a searching, scrutinizing glance, thinking what a flat he was, and wondering what he would think of himself that time twelve months. Billy, on his part, was rather dumbfoundered, Talking before two women was not so easy as talking to one, and he did not get on with the immediate matrimony story half so well as he had done overnight. The ladies saw his dilemma, and Miss Willing quickly essayed to relieve him. 
She put him through his pleadings with all the skill of the great Sergeant Silvertongue, making Billy commit himself most irretrievably. Mama, Miss Fremantle, that is to say, then had her innings. She was much afraid it couldn't be done offhand. Indeed, she was. There was a place on the border, Gretna Green. She dare say he'd heard of it, but then it was a tremendous distance and would take half a lifetime to get to. Besides, Miss Praps mightn't like taking such a journey at that time of year. Miss looked neither yes nor no. Mama was more against it than her. Mama feeling for the Countess's coming contest and her future favors. Other difficulties were then discussed, particularly that of publicity, which Miss dreaded more than the journey to Gretna. It must be kept secret, whatever was done. Billy must be sworn to secrecy or Miss would have nothing to say to him. Billy was sworn accordingly. Mama then thought the best plan was to have the bands put up in some quiet church where no questions would be asked as to where they lived and it would be assumed that they resided within the parish and when they had been called out they could just go quietly and get married which would keep things square with the countess and everybody else and this arrangement being perfected and liberty given Billy to write to his bride, whose name and address were now furnished him. He at length took his departure, and the ladies, having talked him over, then resolved themselves into a committee of taste to further the forthcoming tournament. And by dint of keeping all hands at work all night, Miss Willing was enabled to return to the Countess with the first installment of such a series of lady-killing garments as mollified her heart, and enabled her to sustain the blow that followed, which however was mitigated by the assurance that Mr. and Mrs. William Pringle were going to live in London, and that Madam's taste would always be at her ladyship's command. We wish we could gratify our lady readers with a description of the brilliant attire that so completely took the shine out of the Countess of Honiton, as has caused her to hide her diminished head ever since, but our pen is unequal to the occasion, and even if we had a John Leach to supply our deficiencies, the dresses of those days would look as nothing compared to the rotatory haystacks of the present one. What fair lady can bear the sight of her face painted in one of the old Pope's bonnets of former days? To keep things right, the bonnet ought to be painted to the face every year or two, but to the lovers. In due time, Mama, Miss Fremantle, presented her blooming daughter to the happy Bill, who was attended to the hymeneal altar by his confidential clerk, head and shoulders, Smith. Big Ben, who was dressed in a blue frock coat with a velvet collar, white kersimere trousers, and varnished boots, looking very like one of the old royal dukes, was the only other person present at the interesting ceremony, save pheasant feathers who lurked in one of the pews. The secret had been well kept, for the evening papers of that day, and the morning ones of the next first proclaimed to the great world that the sphere of one's own acquaintance, that Mr. Pringle, Esquire of Dowdy Street, Russell Square, was married to Miss Emma Willing of the papers did not say where. End of chapter five. Chapter six of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 6. The Happy United Family, Curtain Crescent. The Pringles, of course, were furious when they read the announcement of Billy's marriage. Such a degradation to such a respectable family and communicated in such a way... We need scarcely say that at first they all made the worst of it, running Mrs. William down much below her real level, and declaring that Billy, though hard enough in money matters, was soft enough in love affairs. 
Then Mrs. Happy Yard of the Table Joe, who up to that time had been the belle of the family, essayed to pick her to pieces, intimating that she was much indebted to her dress, that fine feathers made fine birds, hoped that Billy would like paying for the clothes, and wondered what her figure would be like a dozen years thence. Mrs. Joe had preserved hers, never having indeed having been in the way of spoiling it. Joe looked as if he was to perpetuate the family name. By and by, when it became known that the Countess de Lacey's yellow carriage, with the high-stepping greys and the cocked-up nose, beetroot, and cherry-colored johnnies, was to be seen astonishing the natives in Doughty Street, they began to think better of it, and though they did not stint themselves for rudeness, disguised as civility, of course, they treated her less like a show, more especially when Billy was present. Still, though they could not make up their minds to be really civil to her, they could not keep away from her, just as the moth will be at the candle despite its unpleasant consequences. Indeed, it is one of the marked characteristics of snobbism that they won't be cut. At least if you do get a snob cut, ten to one, but he will take every opportunity of rubbing up against you, or sitting down beside you in public, or overtaking you on the road, or stopping a mutual acquaintance with you in the street, either to show his indifference or his independence, or in the hope of its passing for intimacy. There are people who can't understand any coolness short of a kick. The Pringles were tiresome people. They would neither be in with Mrs. William nor out with her. So there was that continual nag-nag-nagging going on in the happy united family that makes life so pleasant and enjoyable. Mrs. William well knew when any of them came to call upon her that her sayings and doings would furnish recreation for the rest of the cage. It is an agreeable thing to have people in one's house acting the part of spies. One day Mrs. Joe, who lived in Guildford Street, seeing the Countess's carriage horses cold-catching in Doughty Street while her ladyship discussed some important millinery question with Mrs. William, could not resist the temptation of calling, and not being introduced to the Countess, said to Miss William, with her best vinegar sneer, the next time they met, she out she had told our fine friend that the vulgar woman she saw at our house was no connection of ours. But enough of such nonsense, let us on to something more pleasant. Well then, of course, the next step in our story is the appearance of our hero, the boy Billy. Fine Billy, aforesaid. Such a boy as never was seen. All other mamas went away dissatisfied with theirs after they had got a peep of our Billy. If baby shows had been in existence in those days, Mrs. Billy might have scoured the country and carried away all the prizes. Everybody was struck in a heap at the sight of him, and his sayings and doings were worthy of a place in punch. So thought his parents, at least. What perfected their happiness, of course, operated differently with the family, and eased the minds of the ladies as to the expediency of further outward civility to Mrs. William, who they now snubbed at all points and prophesied all sorts of uncharitableness of. Mrs. on her side surpassed them all in dress and good looks, and bucked Billy up into a very producible-looking article. Though he mightn't exactly do for White's Bay window on a summer afternoon, he looked uncommonly well on change, and capitally in the country. Of course, he came in for one of the three cardinal sources of abuse the world is always so handy with, viz. that a man either behaves ill to his wife, is a screw, or is outrunning the constable. The latter, of course, being Billy's crime, which admitted of a large amount of blame being laid on the lady, though we are happy to say Billy had no trial of speed with the constable, for his wife, by whose permission men thrive, was a capital manager, and Billy slapped his fat thigh over his beloved balance sheets every Christmas, exclaiming as he hopped joyously round on one leg, snapping his finger and thumb, I'll Billy shall be a gent, I'll Billy shall be a gent! And he half came in to the oft-expressed wish of his wife that he might live to see him united to a quality lady. Mr. and Lady Arabella Pringle, Mr. and Lady Sophia Pringle, or Mr. and Lady Charlotte Elizabeth Pringle, as the case might be. Vain, glorious ambition. After an inordinate kidney supper, poor Billy was found dead in his chair. Great was the consternation among the Pringle family at the lamentable affliction. All except Jerry, who, speculating on his habits, had recently effected a policy on his life, were deeply shocked at the event. They buried him with all becoming pomp, and then Jerry, who had always professed great interest in the boy, Billy, so great indeed as to induce his brother, though with no great opinion of Jerry, but hoping that his services would never be wanted, and that it might ingratiate the nephew with the bachelor uncle, to appoint him an executor and guardian, waited upon the widow, and with worlds of tears and pious lamentations explained to her in the most unexplanatory manner possible all how things were left, but begging that she would not give herself any trouble about her son's affairs, for if she would attend to his spiritual wants and instill high principles of honor, morality, and fine feeling into his youthful mind, he would look after the mere worldly dross, which was as nothing compared to the importance of the other. 
Teach him to want nothing but what's right, continued Jerry, as he thought most impressively. Teach him to want nothing but what's right, and when he grows up to manhood, marry him to some nice, pious, respectable young woman in his own rank of life, with a something of her own. Gentility is all very well to talk about, but it gets you nothing at the market, added he, forgetting that he was against the mere worldly dross. But Mrs. Pringle, who knew the value of the article, intimated at an early day that she would like to be admitted into the money partnership as well, whereupon Jerry Waxing Roth said with an irritable glance of his keen gray eyes, My dear madam, these family matters, in my opinion, require to be treated not only in a businesslike way, but with a very considerable degree of delicacy, an undisputed dogma acquiring force only by the manner in which it was delivered. So the pretty widow saw she had better hold her tongue and hope for the best from the little fawning bully. The melancholy catastrophe with which we closed our last chapter found our hero at a preparatory school studying for Eton, whither Papa proposed sending him on the old principle of getting him into good society, though we believe it is an experiment that seldom succeeds. The widow indeed took this view of the matter, for her knowledge of high life caused her to know that though a proud aristocracy can condescend and even worship wealth, yet that they are naturally clannish and exclusive and tenacious of pedigree. In addition to this, Mrs. Pringle's experience of men led her to think that the solemn, pedantic Greek and Latin ones, as she called them, who know all about Julius Caesar coming at summa diligentia on the top of the diligence, were not half so agreeable as those who could dance and sing and knew all that was going on in the present-day world, which, in addition to her just appreciation of the delicate position of her son, made her resolve not to risk him among the rising aristocracy at Eton who instead of advancing might only damage his future prospects in life, but to send him to Paris, where besides the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, he would acquire all the elegant accomplishments and dawn fresh upon the world an unexpected meteor. This matter being arranged, she then left Dirty Street, as she called Dowdy Street, with all the disagreeable Pringle family espionage and reminiscences, and migrated westward, taking up her abode in the more congenial atmosphere of Curtain Crescent, Pimlico, or Belgravia, as we believe the owners of the houses wish to have it called. Here she established herself in a very handsome, commodious house with portico doorway and balcony drawing rooms, every requisite for a genteel family in short, and such a mansion being clearly more than a single lady required, she sometimes accommodated the less fortunate, through the medium of a house agent, though both he and she always begged it to be distinctly understood that she did not let lodgings but apartments and she always requested that the consideration might be sent to her in a sealed envelope by the occupant, in the same manner as she transmitted them the bill. So she managed to make a considerable appearance at a moderate expense, it being only in the full season that her heart yearned towards the houseless, when of course a high premium was expected. There is nothing uncommon in people letting their whole houses, so why should there be anything strange in Mrs. Pringle occasionally letting a part of one? Clearly nothing. Though Mrs. Joe did say she had turned a lodging housekeeper, she could not refrain from having seven and sixpence worth of brogum occasionally to see how the land lay. It is but justice to our fair friend to say that she commenced with great prudence. So handsome, unprotected a female being open to the criticisms of the censorious, she changed her good-looking footman for a sedate elderly man, whose name, Proper John, John Proper John, coupled with the severe austerity of his manners, was enough to scare away intruders and to keep the young girls in order, whom our friend had consigned to her from the country, in the hopes that her drilling and recommendation would procure them admission into quality families. Proper John had been spoiled for high service by an attack of the jaundice, but his figure was stately and good, and she sought to modify his injured complexion by a snuff-colored Quaker-cut coat and vest, with claret-colored shorts and buckled shoes. Thus attired, with his oval-brimmed hat looped up with gold cord, and a large double-jointed brass-headed cane in his hand, he marched after his mistress a damper to the most audacious. Proper John, having lived in good families until he got spoiled by the jaundice, had a very extensive acquaintance among the aristocracy, with whom Mrs. Pringle soon established a peculiar intercourse. She became a sort of ultimate court of appeal, a court de cassation, in all manner of tastes and apparel, whether a bonnet should be lilac or lavender color, a dress deeply flounced or lightly, a lady go to a ball in feathers or diamonds, or both, and all those varying and perplexing points that so excite and bewilder the female mind. Mrs. Pringle would settle all these, whatever Mrs. Pringle said the fair applicants would abide by, and milliners and dressmakers submitted to her judgment. This, of course, led her into the privacies of domestic life. She knew what husbands stormed at the milliners' and dressmakers' bills, bounced at the price of the opera box, and were eternally complaining of their valuable horses catching cold. She knew who the cousin was, who was always to be admitted in Lavender Square, and where the needle case-shaped note went to after he had visited the toy shop in Arcadia Street. If her own information was defective, proper John could supply the deficiency. The two between them knew almost everything. 
Nor was Mrs. Pringle's influence confined to the heads of houses, for it soon extended to many of the junior members also. It is a well-known fact that when the gorgeous Lady Rainbow came to consult her about her daughter's goings-on with Captain Conquest, the Captain and Matilda saw Mama alight from the flaunting hammercloth tub as they stood behind the figured yellow tabaret curtains of Mrs. Pringle's drawing-room window, whither they had been attracted by the thundering of one of the old noisy order of footmen. Blessings on the man, say we, who substituted bells for knockers, so that lovers may not be disturbed or visitors unaccustomed to public knocking have to expose their incompetence. We should, however, state that whenever Mrs. Pringle was consulted by any of the juveniles upon their love affairs, she invariably suggested that they had better ask Mama, though perhaps it was only done as a matter of form and to enable her to remind them at a future day, if things went wrong, that she had done so. Many people make offers that they never mean to have accepted, but still, if they are not accepted, they made them, you know. If they are accepted, why, then they wriggle out of them the best way they can. But we are dealing in generalities instead of confining ourselves to Mrs. Pringle's practice. If the young lady or gentleman, for Mrs. Pringle was equally accessible to the sexes, preferred asking her to asking Mama, Mrs. Pringle was always ready to do what she could for them, and the fine Sevres and Dresden china, the opal vases, the bohemian scent bottles, the beautiful bronzes, the ormolu jewel caskets, and Parisian clocks that mounted guard in the drawing room when it was not in commission occupied as apartments, spoke volumes for the gratitude of those she befriended. Mrs. Pringle was soon the repository of many secrets, but we need not say that the lady who so adroitly concealed pheasant feathers on her own account was not likely to be entrapped into committing others. And though she was often waited upon by pleasant conversationalists on far-fetched errands who endeavored to draw carelessly downwind to their point, as well as by seedy and half-seedy gentlemen who proceeded in a more business-like style, both the pleasant conversationalist and the seedy and the half-seedy gentlemen went away as wise as they came. She never knew anything. It was the first she had heard of anything of the sort. Altogether, Mrs. Pringle was a wonderful woman, and not the least remarkable trait in her character was that, although servants, who, like the rest of the world, are so ready to pull people down to their own level, knew her early professional career, yet she managed them so well that they all felt an interest in elevating her, from the Duke's Duke down to old quivering cave Jean de la Puche who sipped her hop champagne and told all he heard while waiting at table, that festive period when people talk as if their attendants were cattle or inanimate beings. The reader will now have the goodness to consider our friend Fine Billy, established with his handsome mother in Curtain Crescent, not Pimlico but Belgravia, with all the airs and action described in our opening chapter. We have been a long time in working up to him, but the reader will not find the space wasted inasmuch as it has given him a good introduction to Madam, under whose auspices Billy will shortly have to grapple with the Ask Mama world. Moreover, we feel that if there has been a piece of elegance overlooked by novelists generally, it is the delicate, sensitive, highly refined lady's maid. With these observations, we now pass on to the son. He had exceeded, if possible, his good mother's Parisian anticipations. For if he had not brought away any great amount of learning, if he did not know a planet from a fixed star, the difference of oratory between Cicero and Demosthenes, or the history of Cupid and the minor heathen deities, he was nevertheless an uncommonly good hand at polka, could be matched to waltz with any one, and had a tremendous determination of words to the mouth. His dancing propensities indeed were likely to mislead him at starting, for not getting into the sort of society Mrs. Pringle wished to see him attain, he took up with Cremorne and casinos and questionable characters generally. Mrs. Pringle's own establishment, we are sorry to say, soon furnished her with the severest cause of disquietude, for having always acted upon the principle of having pretty maids, the difference, as she said, between pretty and plain ones being that the men ran after the pretty ones while the plain ones ran after the men, having always, we say, acted upon the principle of having pretty ones, she forgot to change her system on the return of her hopeful son, and before she knew where she was, he had established a desperate liaison with a fair maid whose aptitude for breakage had procured for her the soubriquet of Butterfingers. Now Butterfingers, whose real name was Disher, Jane Disher, was a niece of our old friend Big Ben, now a flourishing London hotel landlord, and Butterfingers partook of the goodly properties and proportions for which the Ben family are distinguished. She was a little, plump, fair, roundabout thing with every quality of a healthy country beauty. Fine Billy was first struck with her one Sunday afternoon, tripping along in Knightsbridge as she was making her way home from Kensington Gardens, when the cheap finery, the parasol, the profusely flowered white gauze bonnet, the veil, the machinery, lacel cloak, the fringed kerchief worked sleeves, etc., which she kept at Chicory the Greengrocers in Sun Street and changed there for the quiet apparel in which she left Mrs. Pringle's house in Curtain Crescent, completely deceived him, as much as did the half-startling smile of recognition she involuntarily gave him on meeting. 
Great was his surprise to find that such a smart, neat-stepping, well-set-up, beyond chasse beauty and he came from the same quarters. We need not say what followed, how proper John couldn't see what everybody else saw, and how at length poor Mrs. Pringle, having changed her mind about going to hear Mr. Spurgeon, caught the two sitting together on her richly carved sofa of chaste design in the then non-commissioned put-away drawing room. There was Butterfingers in a flounced book muslin gown with a broad French sash and her hair clubbed at the back a la crow's nest. It was hard to say which of the three got the greatest start, though the blow was undoubtedly the severest on the poor mother, who had looked forward to seeing her son entering the rank of life legitimately in which she had occupied a too questionable position. The worst of it was she did not know what to do, whether to turn her out of the house at the moment and so infuriate the uncle and her son also, or give her a good scolding and get rid of her on the first plausible opportunity. She had no one to consult. She knew what want nothing but what's right Jerry would say, and that nothing would please Mrs. Half a Yard of the Table Joe more than to read the marriage of Billy and Butterfingers. Mrs. Pringle was afraid, too, of offending Big Ben by the abrupt dismissal of his niece, and dreaded if Butterfingers had gained any ascendancy over William that he, too, might find a convenient marrying place as somebody else had done. Altogether, our fair friend was terribly perplexed. Thrown on the natural resources of her own strong mind, she thought perhaps the usual way of getting young ladies off bad matches by showing them something better might be tried with her son. Billy's debut in the metropolis had not been so flattering as she could have wished, but then she could make allowances for town exclusiveness and the pick and choice of dancing activity which old family connections and associations supplied. The country was very different. There, young men were always in request and were taken with much lighter credentials. If, thought she, sweet William could but manage to establish a good country connection, there was no saying, but he might retain it in town. At all events, the experiment would separate him from the artful butterfingers and pave the way for her dismissal. To accomplish this desirable object, Mrs. Pringle therefore devoted her undivided attention. End of chapter 6, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 7 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 7. The Earl of Ladythorne, Mr. Glancy. Among Mrs. Pringle's many visitors was that gallant old philanthropist, the well-known Earl of Ladythorne of Tantivy Castle, Feather Bedfordshire, and Belvedere House, London. His lordship had known her at Lady de Lacy's, and Mrs. Pringle still wore and prized a ruby ring he slipped upon her finger as he met her, accidentally, of course, in the passage early one morning as he was going to hunt. His saddle horses might often be seen of a summer afternoon tossing their heads up and down Curtain Crescent to the amusement of the inhabitants of that locality. His lordship, indeed, was a well-known general patron of all that was fair and fine and handsome in creation. Fine women, fine houses, fine horses, fine hounds, fine pictures, fine statues, fine everything. No pretty woman either in town or country ever wanted a friend if he was aware of it. He had long hunted Feather Bedfordshire in a style of great magnificence, and though latterly his energies had perhaps been as much devoted to the pursuit of the fair as the fox, yet, as he found the two worked well together, he kept up the hunting establishment with all the splendor of his youth. Not that he was old, as he would say, far from it. Indeed, to walk behind him down St. James's Street, he does not go quite so well up. His easy, jaunty air, tall, graceful figure, and elasticity of step might make him pass for a man in that most uncertain period of existence, the prime of life. And if uncivil, unfriendly, inexorable time has whitened his pow, his lordship carries it off with the aid of gay costume and color. He had a great reputation among the ladies, and though they all laughed and shook their heads when his name was mentioned, from the pretty simpering Mrs. Ringdove of Lime Tree Grove, who said he was a naughty man, down to the buxom chambermaid of the Rose and Crown, who giggled and called him a gay old gentleman, they all felt pleased and flattered by his attentions. Hunting a country undoubtedly gives gay old gentlemen great opportunities, for under pretense of finding a fox they may rummage anywhere from the garret to the cellar. In this interesting pursuit, his lordship was ably assisted by his huntsman, Diggy Bogledyke. Better huntsman there might be than Diggy, but none so eminently qualified for the double pursuit of the fox and the thine. He had a great deal of tact and manner, and looked and was essentially a nobleman's servant. He didn't come blurting open-mouthed with, I've seen a devilish, for such was his dialect, I've seen a devilish fine oss, my lord, or they say Mrs. Candle's cow has gained another prize, but he would take an opportunity of introducing the subject neatly and delicately, 
through the medium of some allusion to the country in which they were to be found, some cover-wanting cutting, some poacher-wanting trousing, or some puppy out at walk, so that if his lordship didn't seem to come into the humor of the thing, Dicky could whip off to the other scent as if he had nothing else in his mind. It was seldom, however, that his lordship was not inclined to profit by Dicky's experience, for he had great sources of information and was very careful in his statements. His lordship and Dicky had now hunted Feather Bedfordshire together for nearly forty years and though they might not be so punctual in the mornings or so late in leaving off in the evenings as they were, and though his lordship might come to the meet in his carriage and four with the reigning favorite by his side instead of on his neat cover hack, and though Dicky did dance longer at his fences than he used, still there was no diminution in the scale of the establishment or in Dicky's influence throughout the country. Indeed, it would rather seem as if the now well-matured hunt ran to show instead of sport, for each succeeding year brought out either another second horseman, though neither his lordship nor Dicky ever tired one, or another man in a scarlet and cap, or established another rose and crown, whereat his lordship kept dry things to change in case he got wet. He was uncommonly kind to himself and hated his heir with an intensity of hatred which was at once the best chance for longevity and for sustaining the oft-disappointed ambitious hopes of the fair. Now Mrs. Pringle had always had a very laudable admiration of fox hunters. She thought the best introduction for a young man of fortune was at the cover side, and though Jerry Pringle, who looked upon them as synonymous, had always denounced Goblin and Hunton as the two greatest vices of the day, she could never come into that opinion as far as hunting was concerned. She now thought if she could get Billy launched under the auspices of that distinguished sportsman the Earl of Lady Thorne, it might be the means of reclaiming him from Butterfingers and getting him on in society, for she well knew how being seen at one good place led to another, just as the umbrella keepers at the Royal Academy try to lead people into giving them something in contravention of the rule above their heads by jingling a few half-pence before their faces. Moreover, Billy had shown an inclination for equitation by nearly galloping several of Mr. Spaven, the neighboring livery stable keeper's horse's tails off, and Mrs. Pringle's knowledge of hunting not being equal to her appreciation of the sport, she thought that a master of hounds found all the gentlemen who joined his hunt in horses just as a shooter finds them in dogs or guns, so that the thing would be managed immediately. Indeed, like many ladies, she had rather a confused idea of the whole thing, not knowing but that one horse would hunt every day of the week, or that there was any distinction of horses, further that the purposes to which they were applied. Hunters and racehorses, she had no doubt, were the same animals, working their ways honestly from year's end to year's end, or at most with only the sort of difference between them that there is between a milliner and a dressmaker. Be that as it may, however, all things considered, Mrs. Pringle determined to test the sincerity of her friend the Earl of Lady Thorne, and to that end wrote him a gossiping sort of letter, asking in the postscript when his dogs would be going out as her son was at home and would so like to see them. Although we introduced Lord Lady Thorne as a philanthropist, his philanthropy, we should add, was rather lopsided, being chiefly confined to the fair. Indeed, he could better stand a dozen women than one man. He had no taste or sympathy for the hirsute tribe, hence his fields were very select, being chiefly composed of his dependents and people who he could d and do what he liked with. Though the Crumpleton Railway cut right through his country, making it very contagious, as Harry Swan, his first whip, said, for sundry large towns, the sporting inhabitants thereof preferred the money-griping propensities of a certain baronet, Sir Moses Mainchance, whose acquaintance the reader will presently make, to the scot-free sport with the frigid civilities of the noble earl. Under ordinary circumstances, therefore, Mrs. Pringle had made rather an unfortunate selection for her son's debut, but it so happened that her letter found the Earl in anything but his usual frame of mind. He was suffering most acutely for the hundred and twentieth time or so from one of Cupid's shafts, and that too leveled by a hand against whose attacks he had always hitherto been thought impervious. This wound had been inflicted by the well-known, perhaps to some of our readers too well-known, equestrian coquette Miss de Glancy of half the watering places in England and some on the continent, whose many conquests had caused her to be regarded as almost irresistible and induced, it was said, yeah, with what degree of truth we know not, a party of England's enterprising sons to fit her out for an expedition against the gallant Earl of Ladythorne under the Limited Liability Act. Now none but a most accomplished self-sufficient coquette, such as Miss Glancy undoubtedly was, would have undertaken such an enterprise, for it was in direct contravention of two of the noble earl's leading principles, namely that of liking large ladies, fine coarse women as the slim ones called them, and of disliking fox-hunting ones, the sofa and not the saddle being, as he always said, the proper place for the ladies. But Miss de Glancy prided herself upon her power of subjugating the tyrant man, and gladly undertook to couch the lance of blandishment against the hitherto impracticable nobleman. In order, however, to understand the exact position of parties, perhaps the reader will allow us to show how his lordship came to be seized with his present attack, and also how he treated it. 
Well, the ash was yellow, the beech was brown, and the oak ginger colored, and the indomitable youth was again in cub hunting costume. A white beaver hat, a green cutaway, a buff vest with white cords and caps, attended by Bogledyke and his whips and hats, and their last season's pinks or purples, disturbing the numerous litters of cubs with which the country abounded, when, after a musical twenty minutes with a kill in Allenby Wood, his lordship joined horses with Dicky to discuss the merits of the performance as they rode home together. Yes, my lord, yas, replied Dicky, sawing away at his hat in reply to his lordship's observation that they ran uncommonly well. Yes, my lord, they did. I don't know that I can ever remember being better pleased with an entry than I am with this year's. I really think in a few more seasons we shall get em as over perfection as possible. Did your lordship notice that Barbara Betch how she took to running today? The first time she has left my horse's eels. Her mother, Old Blossom, was just the same. Never left my horse's eels the first season, and everybody said she was fit for nothing but the halter. But my, continued he, shaking his head, what a rare bet she did become. She did that, replied his lordship, smiling at Dickie's pronunciation. And that reminds me, continued Dickie, emboldened by what he thought the encouragement. I was down at Freestone Banks yesterday when Barbara was walked to seeing a pup I have there now, and I think I see the very neatest lady's pad I ever set eyes on. Dickie's light blue eyes settling on his lordship's eagle ones as he spoke. Oi, who is that? asked the gay old gentleman, catching at the word lady. Why, they say she belongs to a young lady from the south, a Miss Dadancy, I think they call her, with the aptitude people have for mistaking proper names. Dadancy, repeated his lordship. Dadancy, never heard of the name before. What's set her hair? She's staying at Mrs. Roseworth's, a Lanecroft house, but her also stand at the spread Hagel at Bushdale, old Sam Ochenson, you know. Indomitable youth. Horses, what, has she more than one? Dicky, two, a bay and a grey. It's the bay that takes my fancy most, the neatest stepper with the lightest month and fairest, freest, truest action I ever seed. Indomitable youth, what's she going to do with them? Dicky, ride them, ride them. They say she's the finest horsewoman that ever was seen. Indeed, mused his lordship, thinking over the pros and cons of female equestrianism, the disagreeableness of being beat by them, the disagreeableness of having to leave them in the lurch, the disagreeableness of seeing them floored, the disagreeableness of seeing them all running down with perspiration, the result being that his lordship adhered to his established opinion that women have no business out hunting. Dicky knew his lordship's sentiment and did not press the matter, but drew his horse a little to the rear, thinking it fortunate that all men are not of the same way of thinking. Thus they rode on for some distance in silence, broken only by the occasional flopping and chiding of Harry Swan or his brother whip of some loitering or refractory hound. And though they might not always agree in their views, he never damped Dickie's ardor by openly differing with him. He thought by Dickie's way of mentioning the lady that he had a good opinion of her, and barring the riding, his lordship saw no reason why he should not have a good opinion of her too. Taking advantage of the Linton sidebar now bringing them upon the Somerton Longville road, he reined in his horse a little so as to let Dickie come alongside of him again. "'What is this young lady like?' asked the indomitable youth as soon as they got their horses to step pleasantly together again. "'Will now,' replied Dickie, screwing up his mouth with an apologetic touch of his hat, knowing that that was his weak point." Well, now, I don't mean to say that she's exactly, no, not exactly your lordship's model, not a large, full-bodied woman like Mrs. Bisland or Miss Poach, but an elegant, very elegant, well-set-up young lady, with a high-bred hair about her that one seldom sees in the country, for though we breeds our women very beautiful, uncommon handsome, I may say, we don't polish them up to that fine degree of perfection that they do in the towns, and even if we did, they would most likely spoil the old thing by some untoward, unsightly dress, just as a country servant spoils a London livery by a coolie tie or going about with a great shock head of air or some such disfigurement. But well, this young lady, to my mind, is a perfect picton, self and seat, all as neat and perfect as can be, and nothing that one could either halter or amend. She is what, did say in your lordship's presence, I might call the pink of fashion and the mould of form. Dicky sawing away at his hat as he spoke. All slim and genteel, I suppose, observed his lordship dryly. Just so, assented Dicky, with a chuck of the chin, making a clean breast of it. Just so, adding, at least as far as one can judge of her and her abbot, you know. Thought so, muttered his lordship, and having now gained one of the doors in the wall, they cut across the deer-studded park and were presently back at the castle, and his lordship ate his dinner and quaffed his sweet and dry in twenty-five Lafitte without ever thinking about either the horse or the lady or the habit or anything connected with the foregoing conversation, while the reigning favorite Mrs. Moffat appeared just as handsome as could be in his eyes. End of chapter 7, read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 8 of Ask Mama. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 8. Cub Hunting. Though his lordship, as we said before, would stoutly deny being old, he had nevertheless got sufficiently through the morning of life not to let cub hunting get him out of bed a moment sooner than usual, and it was twelve o'clock on the next day but one to that on which the foregoing conversation took place that Mr. Bogledyke was again to be seen standing erect in his stirrups, yoking and coaxing his hounds into Crashington Gorse. There was Dicky, cap in hand in the My Center ride, exhorting the young hounds to dive into the strong sea of gorse. Yoikes, wind him, yoikes, pash him up, cheered the veteran, now turning his horse across to enforce the request. There was his lordship at the high corner as usual, ensconced among the clump of weather-beaten flackthorns, thorns that had neither advanced nor receded a single inch since he first knew them, his eagle eye fixed on the narrow fern and coarse grass-covered dell down which Rainer generally stole. There was Harry Swan at one corner to head the fox back from the beans, and Tom Speed at the other to welcome him away over the corn-garnered open. And now the whimper of old Sure finding Harbinger, backed by the sharp yap of the terrier, proclaims that our friend is at home, and presently a perfect hurricane of melody bursts from the agitated gorse. Every hound is in the paroxysm of excitement, and there are five and twenty couple of them, fifty musicians in the hole. Tallyo, there it goes across the ride. Cub, cries his lordship. Cub, responded Dicky. Crack sounds the whip. Now the whole infuriated phalanx dashed across the ride and dived into the close prickly gorse on the other side as if it were the softest, pleasantest quarters in the world. There is no occasion to coax and exhort and ride cap in hand to them now. It's all fury and commotion. Each hound seems to consider himself personally aggrieved, though we will be bound to say the fox and he never met in their lives, and to be bent upon having immediate satisfaction. And immediate any tyro would think it must necessarily be, seeing such preponderating influence brought to bear upon so small an animal. Not so, however. Pug holds his own, and by dint of creeping and crawling and stopping and listening and lying down and running his foil, he brings the lately rushing clamorous pack to a more plodding, painstaking, unraveling sort of performance. Meanwhile, three foxes in succession slip away, one at Speed's corner, two at Swan's, and though Speed screeched and screamed and yelled as if he were getting killed, not a hound came to see what had happened. They all stuck to the original scent. Harry comes again, now cries his lordship from his thorn-formed bower as the cool-mannered fox again steals across the ride, and Dicky again uncovers and goes through the capping ceremony. Overcome the pack, bristling and lashing for blood, each hound looking as if he would eat the fox single-handed. Now he's up to the high corner as though he were going to charge his lordship himself, and passing over fresh ground, the hounds get the benefit of ascent and work with redoubled energy, making the opener gorse bushes crack and bend with their pressure. Pug has now gained the rabbit burrow bank of the north fence and has about made up his mind to follow the example of his comrades and try his luck in the open, when a cannonading crack of Swan's whip strikes terror into his heart and causes him to turn tail and run the moss-grown mound of the hedge. Here he unexpectedly meets young Prodigal face to face, who, thinking that rabbit may be as good-eating as fox, has got up a little hunt of his own, and who is considerably put out of countenance by the rencontre, but Pug, not anticipating any such delicacy on the part of a pursuer, turns tail, and is very soon in the rear of the hounds, hunting them instead of their hunting him. The thing then becomes more difficult, business-like, and sedate, the sages of the pack taking upon them to guide the energy of the young. So what with the slow music of the hounds, the yap-yap-yapping of the terriers, and the shaking of the gorse, an invisible underground sort of hunt is maintained, his lordship sitting among his blackthorn bushes like a gentleman in his opera stall, thinking now of the hunt, now of his dinner, now of what a good thing it was to be a lord, with a good digestion and plenty of cash, and nobody to comb his head. At length, Pug finds it too hot to hold him. The rays of an autumnal sun have long been striking into the gorse, while a warm westerly wind does little to ventilate it from the steam of the rummaging inquisitive pack. Though but a cub, he is the son of an old stager who took Dicky and his lordship a deal of killing, and with the talent of his sire he thus ruminates on his uncomfortable condition. If, says he, I stay here, I shall either be smothered or fall a prey to these noisy, unrelenting monsters who seem to have the knack of finding me wherever I go. I'd better cut my stick as I did the time before and have fresh air and exercise at all events in the open. So saying, he made a dash at the hedge near where Swan was stationed, and regardless of his screams and the cracks of his whip, cut through the beans and went away with a sort of defiant whisk of his brush. What a commotion followed his departure! How the screeches of the men mingled with the screams of the hounds and the twangs of the horn! In an instant, his lordship vacates his opera stall and is flying over the ragged boundary fence that separates him from the beans, while Mr. Bogledyke capers and prances at a much smaller pace, looking as if he would fain turn away were it not for the observation of the men. 
Now Dickie is over. Swan and Speed take it in their stride just as the last hound leaves the gorse and strains to regain his distant companions. A large grass field, followed by a rough bear fallow, takes the remaining strength out of the poor pug, and turning short to the left, he seeks the friendless shelter of a patch of wretched oats. The hounds overrun the scent, but spreading like a rocket, they quickly recover it, and in an instant, fox, hounds, horses, men are among the standing corn. One ring and final destruction of the beggarly crop, and poor pug is in the hands of his pursuers. Then came the grand finale, the woo-hoop, the baying, the blowing, the beheading, etc., now, Harry Swan, whose province it is to magnify sport and make imaginary runs to ground, exercises his calling by declaring it was five and thirty minutes, twenty perhaps, and the finest young fox he ever had hold of. Now his lordship and Dicky take out their tootlers and blow a shrill reverberating blast, while Swan stands straddling and yelling with the mangled remains high above his head, ready to throw it into the sea of mouths that are baying around to receive it. After a sufficiency of noise, up goes the carcass. The wave of hound breaks against it as it falls, while a half-ravenous, half-indignant, growling worry succeeds the late clamorous outcry. Tyrominatum, cries Dickie. Tyrominatum, shouts his lordship. Tyrominatum, shrieks Speed. Hi, worry, 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 shouts Swan, trying to tantalize the young hounds with a haunch, which, however, they do not seem much to care about. The old hounds, too, seem as if they had lost their hunger with their anger, and Marmion lets Warrior run off with his leg with only a snap and an indignant rise of his bristles. Altogether, the froth and effervescence of the thing has evaporated. So his lordship and Dicky, turning their horses' heads, the watchful hounds give a bay of obedient delight as they frolic under their noses, and Swan having reclaimed his horse from speed, the onward procession is formed to give Brambleton Wood a rattle by way of closing the performance of the day. His lordship and Dicky ride side by side, extolling the merits of the pack and the excellence of Crashington Gorse. Never was so good a cover, never was a better pack. Main chances, poo, not to be mentioned in the same century. So they proceed, magnifying and complimenting themselves in the handsomest terms possible, down Daisyfield Lane, across Hill House Pastures, and on by Dustin Mills to Broomley, which is close to Brambleton Wood. Most of our feather Bedfordshire friends will remember that after leaving Dustin Mills, the roads wind along the impetuous lime, whose thorn and broom-grown banks offer dry, if not very secure, accommodations for Master Reynard. And the draw being pretty and the echo fine, his lordship thought they might as well run the hounds along the banks, not being aware that Peter Hitter, Squire Porker's keeper, had just emerged at the east end as they came up at the west. However, that was neither here nor there. Dicky got his yoikes, his lordship got his view, Swan and Speed their cracks and canters, and it was all in the day's work. No fox, of course, was the result. Tweet, tweet, tweet went the horns, his lordship taking a blow as well as Dicky, which sounded up the valley and lost itself among the distant hills. The hounds came straggling leisurely out of cover, as much as to say, you know, there never is a fox there, so why bother us? All hands being again united, the cavalcade rose the hill and were presently in the Longford and Oldenbury turnpike. Here the feather Bedfordshire reader's local knowledge will again remind him that the Chattelworth Lane crosses the turnpike at right angles, and just as old Ringwood, who as usual was trotting consequentially in advance of the pack with the fox's head in his mouth, got to the finger post, a fair equestrian on a tall blood bay rode leisurely past with downcast eyes in full view of the advancing party. Though her horse whinnied and shied and seemed inclined to be sociable, she took no more notice of the cause than if it had been a cart, merely coaxing and patting him with her delicate primrose-colored kid gloves. So she got him past without even a sidelong look from herself. But though she did not look, my lord did, and was much struck with the air and elegance of everything. Her mild classic features, her black felt queen's pattern wide awake trimmed with lightish green velvet, and green cock-feathered plume tipped with straw color to match the ribbon that now gently fluttered at her fair neck, her hair, her whip, her gloves, her tout ensemble. Her lightish green habit was the quintessence of a fit, and altogether there was a high red finish about her that looked more like Hyde Park than what one usually sees in the country. "'Who the deuce is that, Dickie?' asked his lordship as she now got out of hearing. "'That be her, my lord,' whispered Dickie, sawing away at his hat. "'That be her?' repeated he with a knowing leer. "'Her? Who d'ye mean?' asked his lordship, who had forgotten all Dickie's preamble. "'Well, Miss, Miss, what's her name? De Clancy, De Clancy, the lady I told you about.' And the earl's heart smote him, for he felt that he had done injustice to Dickie, and moreover had persevered too long in his admiration of large ladies and in his repudiation of horsemanship. He thought he had never seen such a graceful seat or such a piece of symmetrical elegance before, and inwardly resolved to make Dicky a most surprising present at Christmas, for he went on the principle of giving low wages and of rewarding zeal and discretion such as Dicky's profusely. 
and though he went and drew Brambleton Wood, he was thinking far more of the fair maid, her pensive downcast look, her long eyelashes, her light silken hair, her graceful figure, and exquisite seat, than of finding a fox. And he was not at all sorry when he heard Dickie's horn at the bridal gate of the Ashburn end blowing the hounds out of cover. They then went home, and his lordship was very grumpy all that evening with his fat, fair-and-forty friend Mrs. Moppet, who could not get his tea to his liking at all. We dare say most of our readers will agree with us that when a couple want to be acquainted, there is seldom much difficulty about the matter, even though there be no friendly go-between to mutter the cabalistic words that constitute an introduction. And though Miss de Glancy did ride so unconcernedly past, it was a sheer piece of acting, as she had long been waiting at Carlton Clumps, which commands a view over the surrounding country, timing herself for the exact spot where she met the too susceptible Earl and his hounds. No one knew better how to angle for admiration than this renowned young lady, when to do the bold, when the bashful, when the timid, when the scornful and retiring, and she rightly calculated that the way to attract and win the young old earl was to look as if she didn't want to have anything to say to him. Her downcast look and utter indifference to that fertile source of introduction, a pack of hounds, had sunk deeper into his tender heart than if she had pulled up to admire them collectively, and to kiss them individually. We all know how useful a dog can be made in matters of this sort, how the fair creatures can express their feelings by their fondness, and if one dog can be so convenient, by how much more so can a whole pack of hounds be made? End of chapter 8, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 9 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 9. A Puppet Walk, Imperial John. Next day, his lordship, who was of the nice old Andalsey school of dressers, was to be seen in regular St. James Street attire, viz. a bright blue coat with gilt buttons, a light blue scarf, a buff vest with fawn-colored leathers, and brass heel spurs capering on a long-tailed silver dun, attended by a diminutive rosy-cheeked boy, known in the stables as Cupid Without Wings, on a bay. He was going to see a pup he had at walk at Freestone Banks, of which the reader will remember Dickie had spoken approvingly on a previous day, and the morning being fine and sunny, his lordship took the bridle road over Ashley Downs, and along the range of undulating Heathmore Hills as well for the purpose of enjoying the breeze as of seeing what was passing on the vale below. So he tid-upped and tid-upped away over the sound green sward on his flowing-tailed steed, his keen far-seeing eye raking all the roads as he went. There seemed to be nothing stirring but heavy crushing wagons with doctor's gigs and country carts and here and there a slow-moving steed on the grand order of agriculture. When, however, he got to the broken stony ground where all the independent hill tracks join in common union to effect the descent into the vale, his hack pricked his ears, and looking ahead to the turn of the lane into which the tracks ultimately resolved themselves, his lordship first saw a fluttering light-tipped feather, and then the whole figure of a horsewoman emerged from the concealing hedge as if it were on to the open space beyond. Miss, too, had been on the hills, as the earl might have seen by her horse's inference, if he had not been too busy looking abroad. And she had just had time to effect the descent as he approached. She was now sauntering along as unconcernedly as if there were naught but herself and her horse in the world. His lordship started when he saw her, and a crimson flush suffused his healthy cheeks as he drew his reins, and felt his hack gently with the spur to induce him to use a little more expedition down the hill. Cupid without wings put on also to open the rickety gate at the bottom, and his lordship telling him as he passed through to shot it gently, pressed on at a well-in-hand trot which he could ease down to a walk as he came near the object of his pursuit. Mrs. Horse heard footsteps coming and looked round, but she pursued the even tenor of her way, apparently indifferent to everything, even to a garroting. His lordship, however, was not to be daunted by any such coolness, so stealing quietly alongside of her, he raised his hat respectively and asked in his mildest, blandest tone if she had seen a man with a hound in a string. "'Hound? Me? See!' exclaimed Mr. Glancy, with a well-feigned start of astonishment. "'No, sir, I have not,' continued she haughtily, as if recovering herself and offended by the inquiry. "'I am afraid my hound startled your horse the other day,' observed his lordship, half inclined to think she didn't know him. Oh, no, they didn't, replied she, with an upward curl of her pretty lip. My horse is not so easily startled as that, are you, Cock Robin? asked she, leaning forward to pat him. Cock Robin replied by laying back his ears and taking a snatch at his lordship's hack silver mane, which afforded him an opportunity of observing that Cock Robin was not very sociable. Not with strangers, pouted Mr. Glancy with a flash of her bright hazel eyes. So saying, she touched her horse lightly with her gold-mounted whip, and in an instant she was careering away, leaving his lordship to the care of the now-grinning Cupid without wings. 
And thus the minx held the sprightly youth in tow till she nearly drove him mad, not missing any opportunity of meeting him, but never giving him too much of her company, and always pouting at the suggestion of her marrying a mere fox hunter. The whole thing, of course, furnished conversation for the gossips, and Mr. Bogledyke, as in duty bound, reported what he heard. She puzzled his lordship more than any lady he had ever had to do with, and though he often resolved to strike and be free, he had only to meet her again to go home more subjugated than ever. And so, what between Mr. Glancy out of doors and Mrs. Moppet in, he began to have a very unpleasant time of it. His hat had so long covered his family that he hardly knew how to set about obtaining his own consent to marry. And yet he felt that he ought to marry if it was only to spite his odious heir, old General Binks, for his lordship called him old, though the general was ten years younger than himself. But still he would like to look about him a little longer. What he would now wish to do would be to keep Mr. Glancy in the country, for he felt interested in her, and thought she would be ornamental to the pack. Moreover, he liked all that was handsome, piquant, and gay, and to be joked about the feather Bedfordshire witches when he went to town. So he resolved himself into a committee of ways and means to consider how the object was to be effected without surrendering himself. That must be the last resource at all events, thought he. Now upon his lordship's vast estates was a most unmitigated blockhead called Imperial John from his growing one of those chin appendages. His real name was Hybrid, John Hybrid of Barley Hill Farm, but his handsome sister, Imperial Jane, as the wags called her, having attracted his lordship's attention to the danger, as it was thought of old Binks, on leaving her furnishing seminary at Turnham Green, John had been taken by the hand, which caused him to lose his head and make him set up for what he called a gent. He built a lodge and a portico to Barley Hill Farm, rough cast, and put a pine roof onto the house, and then advertised in the Feather Bedfordshire Gazette that letters and papers were for the future to be addressed to John Hybrid Esquire, Barley Hill Hall, and not farm as they had hitherto been. And having done so much for the place, John next revised his own person, which, though not unsightly, was coarse and a long way off looking anything like that of a gentleman. He first started the imperial aforesaid, and not being laughed at as much as he expected for that, he was emboldened to order a red coat for the then approaching season. Mounting the pink is a critical thing, for if a man does not land in the front rank, they will not admit him again into the rear, and he remains a sort of red bat for the rest of his life, neither a gentleman nor a farmer. John, however, feeling that he had his lordship's countenance, went boldly at it, and the first day of the season before that with which we are dealing found him with his stomach buttoned consequentially up in a spick-and-span scarlet with fancy buttons, looking as bumptious as a man with a large balance at his bankers. He sat bolt upright, holding his whip like a field marshal's baton on his ill-groomed horse, with a tight bearing rein chucking the imperial chin well in the air, and a sort of half-defiant, you'd better not laugh at me look and John was always proud to break a fence or turn a hound or hold a horse or do anything his lordship bid him, and became a sort of hunting aide-de-camp to the great man. He was a boasting, bragging fool, always talking about moy hall and moy lodge and moy plate and moy drawing-room, for he had not discovered that plate was the appendage of a dining-room, and altogether he was very magnificent. Imperial Jane kept old Binks on the fret for some time, until another of his lordship's tenants, young Fred Poppyfield, becoming enamored of her charms, and perhaps wishing to ride in scarlet too, sought her fair hand, whereupon his lordship, acting with his usual munificence, set them up on a farm at so low a rent that it acquired the name of Gift Hall Farm. This arrangement set Barley Hall free so far as the petticoats were concerned, and his lordship, little knowing how well she was up in the country, thought this great goke of a farmer with his plate in his drawing room might come over the accomplished Mr. Glancy, the lady who sneered at himself as Emir Fox Hunter. And the wicked monkey favored the delusion which she saw through the moment his lordship brought the pompous egotist up at Newington Gorse, and begged to be allowed to introduce his friend Mr. Hybrid, and she inwardly resolved to give Mr. Hybrid a benefit. Forsaking his lordship, therefore, entirely, she put forth her most seductive allurements at Imperial John, talked most amazingly to him, rode over whatever he recommended, and seemed quite smitten with him. And John, who used to boast that somehow the gals couldn't withstand him, was so satisfied with his success that he presently blundered out an offer, when Mr. Glancy, having led him out to the extreme length of his tether, gave such a start and shudder of astonishment as Fanny Kemble or Mrs. Siddons herself might have envied. Oh, Mr. Hybrid, oh, Mr. Hybrid, gasped she, opening wide her intelligent eyes as if she had but just discovered his meaning. Oh, Mr. Hybrid, exclaimed she for the third time, you, 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 and turning aside as if to conceal her emotion, she buried her face in her lace-fringed, richly ciphered kerchief. John, who was rather put out by some women who were watching him from the adjoining turnip field, construing all this into the usual misfortune of the ladies not being able to withstand him, returned to the charge as soon as he got out of their hearing, when he was suddenly brought up by such a withering, Sir, do you mean to insult me? 
coupled with a look that nearly started the basket buttons of his green cutaway and convinced him that Mr. Glancy at all events could withstand him. So his majesty slunk off, consoling himself with the reflection that riding habits covered a multitude of sins, and that if he was not much mistaken, she would want a deal of oil cake or cod liver oil or summit of that sort before she was fit to show. And the next time Miss met my lord, which of course she did by accident, she pouted and frowned at the mere fox hunter, and intimated her intention of leaving the country, going home to her mamma, in fact. It was just at this juncture that Mrs. Pringle's letter arrived, and his lordship's mind being distracted between love on his own account, dread of matrimony, and dislike of old Binks, he caught at what he would in general have stormed at, and wrote to say that he should begin hunting the first Monday in November, and if Mrs. Pringle's son would come down a day or two before, he would put him up, which meant mount him, and do for him, which meant board and lodge him, all, in fact, that Mrs. Pringle could desire. And his lordship inwardly hoped that Mr. Pringle might be more to Miss de Glancy's liking than his imperial highness had proved. At all events, he felt it was but a simple act of justice to himself to try. Let us now return to Curtain Crescent. End of chapter 9. Read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 10 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 10. Jean Roger, or Jack Rogers. We need not say that Mrs. Pringle was overjoyed at the receipt of the Earl's letter. It was so kind and good, and so like him. He always said he would do her a good turn if he could, but there are so many fine-weather friends in this world that there is no being certain of any one. Happy are they who never have occasion to test the sincerity of their friends, say we. Mrs. Pringle was now all bustle and excitement preparing Billy for the great event. His wardrobe, always grand, underwent revision in the undergarment line. She got him some magnificently embroidered dress shirts, so fine that the fronts almost looked as if you might blow them out, and regardful of the role he was now about to play, she added several dozen with horses, dogs, birds, and foxes upon them, suitable for fishing, shooting, boating, etc., as the advertisement said. His cambric kerchiefs were of the finest quality, while his stockings and other things were in great abundance, the whole surmounted by a splendid dressing case, the likes of which had ne'er been seen since the days of P. Green Hain. Altogether, he was capitally provided, and quite in accordance with the lady's maid's ideas of gentility. Billy, on his part, was active and energetic, too, for though he had his doubts about being able to sit at the jumps, he had no objection to wear a red coat, and mysterious-looking boys with blue bags were constantly to be found seated on the mahogany bench in the Curtain Crescent Passage waiting to try on his top boots, while the Cheval glass upstairs was constantly reflecting his figure in scarlet a la old Briggs. The concomitants of the chase, leathers, cords, whips, spurs, came pouring in apace. The next thing was to get somebody to take care of them. It is observable that the heads of the various branches of an establishment are all in favor of Master spending all his money on their particular department. Thus, the coachman would have him run entirely to carriages, the groom to horses, the cook to the cuisine, the butler to wines, the gardener to grapes, etc., and so on. Mrs. Pringle, we need hardly say, favored ladies' maids and valets. It has been well said that if a man wants to get acquainted with a gentleman's private affairs, he should either go to the lawyer or else to the valet that's courting the ladies' maid, and Mrs. Pringle was quite of that opinion. Moreover, she held that no man with an efficient, properly trained valet need ever be cat's pawed or jilted because the ladies' maid would feel it a point of honor to let the valet know how the land lay, a compliment he would return under similar circumstances. To provide Billy with this, as she considered most essential appendage to a gentleman, was her next consideration, a valet that should know enough and not too much, enough to enable him to blow his master's trumpet properly, and not too much, lest he should turn restive and play the wrong tune. At length, she fixed upon the Anglo-Frenchman whose name stands at the head of this chapter, Jean Roger, or Jack Rogers. Jack was the son of old Jack Rogers, so well known as the enactor of the Drunken Hussar and similar characters of Nutkin Circus, and Jack was entered to his father's profession, but disagreeing with the clown Tom Oliver, who used to give him sundry most unqualified cuts and cuffs in the circus, Jack, who was a tremendously strong fellow, gave Oliver such a desperate beating one night as caused his life to be despaired of. This took place at Nottingham, from whence Jack fled for fear of the consequences, and after sundry vicissitudes he was next discovered as a postboy at Sittingbourne, an office that he was well adapted for, being short and stout and extremely powerful. No brute was ever too bad for Jack's riding, he would tame them before the day was over. 
Somehow, he got bumped down to Dover when, taking a fancy to go foreign, he sold his master's horses for what they would fetch, and this being just about the time that the late Mr. Probert expiated a similar mistake at the Old Bailey, Jack, hearing of it, thought it was better to stay where he was than give Mr. Calcraft any trouble. He therefore accepted the situation of Boots to the Albion Hotel, Boulogne sur Mer, but finding that he did not get on half so well as he would if he were a Frenchman, he took to acquiring the language, which, with getting his ears bored, letting his hair and whiskers grow, and adopting the French costume in all its integrity, coupled with a liberal attack of the smallpox, soon told a tale in favor of his fees. After a long absence, he at length returned at the Bill Smith Revolution, and vacillating for some time between a courier and a valet, finally settled down to what we now find him. We know not how it is if valets are so essentially necessary that there should always be so many out of place, but certain it is that an advertisement in a morning paper will always bring a full crop to a door. Perhaps, being the laziest of all lazy lives, anyone can turn his hand to valeting who to dig is unable and yet to want is unwilling. Mrs. Pringle knew better than hold a levy at Curtain Crescent, letting all the applicants pump proper John or such of the maids as they could get hold of, and having advertised for written applications stating full particulars of a previous service and credentials to be addressed to F.P. at Chisel the Bakers in Yeast Street, she selected some half dozen of the most promising ones, and appointed the parties to meet her at different hours, of course, at the first-class waiting rooms of the Great Western Station, intimating that they would know her by a bunch of red geranium she would hold in her hand. And the second applicant, Jean Roger, looked so like her money, having a sufficient knowledge of the English language to be able to understand all that was said, and yet at the same time sufficiently ignorant of it to invite confidential communications to be made before him, that after glancing over the testimonials bound up in his little parchment-backed passport book, she got the name and address of his then master, and sought an interview to obtain Monsieur's character. This gentleman, Sir Harry Bolter, happening to owe Jack three-quarters of a year's wages, which he was not likely to pay, spoke of him in the highest possible terms, glossing over his little partiality for drink by saying that, like all Frenchmen, he was of a convivial turn, and in consequence of Sir Harry's and Jack's own recommendations, Mrs. Pringle took him. The reader will therefore now have the kindness to consider our hero and his valet under way, with a perfect pyramid of luggage, and Monsieur arrayed in the foraging cap, the little coatee, the petticoat trousers, and odds and ends money bag of his long-adopted country slung across his ample chest. Their arrival and reception at Tantivy Castle will perhaps be best described in the following letter from Billy to his mother. Tantivy Castle. My dearest mamma, I write a line to say that I arrived here quite safe by the 5.30 train, and found the Earl as polite as possible. I should tell you that I made a mistake at starting for it being dark when I arrived, and getting confused with a whole regiment of footmen, I mistook a fine gentleman who came forward to meet me for the Earl, and I made him a most respectful bow which the ass returned, and began to talk about the weather, and when the real Earl came in, I took him for a guest and was going to weather him. However, he soon put all matters right and introduced me to Mrs. Moffat, a very fine lady who seems to rule the roost here in grand style. They say she never wears the same dress twice. There are always at least half a dozen powdered footmen in cerulean blue lined with rose-coloured silk and pink silk stockings, the whole profusely illustrated with gold lace, gold agulets, and I don't know what, lounging about in the halls and passages, wailing for company which Rouget says never comes. This worthy seems to have mastered the ins and outs of the place already, and says, My lord has an Englishman to cook his beefsteak for breakfast, a Frenchman to cook his dinner, and an Italian confectioner, everything that a my lord ought to have. It is a splendid place, as you will see by the above picture, more like Windsor than anything I ever saw, and there seems to be no expense spare that could by any possibility be incurred. I've got a beautiful bedroom with warm and cold baths and a conservatory attached. Tomorrow is the first day of the season, and all the world and his wife will be there to a grand déjeuner à la fauché. The hounds meet before the castle. His lordship says he will put me on a safe, steady hunter, and I hope he will, for I am not quite sure that I consider the jumps. However, I'll let you know how I come on. Meanwhile, as the gong is sounding for dressing, believe me, my dearest mamma, ever your truly affectionate son, Wynne Pringle. Mrs. Pringle, Curtain Crescent, Belgrade Square, London. End of chapter 10, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 11 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVax recording. All LibriVax recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVax.org. Read by Grace. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. The Opening Day, The Hunt Breakfast. 
Reversing the usual order of things, each first Monday in November saw the sporting inmates of Tantivy Castle emerge from the chrysalis into the butterfly state of existence. His lordship's green duck hunter and drab caps disappeared and were succeeded by a spick and span, span new scarlet and white top. Mr. Rogledyke's last year's pink was replaced by a new one. His hat was succeeded by a cap, and the same luck attended the garments of both Swan and Speed. The stud groom, the pad groom, the sending on groom, all the grooms, down to our little friend, Cupid without wings, underwent renovation in their outward men. The whole place smelt of leather and new cloth. The castle itself, on this occasion, seemed to participate in the general festivity, for a bright sun emblazoned the quarterings of the gaily flaunting flag, lit up the glittering veins of the lower towers, and burnished the modest ivy of the basements. Everything was bright and sunny, and though Dicky Bogledyke did not exactly like the red sunrise, he opened the Rhine might keep off until they were done, especially as it was a show day. Very showy indeed it was, for all the gentlemen out of livery, those strange puzzlers, were in full ball costume, while the standard footmen strutted like peacocks in their rich blue liveries with rose-colored linings and enormous bouquets under their noses, feeling that for once they were going to have something to do. The noble earl, having got himself up most elaborately in his new hunting garments, and affected a satisfactory tie of a heart's ease embroidered blue satin cravat, took his usual stand before the now blazing wood and coal fire in the enormous grate in the center of his magnificent baronial hall, ready to receive his visitors and pass them on to Mrs. Muffet in the banqueting room. This fair lady was just as fine as hands could make her, and the fit of her rich, pale, satin dress trimmed with swans down, reflected equal credit on her milliner and her maid. Looking at her as she now sat at the head of the sumptuously furnished breakfast table, her plainly dressed hair surmounted by a diminutive point lace cap, and her gazelle-like eye lighting up an intelligent countenance, it were hardly possible to imagine that she had ever been handsomer or that beneath that quiet aspect there lurked what is politely called a high spirit, that is to say, a little bit of temper. That, however, is more the Earl's lookout than ours, so we will return to his lordship at the entrance hall fire. Of course this sort of gathering was of rather an anomalous character, some coming because they wanted something, some because they durstn't stay away, some because they did not know Mrs. Moffat would be there, some because they did not care whether she was or not. It was a show day, and they came to see the beautiful castle, not Mrs. Anybody. The first to arrive were the gentlemen of the second class, the agents and dependents of the estate, Mr. Cipher, the auditor, he who never audited, Mr. Easy Lease, the land agent, his son, Mr. John Easy Lease, the sucking land agent, Mr. Staple, the mining agent, Mr. Jane Staple, the sucking mining agent, Mr. Section, the architect, Mr. Pillerton, the doctor, Mr. Brick, the builder, who were all very polite and obsequious. Your lordship and my lording, the earl at every opportunity, these, ranging themselves on either side of the fire, now formed the nucleus of the court, with the earl in the center. Presently the rumbling of wheels and the grinding of gravel was succeeded by the muffled drum sort of sound of the wood pavement of the grand covered portico, and the powdered footmen threw back the folding doors as if they expected Daniel Lambert or the Durham Ox to enter. It was our old friend, Imperial John, who having handed his pipe-clayed reins to his plowman groom, descended from his buggy with a clumsy half-buck, half-hawbuck sort of air, and entered the spacious portals of the castle hall. Having divested himself of his pale tot in which he had been doing, the pride that apes humility, he shook out his red feathers, pulled up his sea-green silk-tied gills, 
finger-combed his stiff black hair, and stood forth a sort of rough impersonation of the last year's earl. His coat was the same cut, his hat was the same shape, his boots and breeches were the same color, and altogether there was the same sort of resemblance between John and the earl that there is between a cart-horse and a race-horse. Having deposited his whip and pale tot on the table on the door-side of a tall, wide-spreading carved oak screen, which at once concealed the enterers from the court and kept the wind from that august assembly, John was now ready for the very obsequious gentleman who had been standing watching his performances without considering it necessary to give him any assistance. This bland gentleman, in his own blue coat with a white vest, having made a retrograde movement which cleared himself of the screen, John was presently crossing the hall, bowing and stepping and bowing and stepping as if he was measuring off a drain. His lordship, who felt grateful for John's recent services, and perhaps thought he might require them again, advanced to meet him and gave him a very cordial shake of the hand, as much as to say, "'Never mind, Mr. Glancy, old fellow. We'll make it right another time.' They then fell to conversing about turnips, John's green globes having turned out a splendid crop, while his Swedes were not so good as usual, though they still might improve. A more potent wheel roll than John's now attracted his lordship's attention, and through the far windows he saw a large canary-colored arc of a coach, driven by a cockaded coachman, which he at once recognized as belonging to his natural enemy, Major Yammerton, five and thirty years master of harriers, as the major would say. Without a subscription, Mr. Bogledyke had lately been regaling his lordship with some of the major's boastings about his harriers, and the wonderful sport they showed, which he had the impudence to compare with his lordship's foxhounds, besides which he was always disturbing his lordship's covers on the Roughborough side of the country, causing his lordship to snub him at all opportunities. The major, however, who was a keen, hard-bitten little man, not easily choked off when he wanted anything, and his present want being to be made a magistrate, he had attired himself in an antediluvian swallow-tailed scarlet with a gothic arched collar and brought his wife and two pretty daughters to aid in the design. Of course the ladies were only coming to see the castle. The cockaded coachman, having tied his reins to the rail of the driving-box, descended from his eminence to release his passengers, while a couple of cerulean blue gentlemen looked complacently on, each with half a door in his hand, ready to throw open as they approached. The party were presently at the hall table, where one of those indispensable articles, a looking-glass, enabled the ladies to rectify any little derangement incidental to the joltings of the journey, while the little major run a pocket-comb through a fringe of carroty curls that encircled his bald head, and disposed of a cream-colored scarf cravat to what he considered the best advantage. Having drawn a doe-skin glove on to the left hand, he offered his arm to his wife, and advanced from behind the screen with his hat in his ungloved right hand, ready to transfer it to the left, should occasion require. "'Ah, Major Yammerton!' exclaimed the Earl, breaking off in the middle of the turnip dialogue with Imperial John. "'Ah, Major Yammerton, I'm delighted to see you,' getting a glimpse of the girls. "'Mrs. Yammerton, this is indeed extremely kind,' continued he, taking both her hands in his. "'And bringing your lovely daughters,' continued he, advancing to greet them. Mrs. Yammerton here gave the major a nudge to remind him of his propriety speech. The g -g girls and Mrs. Y -Y Yammerton, for he always stuttered when he told lies, which was pretty often. The g -g girls and Mrs. Y -Y Yammerton have done me the honor. Another nudge from Mrs. Yammerton. I mean to say the g -g girls and Mrs. Y -Y Yammerton, observed he with a stamp of the foot and a shake of the head for he saw that his dread enemy, Imperial John, was laughing at him, have done themselves the honor of c -c coming and hopes to be allowed the p pleasure of seeing your mamma magnificent collection of p 
pictures, the major at length getting out what he had been charged to say. "'By all means!' exclaimed the delighted earl. "'By all means. But first let me have the pleasure of conducting you to the refreshment room.' saying which his lordship offered Mrs. Yammerton his arm. So passing up the long gallery, and entering by the private door, he popped her down beside Mrs. Muffet before Mrs. Yammerton knew where she was. Just then our friend Billy Pringle, who, with the aid of Rozier, had effected a most successful lodgment in his hunting things, made his appearance, to whom the earl, having assigned the care of the young ladies, now beat a retreat to the hall leaving Mrs. Yammerton lost in astonishment as to what her Mrs. Grundy would say, and speculations as to which of her daughters would do for Mr. Pringle. Imperial John, who had usurped the Earl's place before the fire, now shied off to one side as his lordship approached, and made his most flexible obeisance to the two Mr. Fothergills and Mr. Stott, who had arrived during his absence. These, then, gladly passed on to the banqueting room just as the condor-like wings of the entrance hall door flew open and admitted imperial jane now the buxom mrs poppyfield she came smiling past the screen magnificently attired in purple velvet and ermine pretending she had only come to warn herself at the all fire while pop looked for the groom who had brought his horse and who was to drive her home but hearing from the earl that the Yammertons were all in the banqueting room, she saw no reason why she shouldn't go too. So when the next shoal of company broke against the screen, she took Imperial John's arm and proceeded by a cloud of lackeys, Cerulean Blue and others, passed from the hall to the grand apartment, up which she sailed majestically, tossing her plumed head at the usurper, Mrs. Muffet and then increased the kettle of fish poor Mrs. Yammerton was in by seating herself beside her. Impudent woman, thought Mrs. Yammerton. If I'd had any idea of this, I wouldn't have come. And she thought how lucky it was she had put the major up to asking to see the pictures. It was almost a pity he was so anxious to be a magistrate. He thought he might be satisfied with being major of such a fine regiment as the Featherbed Fordshire Militia. Nor were her anxieties diminished by the way the girls took the words out of each other's mouths, as it were, in their intercourse with Billy Pringle, thus preventing either from making any permanent impression. The great flood of company now poured into the hall. Red coats, green coats, black coats, brown coats, mingled with variously colored petticoats. The ladies of the court, Mrs. Cipher, Mrs. Pillerton, Mrs. and the Mrs. Easylease, Mrs. Section, and others hurried through with a shivering sort of step, as if they were going to bathe. Mr. Dorsey Davis, the wee of the Feather Bedfordshire Gazette, made his bow and passed on with stately air, as a ruler of the roast ought to do. The Earl of Stair, as Mr. Buckwheat was called, from the fixed protuberance of his eyes, a sort of second edition of Imperial John. But wanting his looks, and Game Boy Green, the hard rider of the hunt, came in together, and the Earl of Stair, sporting scarlet, advanced to his brother peer, the Earl, who, not thinking him an available card, turned him over to Imperial John, who had now returned from his voyage with Imperial Jane, while his lordship commenced a building conversation with Mr. Brick. A lull then ensuing as if the door had done its duty, his lordship gave a wave of his hand, whereupon the trained courtiers shot out into horns on either side, with his lordship in the centre, and passed majestically along to the banqueting room. The noble apartment, a hundred feet long, and correspondingly proportioned, was in the full swing of hospitality when the earl entered. The great influx of guests for which the castle was always prepared had at length really arrived, and from Mrs. Moffat's end of the table to the door were continuous lines of party-colored eaters, all engaged in the noble act of deglutition. Up the center was a magnificent avenue of choice exotics in gold, silver, and china vases, 
alternating with sugar-spun towers, temples, pagodas, and rialtos, with here and there the more substantial form of massive plate, epergnes, testimonials, and prizes of different kinds. It was a regular field day for plate, linen, and china. The whole force of domestics was now brought to bear upon the charge, and the cerulean blue gentlemen vied with the gentlemen out of livery and the assiduity of their attentions. Soup, game, tea, coffee, chocolate, ham, eggs, honey, marmalade, grapes, pines, melons, ices, buns, cakes, skimmed and soared and floated about the room in obedience to the behests of the callers. The only apparently disengaged person in the room was Monsieur Jean Roger, who, in a blue coat with a velvet collar and bright buttons, a rolling collared white vest, and an amplified lace-tipped black joinville, stood like a powder pigeon behind Mr. Pringle's chair, the beau ideal of an indifferent spectator. And yet, he was anything but an indifferent spectator, for beneath his stubbly hair were a pair of little roving, watchful eyes, and his ringed ears were cocked for whatever they could catch. The clatter-patter, clatter-patter of eating, which was slightly interrupted by the entrance of his lordship, was soon in full vigor again, and all eyes resumed the contemplation of the plates. Presently, the fizz-pop-bang of a champagne cork was heard on the extreme right, which was immediately taken up on the left and ran down either side of the table like gigantic crackers. Eighty guests were now imbibing the sparkling fluid as fast as the footman could supply it. And it was wonderful what a volubility that single glass apiece, to be sure they were good large ones, infused into the meeting. How tongue-tied ones became talkative, and odd ones began to feel themselves sufficiently at home to tackle with the pines and sugar ornaments of the center. Grottos and pyramids and pagodas and rialtos began to topple to their fall, and even a sugar crystal palace, which occupied the post of honor between two flower-decked Severus vases, was threatened with destruction. The band and the gardeners were swept away immediately, and an assault on the fountains was only prevented by the interference of Mr. Beveridge, the butler. And now a renewed pomponating commenced, more formidable, if possible, than the first, and all glasses were eagerly drained and prepared to receive the salute. All being ready, Lord Ladythorne rose amid the applause so justly due to a man entertaining his friends, and after a few prefatory remarks, expressive of the pleasure it gave him to see them all again at the opening of another season, and hoping that they might have many more such meetings, he concluded by giving as a toast, success to fox-hunting, which of course was drunk upstanding with all the honors. All parties having gradually subsided into their seats after this uncomfortable performance, a partial lull ensued, which was at length interrupted by his lordship giving Imperial John, who sat on his left, a nod, who after a loud, throat-clearing, hem rose bolt upright, with his imperial chin well up, and began, Gentlemen and ladies, just as little Weasley Major Yammerton commenced, ladies and gentlemen, from Mrs. Moffat's end of the table. This brought things to a standstill. Some called for hybrid, some for Yammerton, and each disliking the other, neither was disposed to give way. The calls, however, becoming more frequent for Gamerton, who had never addressed them before, while Hybrid had, saying the same thing both times. The Earl gave His Highness a hint to sit down, and the Major was then left in that awful predicament from which so many men would be glad to escape, after they had achieved it, namely, the possession of the meeting. However, Gamerton had got his speech well off and had the heads of it under his plate, so on silence being restored, he thus went away with it. Ladies and gentlemen, cough. Ladies and gentlemen, hem. I rise, I assure you, cough, with feelings of considerable trepidation, hem, 
to perform an act of greater difficulty than may at first sight appear. <laughs> For let me ask what it is I am about to do. You know best, growled Imperial John, thinking how ill he was doing it. I am going to propose the health of a noble man. Applause. Of whom in whose presence, if I say too much, I may offend, and if I say too little, I shall most justly receive your displeasure. Renewed applause. But, ladies and gentlemen, there are times when the humblest abilities become equal to the occasion, and assuredly this is one. Applause. To estimate the character of the illustrious nobleman aright, whose health I shall conclude by proposing, we must regard him in his several capacities. Applause. As Lord Lieutenant of the great country of Featherbed Ford, as a great and liberal landlord, as a kind and generous neighbor, and though last, not least, as a brilliant sportsman. Great applause, during which Yammerton looked under his plate at his notes. As Lord Lieutenant, continued he, perhaps the greatest praise I can offer him, the idest compliment I can pay him, is to say that his appointments are so truly impartial as not to disclose his own politics, applause. As a landlord, he is so truly a pattern that it would be a mere waste of words for me to try to recommend him to your notice, applause. As a neighbor, he is truly exemplary in all the relations of life, applause. And as a sportsman, having myself kept Harriers five and thirty years without a subscription, I may be permitted to say that he is quite first-rate. Laughter from the Earl's end of the table, and applause from Mrs. Muffet's. In all the relations of life, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, continued the Major, looking irately down at the laughers, I beg to propose the bumper toast of health and long life to our aust noble Earl of Lady Thorne. Whereupon the little Major popped down on his chair, wondering whether he had omitted anything he ought to have said, and seeing him well down, Imperial John, who was not to be done out of his show-off, rose, glass in hand, and exclaimed in a stentorian voice, "'Gentlemen and ladies, oi, beg to propose that we drink this toast up standin' with all the honours. Feather bid for chire, fire!' Upon which there was a great outburst of applause, mingled with demands for wine and requests from the ladies that the gentlemen would be good enough to take their chairs off their dresses or move a little to one side so that they might have room to stand up, crinoline, we should observe, being very abundant with many of them. A tremendous discharge of popularity then ensued, the cheers being led by Imperial John, much to the little major's chagrin, who wondered how he could ever have sat down without calling for them. Now the Earl, we should observe, had not risen in the best of moods that morning, having had a disagreeable dream in which he saw old Binks rising his favorite horse valiant, Mazeppa fashion, making a drag of his statue of the Greek slave, enveloped in an anise-seated bathing-gown, a vexation that had been further increased when he arose, by the receipt of a letter from his good-natured friend in London, telling him how old Binks had been boasting at Boodle's that he was within an ace of an earldom, and now to be clumsily palavered by Yammerton was more than he could bear. He didn't want to be praised for anything but his sporting propensities, and Imperial John knew how to do it. Having, however, a good dash of satire in his composition, when the applause and the crinoline had subsided, he arose as if highly delighted, and assured them that if anything could enhance the pleasure of that meeting, it was to have his health proposed by such a sportsman as Major Yammerton, a gentleman who he believed had kept Harriers five and thirty years, a feat he believed altogether unequaled in the annals of sporting. Laughter and applause, during which the little Major felt sure he was going to conclude by proposing his health with all the honors, instead of which, however, his lordship branched off to his own department of sport, urging them to preserve foxes most scrupulously, never to mind a little poultry damage, for Mr. Bogledyke would put all that right, never to let the odious word strychnine be heard in the country, and concluded by proposing a bumper to their next merry meeting, 
which was the usual termination of the proceedings. The party then rose, chairs fell out of line, and flying crumpled napkins completed the confusion of the scene. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. The Morning Fox, The Afternoon Fox. The day was quite at its best, with uh, party-colored bees emerging from the suites of Tantivy Castle to taint the pure atmosphere with their nasty cigars and air themselves on the terrace, letting the unadmitted world below see on what excellent terms they were with an earl. Then Imperial John upbraided Major Yammerton for taking the words out of his mouth, as it were, and the cocky Major turned up his nose at the farmer fellow for presuming to lecture him. Then the emboldened lady strolled through the picture galleries and reception rooms, regardless of Mrs. Moffat or anyone else, wondering where this door led to and where that. The hounds had been basking and loitering on the lawn for some time, undergoing the inspection and criticisms of the non-hunting portion of the establishment, the gardeners, the gamekeepers, the coachmen, the helpers, the housemaids, and so on. They all pronounced them as perfect as could be, and Mr. Hogledyke received their compliments with becoming satisfaction, saying with a chuck of his chin, Yes, yes, I think they're about as good as can be. Perfection, I may say. Having abused the cigars, we hope our fair friends will now excuse us for saying that we know of few less agreeable scenes than a show meet with foxhounds. The whole thing is opposed to the wild nature of hunting. Some people can eat at any time, but to a well-regulated appetite, having to undergo even the semblance of an additional meal is inconvenient, while to have to take a bona fide dinner in the morning, soup, toast, speeches, and all, is perfectly suicidal of pleasure. On this occasion, the wine-flushed guests seem fitted for Cremon or Foxhall, as they used to pronounce Vauxhall, than for fox hunting. Indeed, the cigar gentry swaggered about with a very rakish Regent Street air. His lordship alone seemed impressed with the importance of the occasion, but his anxiety arose from indecision caused by the Bink's dream and letter, and fear lest the Yammerton girls might spoil Billy for Mr. Glancy, should his lordship adhere to his intention of introducing them to each other. Then he began to fidget lest he might be late at the appointed place, and Mr. Glancy go home, and so frustrate either design. To horse, to horse, therefore exclaimed he, now hurrying through the crowd, lowering his imperial Jane made hat string and drawing on his Moffat knit mitts. To horse, to horse, repeated he, flourishing his cane hunting whip, causing a commotion among the outer circle of grooms. His magnificent black horse, Valiant, the one he had seen old Binks bucketing, faultless in shape, faultless in condition, faultless every way, stepped proudly aside, and Cupid without wings dropping himself off by the neck. Mr. Beanley, the stud groom, swept the coroneted rug over the horse's bang tail as a superb and sensible animal stepped forward to receive his rider as the earl came up. With a jaunty air, the gay old gentleman vaulted lightly into the saddle, saying as he drew the thin rein and felt the horse gently with his left leg, Now get Mr. Pringle his horse. His lordship then passed on a few paces to receive the skyscraping salutes of the servants, and at a jerk of his head the cavalcade was in motion. Our friend Billy then became the object of attention. The dismounted Cupid dived into the thick of the led horses to seek his, while Mr. Beanley went respectfully up to him and with a touch of his flat-brimmed hat intimated that his oss was at and. "'What sort of animal is it?' asked the somewhat misgiving Billy, now bowing his adieus to the pretty Mrs. Yammerton. "'A very nice oss, sir,' replied Mr. Beanley, with another touch of his hat. "'Yes, sir, a very nice oss, a perfect hunter. Nothing to do but sit still and give him his head. He'll take far better care of you than you can of him.' 
So saying, Mr. Beanley led the way to a very sedate-looking, thoroughbred bay with a flat flap saddle and a splint boot on his near foreleg, but in other respects quite unobjectionable. He was one of swan stud, but Mr. Beanley, understanding from the under-butler who had it from Jack Rogers, we beg his pardon, Monsieur Rogier himself, that Mr. Pringle was likely to be a good tip, he had drawn it for him. The stirrups, for a wonder, being the right length, Billy was presently astride, and in pursuit of his now progressing lordship, the gaping crowd making way for the young lord as they supposed him to be, for people are all lords when they visit at lords. Pop, pop, bob, bob went the black caps of the men in advance, indicating the whereabouts of the hounds, while his lordship ambled over the green turf on the right, surrounded by the usual high-pressure toadies. Thus the cavalcade passed through the large, wood-studded, deer-scattered park, rousing the nearer herds from their lyres, frightening the silver tails into their holes, and causing the conceited hares to scuttle away for the fern-brown, undulating hills, as if they had the vanity to suppose that this goodly array would condescend to have anything to do with them. Silly things. Peppercorn the keeper had a much readier way of settling their business. The field then crossed a long stretch of smooth, ornamental water by the old Gothic arched bridge and passed through the beautiful iron gates of the South Lodge, now wheeled back by gray-headed porters in cerulean blue plush coats and broad gold lace hats. Meanwhile, the whereabouts of the accustomed hunt was indicated by a lengthening line of pedestrians and small cavalry toiling across the park by Duntler, the watcher's cottage, and the deer sheds, to the door in the wall at the bottom of Crow Tree Hill, from whence a bird's-eye view of the surrounding country is obtained. The piece had been enacted so often, the same company, the same day, the same hour, the same find, the same finish, that one might almost imagine it was the same fox. On this particular occasion, however, as if out of pure contradiction, Master Reynard, by a series of successful maneuvers, lying down, running a wall, popping backwards and forwards between ashy quarries and warmly gorse, varied by an occasional trip to Crow Tree Hill, completely baffled Mr. Bogledyke, so that it was afternoon before he brought his morning fox to hand, to the great discomfort of the Earl, who had twice or thrice signaled Swan to hoo-hoop him to the ground, when the tiresome animal popped up in the midst of the pack. At length Bogledyke mastered him, and after proclaiming him a cowardly, short-running, dastardly traitor, no better nor a hare, he chucked him scornfully to the hounds, decorating Master Pillerton's pony with a brush, while Swan distributed the pads among the others of the rising generation. The last act of the show meet being thus concluded, Mr. Bogledyke and his men quickly collected their hounds and set off in search of fresh fields and pastures new. The Earl, having disposed of his show meat fox, a bagman of course, now set up his business back and getting alongside of Mr. Bogledyke, led the pack at as good a trot as the hounds and the state of the line would allow. The newly laid winestone of the Brittleworth Road rather impeded their progress at first, but this inconvenience was soon overcome by the road becoming less parsimonious in width, extending at length to a grass siding, along which his lordship ambled at a toe to the stirrup trot, his eagle eye taking every bend and curve, his mind distracted with visions of binks and anxiety for the future. He couldn't get over the dream, and the letter had anything but cheered him. Very odd, said he to himself, very odd, as nothing but drab-coated farmers and dark-coated grooms lounging leisurely on, with here and there a loitering pedestrian, broke the monotony of the scene. Hope she's not tired and gone home, thought he, looking now at his watch and now back into the crowd to see where he had Billy Pringle. There was Billy, riding alongside of Major Yammerton's old flea-bitten gray, whose rider was impressing Billy with a sense of his consequence and the excellence of his harriers, paving the way for an invitation to Yammerton Grange. Dash, that Yammerton, growled his lordship, thinking how he was spoiling sport at both ends, at the castle by his uninvited eloquence, and now by his 
fastening on to the only man in the field he didn't want him to get acquainted with, and his lordship inwardly resolved that he would make easy lease a magistrate before he would make the major one. So settling matters in his own mind, he gave the gallant valiant a gentle tap on the shoulder with his whip and shot a few paces ahead of Dicky, telling the whips to keep the crowd off the hounds, meaning off himself. Thus he ambled on through the quiet little village of Strotherdale, whose inhabitants all rushed out to see the hounds pass, and after tantalizing poor Jonathan Gape, the turnpike gate man at the far end, who thought he was going to get a grand haul, he turned short to the left down the torturous green lane leading to Quarrington Gorse. There's a footmark, said the lordship to himself, looking down at the now closely eaten sward. Ah, and there's a hat and feather, added he as a sudden turn of the lane afforded a passing glimpse. Thus inspirited, he mended his pace a little and was presently in sight of the wearer. There was the bay and there was the wide awake and there was the green trimming and there was the feather. But somehow as he got nearer, they all seemed to have lost caste. The slender waist and graceful upright seed had degenerated into a fuller form and lazy slouch. The habit didn't look like her habit, nor the bay horse like her bay horse, and as he got within speaking distance, the healthy, full-blown face of Miss Winkworth smiled upon him instead of the mild, placid features of the elegant de Glancy. "'Ah, my dear Miss Winkworth,' exclaimed his half-disgusted, half-delighted lordship, raising his hat and then extending the right hand of fellowship. Ah, my dear Miss Winkworth, I'm charmed to see you, inwardly wondering what business women had out hunting. Hope you are all well at home, continued he, most devoutly wishing she was there, and without waiting for an answer, he commenced a furious assault upon Benedict, who had taken a fancy to follow him, a performance that enabled General Bogledyke to come up with that army of relief, the pack, and engulfed the lady in the sea of horsemen in the rear. If that had been her, said his lordship to himself, old Binks would have had a better chance, and he thought what an odious thing a bad copy was. Another bend of the land and another glimpse presently put all matters right. The real feather now fluttered before him. There was the graceful, upright seat, the elegant air, the well-groomed horse, the tout ensemblage being heightened, if possible, by the recent contrast with the coarse, country-attired Miss Winkworth. The Earl again trotted gently on, raising his hat most deferentially as it came alongside of her, as usual, unaverted head. "'Good morning, my lord,' exclaimed she gaily, as if agreeably surprised, tendering for the first time her pretty little, primrose-colored, kid-gloved hand, looking as though she would condescend to notice a mere fox-hunter. The gay old gentleman pressed it with becoming fervor, thinking he never saw her looking so well before. They then struck up a light, rapid conversation. Miss perhaps never did look brighter or more radiant, and as his lordship rode by her side, he really thought if he could make up his mind to surrender his freedom to any woman, it would be to her. There was something about her that he could not describe, but still a something that was essentially different to all his other flames. He never could bear a riding woman before, but now he felt quite proud to have such an elegant, piquant attendant on his pack, should like, at all events, to keep her in the country and enjoy her society, would like to add her to the collection of Feather Bedfordshire witches of which his friends joked him in town. Might have done worse than Mary Imperial John, thought his lordship. John mightn't be quite her match in point of manner, but she would soon have polished him up, and John must be doing uncommonly well as times go. Cattle and corn both selling prodigiously high, and John with his farm at a very low rent. And the thought of John and his beef brought our friend Billy to the Earl's mind, and after a sort of random compliment between Miss de Glancy and her horse, he exclaimed, By the way, I've got a young friend out I wish to introduce to you. So rising in his saddle and looking back into the crowd, he hallooed out, Pringle, a name that was instantly caught up by the quick-eared Dicky, a Mr. Tack to it and passed backward to Speed, who gave it to a groom, and Billy was presently seen boring his way through the opening crowd, just as a shepherd's dog bores its way through a flock of sheep. 
Pringle, said his lordship, as the approach of Billy's horse caused Valiant to lay back his ears. Pringle, I want to introduce you to Mr. Glancy. Mr. Glancy, give me leave to introduce my friend Mr. Pringle, continued he, adding sotto voce, as if for Mr. Glancy's ear alone. Young man of very good family and fortune. Richest commoner in England, they say. But before his lordship got to the richest commoner part of his speech, a dark frown of displeasure had overcast the sweet smile of those usually tranquil features, which luckily, however, was not seen by Billy, and before he got his cap restored to his head after a skyscraping salute, Miss de Glancy had resumed her wonted complacency, inwardly resolving to extinguish the richest commoner, just as she had done his lordship's other friend, Mr. Hybrid. Discarding the earl, therefore, she now opened a most voluble battering on our good-looking Billy, who, to do him justice, maintained his part so well that a lady with less ambitious views might have been very well satisfied to be Mrs. Pringle. Indeed, when his lordship looked at the two chattering and ogling and simpering together, and thought of that abominable old Binks and the drag, and a letter from the Boudlite, his heart rather smote him for what he had done. For young and fresh as he then felt himself, he knew that age would infallibly creep upon him at last, just as he saw it creeping upon each particular friend when he went to town, and he questioned that he should ever find any lady so eminently qualified to do the double duty of gracing his coronet and disappointing the general. Not but that the same thought had obtruded itself with regard to other ladies, but he now saw that he had been mistaken with respect to all of them, and that this was the real, genuine, no mistake, right one. Moreover, Mr. Glancy was the only lady who, according to his idea, had not made up to him, rather snubbed him, in fact. Mistaken nobleman, there are many ways of making up to a man, but as with many, so with his lordship, the last run was always the finest, and the last lady always the fairest, the most engaging. With distracting considerations such as these, and the advantage of seeing Miss de Glancy play the artillery of her arts upon our young friend, they reached a large old pasture on the high side of Quarrington Gorse, a cover of some four acres in extent, lying along a gently sloping bank, and cross rides cut down to the brook. Mr. Bogledyke pulled up near the rubbing post in the center of the field to give his hounds a roll, while the second horse gentlemen got their nags and the newcomers exchanged their hacks for their hunters. Judging by the shaking of hands, the exclamation of halloo, old boy, is at you. I say, where are you from? In similar inquiries, there were a good many of the latter, some who never went to the castle, some who thought it too far, some who thought it poor fun. Altogether, when the field got scattered over the pasture, as a shopkeeper scatters his change on the counter, or as an old stagecoachman used to scatter his passengers on the road with an upset, there might be fifty or sixty horsemen, assmen, and gigmen. Most conspicuous was his lordship old eyesore Hicks, the flying hatter of Hinton, Sir Moses Manchance's best man who seemed to think it incumbent upon him to kill his lordship a hound every year by his reckless riding, and who now came out in mufti, a hunting cap, a Napoleon gray tweed jacket, loose white cords with tight drab leggings, and spurs on his shoes as if his lordship's hounds were not worth their green cutaway and brown boots he sported with Sir Moses. He now gave his cap peak a sort of rude rap with his forefinger as his lordship came up, as much as to say, I don't know whether I'll speak to you or not, and then ran his great raking chestnut into the crowd to get at his old opponent, Game Boy Green, who generally rode for the credit of the Tantivy hunt. As these sort of cattle always hunt in couples, Hicks is followed by his shadow, Tom Snowden, the draper, or the damper as he is generally called, from his unhappy propensity of taking a gloomy view of everything. To the right are a knot of half-horse, half-pony, mounted squireen-looking gentlemen with clay pipes in their mouths, whose myrtle-green coats, baggy cords, and ill-cleaned tops denote as belonging to the major's harriers. And mark how the little, pompous man wheels before them in order that Pringle may see the reverence they pay to his red coat. 
He raises his punt hat with all the dignity of the immortal Simpson of Vauxhall memory and passes on in search of further compliments. His lordship has now settled himself into the Wilkinson and Kidd of Rob Roy, a bay horse of equal beauty with Valiant, but better adapted to the country into which they are now going. Imperial John has drawn his girths with his teeth. Dorsey Davis has let down his hat string. Mr. John Easylease has tightened his curb. Mr. Section drawn on his gloves. The damper finished his cigar, and all things are approximating a start. Elope, lads, elope, cries Dicky Bogledyke to the hounds, whistling and waving them together and in an instant the rollers and widespreaders are frolicking and chiding under his horse's nose. Gently, lads, gently, adds he, looking the more boisterous ones reprovingly in the face. Gently, lads, gently, repeats he, or you'll be rousing the gemlin in the goss. This movement of Dicky and the hounds has the effect of concentrating the field, all except our fair friend and Billy, who are still in the full cry of conversation. Miss putting forth her best allurements the sooner to bring Billy to book. At a chuck of his lordship's chin, Dicky turns his horse towards the gorse, just as Billy, in reply to Miss de Glancy's question, if he is fond of hunting, declares, as many a youth has done who hates it, that he dotes upon it. A whistle, a wave, and a cheer, and the hounds are away. They charge the hedge with a crash and drive into the gorse as if each hound had a bet that he would find the fox himself. Mr. Bogledyke, being now free of his pack, avails himself of this moment of ease to exhibit his neat, newly clad person of which he is not a little proud by riding along the pedestrian-lined hedge and requesting that you foot people, as he calls them, will have the goodness not to aloha but to hold up your ats if you view the fox, and having delivered his charge in three several places, he turns into the cover by the little white bridle gate in the middle, which Cupid without wings is now holding open, and who touches his hat as Dicky passes. The scene is most exciting, the natural inclination of the land affords everyone a full view of almost every part of the sloping, southerly lying gorse, while a bright sun with a clear, rarefied atmosphere lights up the landscape, making the distant fences look like nothing. Weak must be the nerves that would hesitate to ride over them as they now appear. Delusive view! Between the gorse and yonder fur-clad hills are two bottomless brooks, and ere the dashing rider reaches Fairbank Farm, whose tall chimney stands in bold relief against the clear blue sky, lies a tract of country whose flat surface requires gulf-like drains to carry off the surplus water that rushes down from the higher grounds. To the right, though the country looks rougher, it is really easier, but foxes seem to know it and seldom take that line, while to the left is a strongly fenced country, fairish for hounds but very difficult for horses, inasmuch as the vales are both narrow and deep. But let us find our fox and see what we can do among them. And as we are in for a burst, let us do the grand and have a fresh horse. End of chapter 12, read by Bryce Cries Youngstown, December 20, 2021. Chapter 13 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 13. Gone Away. See, a sudden thrill shoots through the field, though not a hound is spoken. No, not even a whimper been heard. It is Speed's new cap rising from the dip of the ground at the low end of the cover, and now, having seen the fox right well away, as he says, he gives such a ringing view halloa as startles friend Echo and brings the eager pack pouring and screeching to the cry. Tweet, 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 now goes cantering Dickie's superfluous horn, only he doesn't like to be done out of his blow and thinks the foot people may attribute the crash to his coming. All eyes are now eagerly strained to get a view of old Reynard, some for the pleasure of seeing him, others to speculate upon whether they will have to take the stiff stake and rise in rising front or the briar-tangled boundary fence below, in order to fulfill the honorable obligation of going into every field with the hounds. 
Others, again, who do not acknowledge the necessity and mean to take neither, hold their horses steadily in hand to be ready to slip down Cherry Tree Lane or through West Hill Foljard into the Billinghurst Turnpike, according as the line of chase seems to lie. Tally-ho, cries the flying hatter as he views the fox whisking his brush as he rises the stubble field over Folly May Farm, and in an instant he is soaring over the boundary fence to the clamorous pack just as his lordship takes it a little higher up and lands handsomely in the next field. Miss de Glancy then goes at it at a canter, and clears it neatly, while Billy Pringle's horse, unused to linger after waiting in vain for an intimation from his rider, just gathers himself together and takes it on his own account, shooting Billy onto his shoulder. He's off, now he's on, he hangs on by the mane, was the cry of the foot people as Billy scrambled back into his saddle, which he regained with anything but a conviction that he could sit at the jumps. Worst of all, he thought he saw Mr. Glancy's shoulders laughing at his failure. The privileged ones, having now taken their unenviable precedence, the scramble became general, some going one way, some another, and the recent frowning fences are soon laid level with the fields. A lucky lane running parallel with the line, along which the almost mute pack were now racing with a breast-high scent, relieved our friend Billy from any immediate repetition of his leaping inconvenience, though he could not hear the clattering of horses' hooves behind him without shuddering at the idea of falling and being ridden over. It seemed very different, he thought, to the first run or to Hyde Park. People were all so excited instead of riding quietly or for admiration as they do in the park. Just as Billy was flattering himself that the leaping danger was at an end, a sudden jerk of his horse nearly chucked him into Imperial John's pocket, who happened to be next in advance. The fox had been headed by the foot postman between Hinton and Sambrook, and Dickie Bogledyke, after objurgating the astonished man, demanding what the dial business he had there, had drawn his horse short across the lane, thus causing a sudden halt to those in the rear. The flying hatter and the damper pressing close upon the pack as usual, despite the remonstrance of Game Boy Green and others, made them shoot up to the far end of the enclosure, where they would most likely have topped the fence but for Swan and Speed getting round them, and adding to the persuasion of their whips to the entreaties of Dickie's horn. The hounds sweep round to the twang, lashing and bristling with excitement. You do it! cries Dickie as Sparkler and Pilgrim feather up the lane, trying first this side than that. Sparkler speaks. He's across the lane! Hoop, hoop, dallyo, dallyo, cries Dicky cheerily, taking off his cap and sweeping it in the direction the fox has gone, while his lordship, who has been bottling up the vial of his wrath, now uncorks it as he gets the delinquents within hearing. Thank you, Mr. Hicks, for pressing on my hounds. Much obliged to you, Mr. Hicks, for pressing on my hounds. Hang you, Mr. Hicks, for pressing on my hounds. So saying, his lordship gathered Rob Roy together and followed Mr. Bogledyke through a very stiff bullfinch that Dicky would rather have shirked, had not the eyes of England been upon him. Swish! Dicky goes through, and the vigorous thorns close again like a rat trap. Allow me, my lord! exclaims Imperial John from behind, anxious to be conspicuous. Thank you now, replies his lordship, carelessly thinking it would not do to let Mr. Glancy too much into the secrets of the hunting field. Thank you now, repeated he, and ramming his horse well at it, he gets through with little more disturbance of the thorns than Dicky had made. Mr. Glancy comes next, and riding quietly up the bank, she gives her horse a chuck with the curve and a touch with the whip that causes him to rise well in his haunches and buck over without injury to herself, her hat, or her habit. Imperial John was nearly offering his services to break the fence for her, but the, Sir, do you mean to insult me, still tingling in his ears, caused him to desist. However, he gives Billy a lick by squashing through before him, whose horse then just rushed through it as before, leaving Billy to take care of himself. A switched face was the result, the pain, however, being far greater than the disfigurement. While this was going on above, Dorsey Davis, who can ride a spurt, has led a charge through a weaker place lower down, and when our friend had ascertained that his eyes were still in his head, he found two distinct lines of sportsmen sprinting away in the distance as if they were riding a race. Adding to this, the pent-up party behind him, having got bent, made a great show of horsemanship as they passed. Come along, screamed one. Look alive, shouted another. Never say die, cried a third, though they were all as ready to shut up as our friend. Billy's horse, however, not being used to stopping, gets the bit between his teeth and scuttles away at a very overtaking pace, bringing him sufficiently near to let him see Game Boy Green and the Flying Hatter leading the honorable obligation van out of whose extending line now a red coat, now a green coat, now a dark coat drops in the usual had enough style. In the ride cunning or know the country detachment, Mr. Glancy's flaunting habit giving dignity to the figure and flowing elegance to the scene might be seen going at perfect ease beside the noble earl, who from the higher ground surveys Game Boy Green and the Hatter racing to get first at each fence, while the close-packing hounds are sufficiently far in advance to be well out of harm's way. Catch em if you can, shrieks his lordship, eyeing their zealous endeavors. Catch em if you can, repeats he, laughing as the pace gets better and better, scarce a hound having time to give tongue. 
Joy over he goes, now cries his lordship as a spasmodic jerk of the leading hounds on all psych water meadow turns trumpeters and wranglers' heads toward the newly widened and deepened drain cut, and the whole pack wheel to the left. What a scramble there is to get over. Some clear it, some fall back, while some so sin and out. Now Game Boy, seeing by the newly thrown out gravel the magnitude of the venture, thrusts down his hat firmly on his brow, while Hicks gets his chestnut well by the head, and hardening their hearts they clear it in stride, and the damper takes soundings for the benefit of those who come after. What a splash he makes! And now, the five and thirty years master of harriers, without a subscription coming up, seeks to save the credit of his quivering-tailed gray by stopping to help the discontented damper out of his difficulty, whose horse coming out on the wrong side affords them both a very fair excuse for shutting up shop. The rest of the detachment, unwilling to bathe, after craning at the cut, scuttle away by its side down to the wooden cattle bridge below, which being crossed, the honorable obligationers and the take care of their neckers are again joined in common union. It is, however, no time to boast of individual feats or to inquire for absent friends, for the hounds still press on, though the pace is not quite so severe as it was. They are on worse soil, and the scent does not serve them so well. It soon begins to fail, and at length is carried on upon the silent system and looks very like failing altogether. Mr. Bogledyke, who has been riding as cunning as anyone, now shows to the front, watching the stooping pack with anxious eye, lest he should have to make a cast over fences that do not quite suit his convenience. Gently, are and gently, cries he, seeing that a little precipitancy may carry them off the line. Yon car dog has chased the fox, and the hounds are puzzled at the point where he has left them. Ah, oh, saw what the dial business have you out with a dog on such an occasion as this, demands Dicky of an astonished drover who thought the road was as open to him as to Dicky. Oh, saw, saw, you deserve to be put in a lock-up, continues Dicky, as the pack now divide on the scent. Oh, saw, saw, you shall be chastised, added he, shaking his whip at the drover as he trotted on to the assistance of the pack. The melody of the majority, however, recalls the curites and saves Dicky from the meditated assault. While the brief check was going on, his lordship was eyeing Mr. Glancy, thinking of all the quiet, captivating women he had ever seen, she was the most so. Her riding was perfection, and he couldn't conceive how it was that he had ever entertained any objection to sportswomen. It must have been from seeing some clumsy ones rolling about who couldn't ride, and old Bink's chance at that moment was not worth one farthing. "'Where's Pringle?' now asked his lordship, as the thought of Binks brought our hero to his recollection. Down, replied Mr. Glancy carelessly, pointing to the ground with her pretty amethyst-topped whip. Down, is he? smiled the earl, adding half to himself and half to her. Thought he was a mull. Our friend, indeed, has come to grief. After pulling and hauling at his horse until he got him quite savage, the irritated animal, shaking his head as a terrier shakes a rat, ran blindfold into a bullfinch, shooting Billy into a newly made manure heap beyond. The last of the harrier men caught his horse, and not knowing who he belonged to, just threw the bridle rein over the next gatepost, while Dorsey Davis, who had had enough and was glad of an excuse for stopping, pulls up to assist Billy out of his dirty dilemma. Whew, what a figure he was. But see, Mr. Bogledyke is hitting off the scent, and the astonished drover is spurring on his pony to escape the chastisement Dicky has promised him. At this critical moment, Mr. Glancy's better genius whispered her to go home. She had availed herself of the short respite to take a sly peep at herself in a little pocket mirror she carried in her saddle, and found she was quite as much heated as was becoming or as could be ventured upon without detriment to her dress. Moreover, she was not quite sure but that one of her frisettes was coming out. So now, when the hounds break out in fresh melody and the flying hatter and Game Boy Green are again elbowing to the front, she sits reining in her steed, evidently showing she is done. Oh, come along, exclaimed the earl, looking back for her. Oh, come along, repeated he, waving her onward as he held in his horse. There was no resisting the appeal, for it was clear he would come back for her if she did, so touching her horse with the whip, she is again cantering by his side. I'd give the world to see you beat that impudent ugly adder, said he, now pointing Hicks out in the act of riding at a stiff, newly pleshed fence before his hounds were half over. And his lordship spurred his horse as he spoke with a vigor that spoke the intensity of his feelings. The line of chase then lay along the swiftly flowing arrow banks and across Oxley large pastures, parallel with the Downton Bridle Road along which Dickie and his followers now pounded, Dickie hugging himself with the idea that the fox was making for the main earth on Bringwood Moor, to which he knew every yard of the country. And so the fox was going as straight and as hard as ever he could, but as ill luck would have it, young Mr. Naylor, the son of the owner of Oxley Pastures, shot at a snipe at the west corner of the large pasture just as Pug entered at the east, causing him to shift his line and thread Larchfield plantations instead of crossing the pasture, and popping down Tillington Dean as he intended. 
Dicky had heard the gun, and the short turn of the hounds now showing him what had happened, he availed himself of the superiority of a well-mounted nobleman's huntsman in scarlet over a tweed-clad, muffin-capped shooter, for exclaiming at the top of his voice as he cantered past, horn in hand, "'Oh, ya poaching devil, what business are you there? Oh, ya nasty, sneakin', snoutin' trick, and I'll even go back to the place from whence ya came,' leaving the poor shooter staring with astonishment." A twang of the horn now brings the hounds, who have been running with a flinging, catching sidewind scent onto the line, and a full burst of melody greets the diminished field as they strike it on the bright grass of the plantation. Forward, forward, is the cry, though there isn't a hound but what is getting on as best he can. The merry music reanimates the party and causes them to press on their horses with rather more freedom than past exertions warrant. Imperial Johns is the first to begin wheezing, but His Highness, feeling him going, covers a retreat of his hundred and fifty guineas worth, as he hopes he will be, under shelter of the plantation. "'I think the ladder's horse has about had enough,' now observes Dickie to his lordship as he holds open the bridle gate at the end of the plantation into the Bennington Lane for his lordship and Mr. Glancy to pass. "'Glad of it,' replied the Earl, thinking the Hatter would not be able to go home and boast how he had cut down the Tantivy men and hung them up to dry." Oh, Lord, one moment, now cries Dicky, raising his right hand as the hatter comes blundering through the quick-set fence into the hard lane, his horse nearly alighting on his nose. Oh, Lord, please, adds he as the hatter spurs among the road-stoping pack. Hog to challenger, hog to challenger, now hollas Dicky as challenger, after sniffing off the grassy mound on the opposite hedge, proclaims that the fox is over, and Dicky, getting his horse short by the head, slips behind the hatter's horse's tail for his old familiar friend the gap in the corner while the hatter gathers his horse together to fulfill the honorable obligation of going with the hounds. Crump up, cries he, with an obligato accompaniment of the spur rowels, which the honest beast acknowledges by a clambering flounder of the bank, making the descent on his head on the field side that he nearly executed before. The hatter's legs perform a sort of wands of a mill evolution. Not hurt, I hope, holds the earl, who with Mr. Glancy now lands a little above, and seeing the hatter rise and shake himself, he canters on, giving Mr. Glancy a touch of the elbow, and saying with a knowing look, That's capital, get rid of him, leggings and all. His lordship, having now seen the last of his tormentors, has time to look about him a little. Been a monstrous fine run, observes he to the lady as they canter together behind the pace-slackening pack. Monstrous, replies the lady, who sees no fun in it at all. How long has it been? asks his lordship of Swan, who now shows to the front as a whip aspiring huntsman is wont to do. An hour over five minutes, my lord, replies the magnifier, looking at his watch. No, no, now exactly, my lord, adds he, trotting on, restoring his watch to his fob as he goes. An hour best pace, but with one slight check, can't have come less than twelve miles, observes his lordship, thinking it over. Indeed, replied Mr. Glancy, wishing it was done. Grand sport, fox hunting, isn't it? asked his lordship, edging close up to her. Charming, replied Mr. Glancy, feeling her failing frisette. The effervescence of the thing is now about over, and the hounds are reduced to a very plodding, painstaking pace. The day is changed for the worse, and heavy clouds are gathering overhead. Still, there is a good holding scent, and as the old saying is, a fox so pressed must stop at last. The few remaining sportsmen begin speculating on his probable destination, one backing him for Caldwell Rocks, another for Fulford Woods, a third for the Hawkehurst Hills. Olcar steals for a sovereign, now cries Dicky, hustling his horse, as, having steered the nearly mute pack along Sandy Well Banks, Challenger and Sparkler strike a scent on the track leading up to Sorryford Moor, and go away at an improving pace. Olcar steals for a foibin note, adds he, as the rest of the pack score to cry. Going to have Rhine, now observes he, as a heavy drop beats upon his upturned nose. At the same instant, a duplicate drop falls upon Mr. Glancy's fair cheek, causing her to wish herself anywhere but where she was. Another, and another, and another follow in quick succession, while the dark, dreary moor offers nothing but the inhospitable freedom of space. The cold wind cuts through her, making her shudder for the result. He's for the hills, exclaims Game Boy Green, still struggling on with a somewhat worse-for-wear-looking steed. He's for the hills, repeats he, pointing to a frowning line in the misty distance. At the same instant, his horse puts his foot in a stone hole, and Game Boy and he measure their lengths on the moor. That comes a stargazing, observes his lordship, turning his coat collar up about his ears. That comes a stargazing, repeated he, eyeing the loose horse scampering the wrong way. We'll see no more of him, observed Mr. Glancy, wishing she was as well out of it as green. Not likely, I think, replied his lordship, seeing the evasive rush the horse gave as Speed, who was coming up with some tailhounds, tried to catch him. The heath-brushing fox leaves a scent that fills the painfully still atmosphere with the melody of the hounds, mingled with the Quebec, Quebec, Quebec of the startled grouse. 
there is a solemn calm that portends a coming storm. To Mr. Glancy, for whom the music of the hounds has no charms, and the fast-gathering clouds have great danger, the situation is peculiarly distressing. She would stop if she durst, but on the middle of a dreary moor, how dare she? An ominous, gusty wind, followed by a vivid flash of lightning and a piercing scream for Mr. Glancy, now startled the Earl's meditations. Lightning! exclaimed his lordship, turning short round to her assistance. Lightning in the month of November! Never heard of such a thing! But ere his lordship gets to Mr. Glancy's horse, a most terrific clap of thunder burst right overhead, shaking the earth to the very center, silencing the startled hounds, and satisfying his lordship that it was lightning. Another flash, more vivid if possible than the first, followed by another pealing crash of thunder more terrific than before, calls all hands to a hurried council of war on the subject of shelter. "'We must make for the punch bowl at Rockbeer!' exclaims General Bogledyke, flourishing his horn in an ambiguous sort of way, for he wasn't quite sure he could find it. "'You know the punch bowl at Rockbeer!' shouts he to Harry Swan, anxious to have someone on whom to lay the blame if he went wrong. "'I know it when I'm there,' replied Swan, who didn't consider it a part of his duty to make imaginary runs to ground for his lordship. "'Know it when you're there, man,' retorted Dicky in disgust, "'why any—' the remainder of his sentence being lost in a tremendously illuminating flash of lightning, followed by a long cannonading, reverberating roll of thunder. Poor Mr. Glancy was ready to sink into the earth. "'Alope, hounds, alope!' cried Dicky, getting his horse short by the head and spurring him into a brisk trot. "'Alope, hounds, alope!' repeated he, setting off on a speculative cast, for he saw it was no time for dallying. "'And now—' From cloud to cloud the rending lightnings rage, till in the furious element a war dissolve, the whole precipitated mass unbroken floods and solid torrents pour. Luckily for Dicky, an unusually vivid flash of lightning so lit up the landscape as to show the clump of large elms at the entrance to Rockbeer, and taking his bearings, he went swish-swash, or spurt, swish-swash, or spurt, through the spongy half-land, half-water moor at as good a trot as he could raise. The lately ardent pressing hounds follow on in long-drawn file, looking anything but large or formidable. The frightened horses tucked in their tails and look fifty percent worse for the suppression. The hard-driving rain beats downways and sideways and frontways and backways, always at once. The horses know not which way to duck to evade the storm. In less than a minute, Mr. Glancy is as drenched as if she'd taken a shower bath. The smart hat and feathers are annihilated. The dubious frisette falls out. Down comes the hair. The belladonna-inspired radiance of her eyes is quenched. The crinoline and wadding dissolve like ice before the fire. And ere the love-cured earl lifts her off the horse of the punch bowl at Rockbeer, she has no more shape or figure than an icicle. Indeed, she very much resembles one, for the cold sleet, freezing as it fell, has encrusted her in a rich coat of ice lace, causing her saturated garments to cling to her with the utmost pernacity. A more complete wreck of a bell was perhaps never seen. What an object, inwardly ejaculated she as Mrs. Hetherington, the landlady, brought a sniveling mold candle into the cheerless, fireless little inn parlor, and she caught a glimpse of herself in the, at best, most unbecoming mirror. What would she have given to have turned back? And as his lordship hurried upstairs in his waterlogged boots, he said to himself with a nervous swing of his arm, I was right, women have no business out hunting and the bank's chance improved amazingly. The further denouement of this perishing day will be gleaned from the following letters. End of chapter 13, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 14 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 14. The Pringle Correspondence. Mr. William to his Mama. Tantiva Castle, November. My dearest Mama, though I wrote to you only the other day, I take up my pen stiff and sore as I am and scarcely able to sit to tell you of my first day's hunt, which I assure you was anything but enjoyable. In fact, at this moment I feel just as if I had been thumped by half the pugilist in London and severely kicked at the end. To my fancy, hunting is about the most curious, unreasonable amusement that ever was invented. The first fox was well enough, running backwards and forwards in an agreeable manner, though they all abused him and called him a cowardly beggar, though to my mind it was far pluckier to do what he did with fifty great dogs after him than to fly like a thief as the next one did. Indeed, I saw all the first run without the slightest inconvenience or exertion, for a very agreeable gentleman called Major Hamilton, himself an old keeper of hounds, led me about and showed me the country. 
I don't mean to say that he led my horse, but he showed me the way to go so as to avoid the jumps, and pointed out the places where I could get a peep of the fox. I saw him frequently. The Major, who was extremely polite, asked me to go and stay with him after I leave here, and I wouldn't mind going if it wasn't for the hounds, which, however, he says are quite as fine as his lordship's without being so furiously and inconveniently fast. For my part, however, I don't see the use of hunting an animal that you can shoot as they do in France. It seems a monstrous waste of exertion. If they were all as sore as I am this morning, I'm sure they wouldn't try it again in a hurry. I really think racing where you pay people for doing the dangerous for you is much better fun, and prettier too, for you can choose any lively colour you like for your jacket instead of having to stick to scarlet or dark clothes. But I will tell you about fox number two. I was riding with a very pretty young lady, Mr. Glancy, whom the Earl had just introduced me to, when all of a sudden everybody seemed to be seized with an uncontrollable galloping mania, and set off as hard as ever their horses could lay legs to the ground. My horse, who they said was a perfect hunter, but who I should say was a perfect brute, partook of the prevailing epidemic, and though he had gone quite quietly enough before, now seized the bit between his teeth and plunged and reared as though he would either knock my teeth down my throat or come back over upon me. Drop your hand, cried one, ease his head, cried another, and what was the consequence? He ran away with me and, dashing through a flock of turkeys, nearly capsized an old sow. Then the people, who had been so civil before, all seemed to be seized with the roots. It was nothing but, go along, sir, go along, hang it, don't you see, the hounds are running, just as if I had made them run, or as if I could stop them. My good friend the Major seemed to be as excited as anybody. Indeed, the only cool person was Mr. Glancy, who cantered away in a most unconcerned manner. I am sorry to say she came in for a desperate docking. It seems that after I had had as much as I wanted and pulled up to come home, they encountered a most terrific thunderstorm in crossing some outlandish moor, and as his lordship, who didn't get home till long after dark, said she all at once became a dissolving view and went away to nothing, Mrs. Moffat, who is stout and would not easily dissolve, seemed amazingly tickled with the joke, and said she supposed she would look like a mermaid, which his lordship said was exactly the case. When the first roll of thunder was heard here, the Earl's carriage and four was ordered out with dry things to go in quest of him, but they tried two of his houses of call before they fell in with him. It then had to return to take the mermaid to her home who had to borrow the publican's wife's Sunday clothes to travel in. After dinner, the stud groom came in to announce the horses for today, and hearing one name for me, I begged to decline the honour on the plea of having a great many letters to write, so Mrs. Moffat accompanied his lordship to the meet some ten miles north of this, in his carriage in four, from whence she has just returned, and says they went away with a brilliant scent from Foxadelli Gorse, meaning, I presume, with another such clatter as we had yesterday. I am glad I didn't go, for I don't think I could have got onto a horse, let alone sit one, especially at the jumps, which all the clods in the country seem to have clubbed their ideas to concoct. Rougeye says people are always stiff after the first day's hunting, but if I had thought I should be as sore and stiff as I am, I don't think I would ever have taken a day, because Major Hamilton says it's not necessary to go out hunting in the morning to entitle one to wear the dress uniform in the evening, which is really all I care for. The servants here seem to live like fighting corks from Roger's account. Breakfast, luncheons, dinners, teas, and suppers. They sit down ten or a dozen at the second table and about thirty or so in the hall, besides which there are no end of people out of doors. Roger says they have wine at the second table and eau de vie punch at night in discretion, of which I think he takes more than is discreet, for he came swaggering into my room at daybreak this morning in his evening dress with his hat on and a great pewter inkstand in his hand, which he set down on the dressing table and said, Dear sir, there's your shaven water. Strange to say, the fellow speaks better English when he's drunk than he does when he's sober. However, I suppose I must have a valet, otherwise I should think it would be a real kindness to give the great lazy fellows here something to do, other than hanging about the passages while laying the girls. I'll write you again when I know what I'm going to do, but I don't think I shall stay here much longer if I'm obliged to risk my neck after these ridiculous dogs. Ever, my dearest mamma, your most affectionate but excruciatingly sore son, William Pringle. The following is Mrs. Pringle's answer, who, it will be seen, received Billy's last letter while she was answering his first one. 25 Curtain Crescent, Belgrave Square, London. My own dearest William, I was overjoyed, my own darling, to receive your kind letter and hear that you had arrived safe and found his lordship so kind and agreeable. I thought you had known him by sight or I would have prevented your making the mistake by describing him to you. However, there is no harm done. In a general way, the great man of the place is oftentimes the least, the most accessible, that is to say. The Earl is an excellent, kind-hearted man, and it will do you great good among your companions to be known to be intimate with him, for I can assure you it is not everyone he takes up with. Of course, there are people who abuse him and say he is this and that and so on, but you must take people, especially great ones, as you find them in this world, and he is quite as good as the whites of their eyes turning up neighbors. 
Don't, however, presume on his kindness by attempting to stay beyond what he presses you to do, for two short visits tell better than one long one, looking as though you had been approved of. You can easily find out from the butler or the groom of the chambers or some of the upper servants how long you are expected to stay, or perhaps some of the guests can tell you how long they are invited for. I had written thus far when your second welcome letter arrived, and I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear you are safe and well, though I am sorry to hear you don't like hunting, for I assure you it is the best of all possible sports, and there is none that admits of such elegant variety of costume. Look at a shooter, what a ragamuffin dress his is, hardly distinguishable from a keeper, and yachters and cricketers might be taken for a ticket of leave men. I should be very sorry indeed if you were not to persevere in your hunting, for a red coat and leather are quite your become, and there is none in my opinion in which a gentleman looks so well or a snob so ill. Learning to hunt can't be more disagreeable than learning to sail or to smoke, and see how many hundreds, thousands I may say, overcome the difficulty every year and blow their clouds, as they call them, on the quarter-deck, as though they had been born sailors with pipes in their mouths. Remember, if you can't manage to sit your horse, you'll be fit for nothing but a seat in Parliament, along with Captain Catlap and the other incurables. I can't think there can be much difficulty in the matter, judging from the lumpy, wash bolly sort of men one hears talking about it. I should think if you had a horse of your own, you would be able to make better out. Whatever you do, however, have nothing to do with racing. It's only for rogues and people who have more money than they know what to do with and to whom it doesn't matter whether they win or they lose. We mustn't have you setting up a confidential crossing sweeper with a gold eyeglass. No gentleman need expect to make money on the turf, for if you were to win, they wouldn't pay you, whereas if you lose, it's quite a different thing. One of the beauties of hunting is that people have no inducement to poison each other, whereas in racing from poisoning horses, they have got to poisoning men. Besides which, one party must lose if the other is to win. Mutual advantage is impossible. Another thing, if you were to win ever so, the trainer would always keep his little bill in advance of your gains, or he would be a very bad trainer. I hope Major Hamerton is a gentleman of station whose acquaintance will do you good, though the name is not very aristocratic. Hamilton would have been better. Are there any Mrs. H's? Remember, there are always forward people in the world who think to advance themselves by taking strangers by the hand, and that a bad introduction is far worse than none. Above all, never ask to be introduced to a great man. Great people have their eyes and ears about them just as well as little ones, and if they choose to know you, they will make the advance. Asking to be introduced only prejudices them against you and generally ensures a cut at the first opportunity. Beware of Miss de Glancy. She is a most determined coquette, and if she had fifty suitors, wouldn't be happy if she saw another woman with one without trying to get him from her. She hasn't a half penny. If you see her again, ask her if she knows Mr. Hotspur Smith or Mr. Enoch Benson or Mr. Woodhorn and tell me how she looks. What is she doing down there? Surely she hasn't the vanity to think she can captivate the Earl. You needn't mention me to Mrs. Moffat, but I should like to know what she has on, and also if there are any new dishes for dinner. Indeed, the less you talk about your belongings, the better, for the world has but two ways, that of running people down much below their real level, or of extolling them much beyond their deserts. Remember, well-bred people always take breeding for granted, one of us, as they say, and others when they find them at good houses. And as you have a good name, you have nothing to do but hold your tongue, and the chances are they will estimate you at far more than your real worth. A ballot is absolutely indispensable for a young gentleman. Bless you, you would be thought nothing of among the servants if you hadn't one. They are their master's trumpeters. A valet, especially a French one, putting on two clean shirts a day and calling for burgundy after your cheese are about the most imposing things in the lower regions. In smaller places, giving as much trouble as possible and asking for things you think they haven't got is very well, but this will not do where you are now. In a general way, it is a bad plan taking servants to great houses, for as they all measure their own places by the best they have ever seen, and never think how many much worse ones there are, they come back discontented and are seldom good for much until they have undergone a quarter starving or so out of place. It is a good thing when the great man of a country sets an example of prudence and economy, for then all others can quote him instead of having the bad practices of other places raked up as authority for introducing them into theirs. The Earl, however, would never be able to get through half his income if he was not to wink at a little prodigality, and the consumption of wine in great houses would be a mere nothing if it were not for the assistance of the servants. Indeed, the higher you get into society, the less wine you get, until you might expect to see it run out to nothing at a duke's. I dare say Roger will be fond of drink, and the English servants will perhaps be fond of plying him with it, but so long as he does not get incompetent, a little jollity on his part will make them more communicative before him, and it is wonderful what servants can tell. They know everything in the kitchen, nothing in the parlor. His lordship, I believe, doesn't allow strange servants to wait except upon very full occasions, otherwise it might be well to put Roger under the surveillance of Beveridge the butler, lest he should come into the room drunk and incompetent, which would be very disagreeable. I enclose you a gold foxhead pin to give Mr. Bogledyke, who doesn't take money, at least nothing under five pounds, and his only costs eighteens. 
He is a favorite with his lordship, and it will be well to be in with him. You had better give the men who whip the hounds a trifle, say, tens, or half a sovereign each. Gold looks better than silver. If you go to Major Hammerton's, you must let me know, but perhaps you will inquire further before you fix. And now, hoping that you will stick to your hunting and be more successful on another horse after a quieter fox, believe me ever, my own dearest William, your most truly and sincerely affectionate mother, Emma Pringle. P.S. Don't forget the two clean shirts. P.S. When you give Dickie Boggledyke the pin, you can compliment him on his talents as a huntsman, as Mr. Redpath did the actor, and as they say he is a very bad one, he will be all the more grateful for it. P.S. I have just had another most pressing letter from your Uncle Jerry, urging me to go and look through all the accounts and papers as he says it is not fair throwing such a heavy responsibility upon him. Poor man, he need not be so pressing. He little knows how anxious I am to do it. I hope now we shall get something satisfactory, for as yet I know no more than I did before your poor father died. P.S. Don't forget to tell me if there are any Miss H's, and whatever you do, take care of Dow, that is, yourself. But somehow Billy forgot to tell his mama whether there were any Miss H's or not, though he might have said no, seeing as they were Miss Wise. And now, while our hero is recovering from his bruises, let us introduce the reader further to his next host, Major Y. End of chapter 14. Read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 15 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 15. Major Yammerton's Coach Stops the Way. Major Yammerton was rather a peculiar man inasmuch as he was an ass without being a fool. He was an ass for always puffing and inflating himself, while as regarded worldly knowledge, particularly that comprised in the magic letters pound SD, few, if any, were his equals. In the former department, he was always either on the strut or the fret, always either proclaiming the marked attention he had met with or worrying himself with the idea that he had not had enough. At home, instead of offering people freely and hospitably what he had, he was continually boring them with apologies for what he had not. Just as if all men were expected to have things alike, or as if the Major was an injured innocent who had been defrauded of his rights. If he was not boring and apologizing, then he was puffing or praising everything indiscriminately, depending, of course, upon who he had there, a great gun or a little one. He returned from his Tantivy Castle hunt very much pleased with our Billy, who seemed to be just the man for his money, and by the aid of his baronage he made him out to be very highly connected. Mrs. Yammerton and the young ladies were equally delighted with him, and it was unanimously resolved that he should be invited to the Grange, for which purpose the standing order of the house, never to invite anyone direct from a great house to theirs, was suspended. A very salutary rule it is for all who study appearances, seeing that what looks very well one way may look very shady the other, but this being perhaps a case of now or never, the exception would seem to have been judiciously made. The heads of the house had different objects in view, Mama's, of course, being matrimonial, the Major's the laudable desire to sell Mr. Pringle a horse, and the mention of Mama's object leads us to the young ladies. These, Clara, Flora, and Harriet, were very pretty and very highly educated. That is to say, they could do everything that is useless. Play, draw, sing, dance, make wax flowers, bead stands, do decorative gilding and crochet work. But as to knowing how many ounces there are in a pound of tea, or how many pounds of meat a person should eat in a day, they were utterly, entirely, and most elegantly ignorant. Towards the close of the last century, and at the beginning of the present one, ladies ran entirely to domesticity, pickling, preserving, and pressing people to eat. Corded petticoats and patent mangles long formed the staple of a midlife woman's conversation. Presently, a new era sprang up which banished everything in the shape of utilitarianism, and taught the then rising generation that the less they knew of domestic matters, the finer ladies they would be, until we really believe the daughters of the nobility are better calculated for wives simply because they are generally economically brought up and are not afraid of losing caste by knowing what every woman ought to do. No man thinks the worse of a woman for being able to manage her house, while few men can afford to marry mere music stools and embroidery frames. Mrs. Yammerton, however, took a different view of the matter. She had been brought up in the patent mangle and corded petticoat school, and inwardly resolved that her daughter should know nothing of the sort, should be real ladies in the true kitchen acceptation of the term. Hence, they were mistresses of all the little accomplishments before enumerated, which, with making calls and drinking tea, formed the principal occupation of their lives. Not one of them could write a letter without a copy, and were all very uncertain in their spelling, though they knew to a day when every king and queen began to reign, and could spout all the chief towns in the kingdom. 
Now this might have all been very well, at least bearable, if the cocky major had had plenty of money to give them, but at the time they were acquiring them, the contrary was the case, as the lawyers say. The major's grandfather, his father died when he was young, had gone upon the old annexation principle of buying land and buying land simply because it joined, and not always having the cash to pay for it with, our major came into an estate, large or small, according as the reader has more or less of his own, saddled with a good, stout, firmly setting mortgage. Land, however, being the only beast of burden that does not show what it carries, our orphan, orphan in top boots to be sure, passed for his best, and was speedily snapped up by the then beautiful Italian like Miss Winnington who consoled herself for the collapse of his fortune by the reflection that she had nothing of her own. Perhaps, too, she had made allowance for the exaggeration of estimates, which generally rate a man at three or four times his worth. The Winningtons, however, having made a great crow at the catch, the newly married couple started at score as if the estate had nothing to carry but themselves. In due time, the three graces appeared, Clara very fair with large languishing blue eyes and light hair, Flora with auburn hair and hazel eyes, and Harriet tall, clear, and dark like Mama. As they grew up and had had their heads made into almanacs at home, they were sent to the celebrated Miss Featherys finishing and polishing seminary at Westbourne Grove, who for two hundred pounds a year, or as near two hundred pounds as she could get, taught them all the airs and graces, particularly how to get in and out of a carriage properly, how to speak to a doctor, how to a counterskipper, how to a servant, and so on. The major, we may state, had his three daughters taken as two. Well, just as Miss Harriet was supplying the place of Miss Clara, polished, that great agricultural revolution, the repeal of the Corn Laws, took place. And our major, who had regarded his estate more with an eye to its hunting and shooting capabilities than to high farming, very soon found it slipping away from him, just as Miss Glancy slipped away from her dress in the thunderstorm. Up to that time, his easy-minded agent, Mr. Bullrush, a twenty-stone man of sixty years of age, had thought the perfection of management was not to let an estate go back but now the major seemed likely to slip through its girths altogether. To be sure, it had not had any great assistance in the advancing line, and was just the same sour, rush-grown, poachy, snipe-shooting-looking place that it was when the major got it. But this was not his grandfather's fault, who had buried as many stones in great gulf-like drains as would have carried off a river and walled the estate all round into the bargain. But there was no making head against wet land with stone drains, the bit you cured only showing the wetness of the rest. The blotchy March fallows looked as if they had got the smallpox, the pastures were hardly green before midsummer, and the greyhound-like cattle that wandered over them were evidently of Pharaoh's lean sort, and looked as if they would never be ready for the butcher. Foreign cattle, too, were coming in free, and the old cry of down corn, down horn frightened the fabulously famed stout British farmer out of his wits. Then those valuable documents called leases, so binding on the landlord, were found to be wholly inoperative on the tenants, who threw up their farms as if there were no such things in existence. If the major wouldn't take their givings up, why, then he might just do his warst. Meanwhile, of course, they would do their warst by the land. With those who had nothing, farming and beer shop keeping being about the only trades a man can start with upon nothing, of course it was of no use persisting. But the awkward part of the thing was that this probing of pocket showed that in too many cases the reputed honesty of the British farmer was also mere fiction. For some who were thought to be well off now declare that their capital was their aunt's or their uncle's or their grandmother's or someone else's. So that the two classes, the have-somethings and the have-nothings, were reduced to a level. This sort of thing went on throughout the country, and landlords who could not face the difficulty by taking their estates in hand had to submit to very serious reductions of rent, and rent once got down is very difficult to get up again, especially in countries where they value by the rate book or where a traditionary legend attaches to land of the lowest rent it has ever been let for. Our major was sorely dispirited, and each market day as he returned from Mr. Bullrush's with worse and worse news than before, he pondered o'er his misfortunes, fearing that he would have to give up his house and his horses, withdraw his daughters from his featheries, and go to Boulogne. And as he contemplated the airy outline of their newly erected rural palace of a workhouse, he said it was lucky they had built it, for he thought they would all very soon be in it. Certainly things got to their worst in the farming way, before they began to mend, and such land as the Major's, good but salivated with wet as the cabman said of his coat, were scarcely to be let at any price. In these go-ahead days of farming, when the enterprising sons of trade are fast obliterating the traces of the heavy-heeled order of easy-minded Hodges, who held their farms and lived content while one year paid another's rent, without ever making any attempt at improvement, it may be amusing to record the business-like offer of some of those indolent worthies who would bid for a pig and a poke. Thus it runs, it should have been dated April 1st instead of 21st. 
to Major Yammerton, honored Sir Hobnail Hill, April 21st. Way as we have considered, we shall give you for Bonnie Riggs Farm the sum of one hundred pounds twenty five puns upon conditions per year. If you should think it too little, we may perhaps advance a little, as we have not looked her carefully over. Her and for character, Mr. Sowerby will give you every information, as we are the third generation that's been under these Sowerbys. Yours sincerely, Henry Brown, Humphrey Brown Co. If you want any oats, I could sell you fifteen bowels of very fine ones. Now the sum one hundred pounds twenty-five puns being less than half what the major's grandfather used to get for the farm, these two hundred pounds sixty-three puns, our major was considerably perplexed, and as Henry and Humphrey's offer was but a sample of the whole, it became a question between Boulogne and Bastille, as those once unpopular edifices the workhouses were then called. And here we may observe that there is nothing, perhaps, either so manageable or so unmanageable as land. Nothing easier to keep right than land in good order, and nothing more difficult to get by the head and stop than land that is run wild. And it may be laid down as an infallible rule that the man who has no taste for land or horses should have nothing to do with either. He should put his money in the funds and rail or steam when he has occasion to travel. He will be far richer, far fatter, and fill the bay window of his club far better than by undergoing the grinding of farmers and the tyranny of grooms. Land, like horses, when once in condition is easily kept so, but once let either go down and the owner becomes a prey to the scratchers and the copers. If, however, a man likes a little occupation better than the eternal gossip and who's that of the clubs, and prefers a smiling, improving landscape to a barren, retrograding scene, he will find no pleasanter, healthier, or more interesting occupation than improving his property. And a happy thing it was for this kingdom that Prince Albert, who has done so much to refine and elevate mankind, should have included farming in the list of his amusements, bringing the before despised pursuit into favor and fashion, so that now, instead of land remaining a prey to the Henry Browns and co. of life, we find gentlemen advertising for farms in all directions, generally stipulating that they are to be on the line of one or other of the once derided railways. But we are getting in advance of the times with our major whom we left in the slow of despond, consequent on the coming down of his rents. Just when things were at their worst, the first sensible sunbeam of simplicity that ever shone upon land appeared in the shape of the practical, easy-working drainage act, an act that has advanced agriculture more than all previous inventions and legislation put together. But our gallant friend had his difficulties to contend with even here. Mr. Bullrush was opposed to it. He was fat and didn't like trouble, so he doubted the capacity of such a pocket companion as a pipe to carry off the superfluous water, then he doubted the ability of the water to get into the pipe at such a depth. Above all, he doubted the ability of the tenants to pay drainage interests. How could they if they couldn't pay their rents? Of course, the tenants adopted this view of the matter and were all opposed to making what they called experiences at their own expense. So, upon the whole, Mr. Bullrush advised the Major to have nothing to do with it. It being, however, a case of necessity with the Major, he disregarded Mr. Bullrush's advice, which led to a separation, and being now a free agent, he went boldly at the government loan, and soon scared all the snipes and half the tenants off his estate. The water poured off in torrents, the plump, juicy rushes got the jaundice, and Mossington Bog, over which the Major used to have to scuttle on foot after his harriers, became sound enough to carry a horse. Then, as Mr. Bullrush rode by and saw each dreary swamp become sound ground, he hugged himself with the sloven's consolation that it wouldn't pay. Pay, however, it did, for our major next went and got some stout horses and the right sort of implements of agriculture, and soon proved the truth of the old adage that it is better to follow a sloven than a scientific farmer. He worked his land well, cleaned it well, and manured it well, of which three simple operations consist the whole science of husbandry and instead of growing turnips for pickling, as his predecessor seemed to do, he got great healthy swedes that loomed as large as his now fashionable daughter's dresses. He grew as many bowels of oats upon one acre of land as any previous tenant had done upon three. So altogether our major throve, and instead of going to Boulogne, he presently set up the cockaded coach in which we saw him arrive at Tantivy Castle. Not that he went to a coachmaker's and said, "'Build me a roomy family coach, regardless of expense.' But finding that he couldn't get an inside seat along with the 36-yard dresses in the old chariot, he dropped in at the sale of the late Squire Trefoil's effects, who had given some such order, and under pretense of buying a shower bath, succeeded in getting a capital large coach on its first wheels for ten pounds, scarcely the value of the pole. 
as a contrast to Henry Brown and Co.'s business-like offer for the farm and an illustration of the difference between buying and selling, we append the verbose estimate of this ponderous affair. Thus it runs, Henry Trefoil Esquire, to chocker and charger coachmakers by appointment to the Emperor of China, Emperor of Morocco, the King of Oide, the King of the Cannibal Islands, etc., 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 etc. Long Anchor, London. Followed by all the crowns, arms, orders, flourish, and flannel peculiar to aristocratic tradesmen. Estimate of a new, highly finished coach of the best materials and workmanship, steps trimmed with morocco, neatly welted and recessed into doors, seats wove with cane and trunks under them, Venetian blinds, silk spring curtains, best plate glasses, the frames covered with black velvet, private locks to doors and bolts to blind, silver plated or polished, brass bead moldings round upper framing, door handles and two handsome lamps. The lining of fine cloth trimmed with a fashionable lace and morocco or rich silk tabaret to side and back squabs and to the tops of cushions, the whole stuffed with best curled hair and quilted and a handsome carpet to bottom and steps, body suspended on a light fashionable compass perch. Carriage with best steel springs, jacks and races to the backs, wrought iron axletrees with case hardened arms and boxes, wheels looped with solid tire and alternate spokes, a baroche seat attached to fore part of body, and a swinging footboard to the hind part. The whole well secured with best iron and neatly carved, painted any color, with arras and crest on doors, and highly varnished and polished. 290 pounds. If a platform boot attached to fore part of body with strong compass ironwork, 14 pounds, 14 N. Compass heel, standards, and footman's cushion, 12 pounds, 18 N. Four lace holders for footman, 2 pounds, 14 N. Lined boot and seat trimmed with cloth and lace to match and a knee boot and drop box, 31 pounds, 10 N. Drag chain and shoe, 2 pounds, 10 N. To three new large imperials made to cover the whole of roof, the center one made extra deep, covered in leather, lined with linen and fixing with straps, buckles, and staples, 21 pounds. Two three covers for due of strong floor cloth welted with leather, three pounds nineteen n. To a new wheel wrench, ten n. To a cover for body and made to go over front seat of fine brown holland, three pounds seven n. To packing up the body with mats and a large piece of floor cloth to go over the whole and covering part of the carriage with paper mats and hay bands, a man and horse taking it to the Euston station and expenses, six pounds eighteen n. Total three hundred and ninety pounds. Deduct for money seven and a half percent. Three hundred and ninety pounds. And to think that the whole should come to be sold for ten sovereigns. Oh, what a falling off was there, my coachmakers. Surely the king of the cannibal islands could never afford to pay such prices as those. Verily, Sir Robert Peel was right when he said that there was no class of tradespeople whose bills wanted reforming so much as coachmakers. What ridiculous price they make wood and iron assume, and what absurd offers they make when you go to them to sell. End of chapter 15. Read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 16 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 16 The Major's Menage. And first about the Harriers. Five and thirty years master of Harriers without a subscription. This, we think, is rather an exaggeration, both as regards time and money, unless the Major reckons an undivided moiety he had in an old lady hound called Lavender, along with the village blacksmith of Billinghurst when he was at school. If he so calculates, then he would be right as to time, but wrong as to money, for the blacksmith paid his share of the tax and found the greater part of the food. For thirty years we need hardly tell the reader of sporting literature that the Major had been a master of harriers, for well has he blown the horn of their celebrity during the whole of that long period. Never were such harriers for finding jack hares, and pushing them through parishes innumerable, making them take rivers and run as straight as railways, putting the costly performances of the foxhounds altogether to the blush. Ten miles from point to point, and generally without a turn, is the usual style of thing, the last run with this distinguished pack being always unsurpassed by any previous performance. Season after season has the sporting world been startled with these surprising announcements until red-coated men, tired of blanks and rigging foxes, have almost said, dash my buttons if I won't shut up shop here and go and hunt with these tremendous harriers. 
while other current jelly gentlemen whose hairs dance the fandango before their plotting pack have sighed for some of these wonderful jacks that never make a curve, or some of the astonishing hounds that have such a knack at making them fly. Well, but the reader will perhaps say it's the blood that does it. The major has an unrivaled, unequaled strain of hairier blood that nobody else can procure. Nothing of the sort. Nothing of the sort. The major's blood is just anything he can get. He never misses a chance of selling either a single hound or a pack, and has emptied his kennel over and over again. But then he always knows where to lay hands on more, and as soon as ever the new hounds cross his threshold, they become the very best in the world, better than any he ever had before. They then figure upon paper, just as if it was a continuous pack, and the field being under pretty good command, and moreover implicated in the honor of their performances, the thing goes on smoothly and well, and few are any the wiser. There is nothing so popular as a little fuss and excitement in which every man may take his share, and this it is that makes scratch packs so celebrated. Their followers see nothing but their perfections. They are, to their faults a little blind, and to their virtues ever kind. At the period of which we are writing, the Major's pack was rather better than usual, being composed of the pick of three packs, cries of dogs rather, viz. the Corky Cove Harriers kept by the Shoemakers of Waxley, the Bog Trotter Harriers for a couple kept by some more edge miners, the Dribbleford Dogs upon whom nobody would pay the tax, and of some two or three couple of incurables that had been consigned from different kennels on condition of the Major returning the hampers in which they came. The Major was open to general consignments in the canine line, hounds, pointers, setters, terriers, etc. Not being of George III's way of thinking, who used to denounce all presents that eat. He would take anything, anything at least except a greyhound, an animal that he held in mortal abhorrence. What he liked best was to get a lurcher, for which he soon found a place under a pear tree. The Major's huntsman, Old Solomon, was coachman, shepherd, groom, and gamekeeper, as well as huntsman and was the cockaded gentleman who drove the ark on the occasion of our introduction. In addition to all this, he waited at table on grand occasions and did a little fishing, haymaking, and gardening in the summer. He was one of the old-fashioned breed of servants, now nearly extinct, who passed their lives in one family and turned their hands to whatever was wanted. The major, whose maxim was not to keep any cats that didn't catch mice, knowing full well that all gentlemen servants can do double the work of their places, provided they only get paid for it, resolved that it was cheaper to pay one man the wages of one and a half to do the work of two men than to keep two men to do the same quantity. Consequently, there was very little hissing at bits and curb chains in the major's establishment, the hard work of other places being the light work or no work at all of his. Solomon was the beau ideal of a harrier huntsman, being, as the French say, d'un certain âge, quiet, patient, and a pusillanimous rider. Now about the subscription. It is true that the Major did not take a subscription in the common acceptation of the term, but he took assistance in various ways, such as a few days plowing from one man, a few bowels of seed wheat from another, a few bowels of seed oats from a third, a lamb from a fourth, a pig from a fifth, added to which he had all the hounds walked during the summer, so that his actual expenses were very little more than the tax. This he jockeyed by only returning about two-thirds the number of hounds he kept, and as twelve couple were his hunting maximum, his taxing minimum would be about eight, eight couple or sixteen hounds, at twelve shillings apiece, his nine pound twelve, for which sum he made more noise in the papers than the corn, the Belvoir, and the Cottersmore all put together. Indeed, the old adage of great cry and little wool applies to packs as well as flocks, for we never see hounds making a great to-do in the papers without suspecting that they are either good for nothing, or that the fortunate owner wants to sell them. With regard to horses, the Major, like many people, had but one sort, the best in England, though they were divided into two classes, viz. hunters and draft horses. Hacks or carriage horses he utterly eschewed. Horses must either hunt or plow with him, nor was he above putting his hunters into the harrows occasionally. Hence he always had a pair of efficient horses for his carriage when he wanted them, instead of animals that were fit to jump out of their skins at starting, and ready to slip through them on coming home. Clothing he utterly repudiated for carriage horses, alleging that people never get any work out of them after they are once clothed. The hunters were mostly sedate elderly animals, horses that had got through the morning of life with the foxhounds and came to the harriers in preference to harness. The major was always a buyer or exchanger, or a mixer of both, and would generally advance a little on the neighboring jobmaster's prices. Then, having got them, he recruited the veterans by care and crushed corn, which, with cutting their tails, so altered them that sometimes their late grooms scarcely knew them again. 
Certainly, if the animals could have spoken, they would have expressed their surprise at the different language the Major held as a buyer and as a seller. As a buyer, when, like Gil Blas' mule, he made them out to be all false, as a seller, when they suddenly seemed to become paragons of perfection. He was always ready for a deal and would accommodate matters to people's convenience, take part cash, part corn, part hay, part anything, for he was a most miscellaneous barterer, and his stable loft was like a marine store dealer's shop. Though always boasting that his little white hands were not soiled with trade, he would traffic in anything on the sly, by which he thought he could turn a penny. His last effort in the buying way had nearly got him into the county court, as the following correspondence will show, as also how differently two people can view the same thing. Being in town, with wheat at eighty shillings and barley and oats in proportion, and consequently more plethoric in the pocket than usual, he happened to stray into a certain great furniture mart where two chairs struck him as being cheap. They were standing together, and one of them was thus ticketed. Number 8205, two Elizabethan chairs, India, Japan, 43 shillings. The Major took a good stare at them, never having seen any before. Well, he thought they could not be dear at that, little more than a guinea each. Get them home for 50 shillings, say. There was a deal of gold and lacquer and varnish about them. Colored bunches of flowers inlaid with mother-of-pearl Chinese temples with insolent pigtailed barbarians in pink silk jackets with baggy blue trousers and gig whips in their hands, looking after the purple ducks on the pea-green lake. All very elegant. He'd have them, dashed if he wouldn't, would try and swap them for Mrs. Rocket Larkspur's Croydon basket carriage that the girls wanted. Just the thing to tickle her fancy. So he went into the office and gave his card most consequentially with a reference to Pennell, the saddler in Spur Street, Leicester Square, desiring that the chairs might be most carefully packed and forwarded to him by the goods train with an invoice by post. When the invoice came, behold, the 43 shillings had changed into 86 shillings. Hulua! exclaimed the astonished major. This won't do. 86 shillings is twice 43 shillings. And he wrote off to say they had made a mistake. This brought the secretary of the concern, Mr. Badbill, onto the scene. He replied beneath a copious shower of arms, orders, flourish, and flannel that the mistake was the major's, that they never marked their goods in pairs, to which the major rejoined that they had in this instance, as the ticket which he forwarded to Pennell for Badbill's inspection showed, and that he must decline the chairs at double the price they were ticketed for. Badbill, having duly inspected the ticket, retorted that he was surprised at the major's stupidity, that two meant one, in fact, all the world over. The major rejoined that he didn't know what the reform bill might have done, but that two didn't mean one when he was at school, and added that as he declined the chairs at 86 shillings, they were at Bad Bill's service for sending for. Bad Bill wrote in reply, We really cannot understand how it is possible for anyone to make out that the ticket on an article includes the other that may stand next to it. Certainly the ticket you allude to referred only to the chair on which it was placed and in a subsequent letter he claimed to have the chairs repacked at the major's expense, as it was very unfair saddling them with the loss arising entirely from the major's mistake. To which our gallant friend rejoined, that as he would neither admit that the mistake was his, nor submit to the imputation of unfairness, he would stick to the chairs at the price they were ticketed at. Bad Bill then wrote that this declaration surprised them much, that they did not for a moment think he intentionally misunderstood the ticket as referring to a pair of chairs, whereas it only gave the price of one chair, and again begged to have them back. To which the Major inwardly responded he wished they might get them, and sent them an order for the forty-three shillings. This was returned with expressions of surprise that after the explanation given, the Major should persevere in the same course of error, and hope that he would, without further delay, favor the co. with the right amount, for which Bad Bill said they anxiously waited, and for which the Major inwardly said they might wait. In due time came a lithographed circular, more imposingly flourished and flannel than ever, stating the terms of the firm were cash on delivery, and that unless the major remitted without further delay, he would be handed over to their solicitor, etc., with an intimation on the bottom that that was the third application, of which our gallant friend took no notice. Next came a written, Sir, I am desired by this firm to inform you that unless we hear from you by return of post respecting the payment of our account, we shall place the matter in the hands of our solicitors without further notice, and regret you should have occasioned us so much trouble through your own misunderstanding. Then came the climax. The major solicitor went ticket in hand and tendered the forty-three shillings, when the late bullying Bad Bill was obliged to write as follows. It appears you are quite correct rejecting the ticket, and we are in error. 
Our ticketing clerk had placed the figure in the wrong part of the card, the figure two referring to the number of chairs in stock, and not as understood to signifying chairs for forty-three shillings. And Bad Bill humorously concluded by expressing a hope that the major would return the chairs and continue his custom. Two very unlikely events, as we dare say the reader will think to happen. Such then was the knowing gentleman who now sought the company of fine Billy, and considering that he is to be besieged on both sides, we hope to be excused for having gone a little into his host and hostess's pedigree and performances. The major wrote Billy a well-considered note, saying that when he could spare a few days from his lordship and the foxhounds, it would afford Mrs. Yammerton and himself great pleasure if he would come and pay them a visit at Yammerton Grange, and the major would be happy to mount him and keep his best country for him, and show him all the sport in his power, adding that they had been having some most marvelous runs lately, better than any he ever remembered. Now, independently of our friend Billy having pondered a good deal on the beauty of the young lady's eyes, he could well spare a few days from the foxhounds, for his lordship, being quite de glancy cured, and wishing to get rid of him, had had him out again, and put him on to a more fractious horse than before, who, after giving him a most indefinite shaking, had finally shot him over his head. The Earl was delighted, therefore, when he heard of the Major's invitation, and after expressing great regret at the idea of losing our Billy, begged he would come back whenever it suited him, well knowing that if he once got him out of the house, he would be very sly if he got in again. And so Billy, who never answered Mama's repeated inquiries if there were any Miss H's engaged himself to Yammerton Grange, whither the reader will now perhaps have the kindness to accompany him. End of chapter 16, read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 17 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 17. Arrival at Yammerton Grange. A Family Party. Railways have taken the starch out of country magnificence as well as out of town. Time was when a visitor could hardly drive up to a great man's door in the country in a pochab. Now it would be considered very magnificent, a bliss or a one-off fly being more likely the conveyance. The richest commoner in England took his departure from Tantivy Castle in a one-horse fly, into which he was assisted by an immense retinue of servants. It was about time for him to be gone, for Monsieur Jean Roger had been what he called booksying with the Earl's big watcher, Stephen Stout, to whom, having given a most elaborate licking, the rest of the establishment were up in arms, and would most likely have found a match for Monsieur among them. Jack, that is to say, Monsieur Jean, now kissed his hand, and grinned and bowed, and bonjoured them from the box of the fly, with all the affability of a gentleman who has had the best of it. Off then they ground at as good a trot as the shaky old quadruped could raise. It is undoubtedly a good sound principle that Major and Mrs. Yammerton went upon never to invite people direct from great houses to theirs, a dwarf's little one so. A few days' ventilation at a country inn with its stupid dirty waiters, copper-showing plate, and wretched cookery would be a good preparation. Only no one ever goes into an inn in England that can help it. Still, coming down from a first-class nobleman's castle to a third-class gentleman's house was rather a trial upon the latter. Not that we mean to say anything disrespectful of Yammerton Grange, which, though built at different times, was good, roomy, and rough cast, with a man-boy in brown and yellow livery who called himself the butler, but whom the women servants called the bumbler. The above outline will give the reader a general idea of the style of thing, as the insolvent dandy said when he asked his creditors for a wax candle and eau de cologne sort of allowance. Everything at the Grange, of course, was now put into holiday garb, both externally and internally. Gravel rate, garden spruced, stable strawed, etc. All the major's old sheep caps, old hair snares, old hang locks, old hedging gloves, pruning knives, and implements of husbandry were thrust into the back of the drawer of the passage table, while a mixed sporting and military trophy composed of whip swords and pistols radiated round his Sunday hat against the wall above it. The drawing room, we need not say, underwent metamorphose, the chairs and sofas suddenly changing from rather dirty print to pea green damask the druggeted carpet bursting into cornucopias of fruit and gay bouquets, while a rich cover of many colors adorned the center table, which in turn was covered with the proceeds of the young lady's industry. The room became a sort of exhibition of their united accomplishments. The silver inkstand surmounted a beautiful, unblemished blotting book, fresh pens and paper stood invitingly behind, while the little dictionary was consigned with other sundries to the well of the ottoman. 
As the finishing preparations were progressing, the Major and Mrs. Yammerton carried on a broken discussion as to the program of proceedings, and as in the Major's opinion, there's nothing can compare to hunting of the hare, he wanted to lead off with a galop, to which Mrs. Yammerton demurred. She thought it would be a much better plan to have a quiet day about the place, let the girls walk Mr. Pringle up to Prospect Hill to see the view from Eagleton Rocks, and call on Mrs. Wasperton and show him to her ugly girls, in return for their visit with Mr. Giles Smith. The Major, on the contrary, thought if there was to be a quiet day about the place, he would like to employ it in showing Billy a horse he had to sell. But while they were in the midst of the argument, the click of front gate snick, followed by the vehement ba 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 bark of the Sky Terrier Fury, announced an arrival, and from behind a ground-feathering spruce emerged the shaky old horse, dragging at its tail the heavily laden cab. Then there was such a scattering of crimaline below, and such a gathering of cotton above to see the gentleman alight, and such speculations as to his Christian name and which of the young ladies he would do for. I see his name's Harry, whispered Sally Scuttle, the housemaid, into Benson's, we beg pardon, Miss Benson's, the lady maid's ear, who was standing before her, peeping past the faded curtains of the chintz room. I say it's John, replied Miss Benson, now that Mr. Pringle's head appeared at the window. I say it's Joseph, interposed Betty Bone, the cook, who stood behind Sally Scuttle, at which speculation they all leapt. Oh, no, he's not a bit like Joseph, replied Sally, eyeing Billy as he now alighted. Look, he's quite a young gent, observed Bone. Young, to be sure, replied Miss Henson. You don't suppose we want any old uns here? He'll do nicely for Miss, observed Sally. And why not for Miss F? asked Henson, from whom she had just received an old gown. Well, either, rejoined Sally. Only Miss had the last chance. Oh, curates go for nothing, retorted Benson. If it had been a captain, it would have been something like. Well, but there's Miss Harriet. You never mentioned Miss Harriet. Why shouldn't Miss Harriet have a chance? interposed the cook. Oh, Miss Harriet must wait her turn. Let her sisters be served first. They can all have em, you know, so it's no use trying. Billy, having entered the house, the lady's attention was now directed to Monsieur. What a thick, plummy man he is, observed Benson, looking down on Roger's broad shoulders. He looks as if he's got his vittles well, rejoined Bone, wondering how he would like their lean beef and bacon fare. Where will he have to sleep? asked Sally Scuttle. Oh, with a bumbler, to be sure, replied Bone. Not he, interposed Miss Benson with disdain. You don't spouse a regular valet de chambre or condescend to sleep with a footman. You don't know them if you think that. He's got mouse catchers, observed Sally Scuttle, who had been eyeing Monsieur intently. Oh, in a beard like a blackened brush, whispered Bone. He's surely a foreigner, whispered Benson, as Monsieur's I see to fill caterpillar lift her down gently, alluding to his own carpet bag, in which he had a bottle of rum enveloped in swaddling clothes of dirty linen, to the cabman sounded upstairs. So he is, replied Benson, adding after a pause, Well, anybody may have him for me, saying which she tripped out of the room, quickly followed by the others. Our major, having on the first alarm, rushed off to his dirty sanctum and crowned himself with a drab felt wide awake, next snatched a little knotty dog whip out of the trophy as he passed, and was at the sash door of the front entrance welcoming our hero with the full spring tide of hospitality as he alighted from his fly. The major was overjoyed to see him. It was indeed kind of him leaving the castle to come and visit them in their humble abode, the major, of course, now being on the humility tack. Let me take your cloak, said he. Let me take your cap. And with the aid of the bumbler, who came shuffling himself into his brown and yellow livery coat, Billy was eased of his wrapper and stood before the now thrown open drawing room door, just as Mrs. Yammerton, having swept the last brown holland cover off the reclining chair, had stuffed it under the sofa cushion. She, too, was delighted to see Billy, and thankful she had got the room ready, so as to be able presently to subside upon the sofa, morning post in hand, just as if she had been interrupted in her reading. The young ladies then dropped in one by one, Miss at the passage door, Miss Flora at the one connecting the drawing room with the sanctum, and Miss Harriet again at the passage door, all divested of their aprons and fresh from their respective looking-glasses. The two former, of course, met Billy as an old acquaintance, and as they did not mean to allow Miss Harriet to participate in the prize, they just let her shuffle herself into an introduction as best she could. Billy wasn't quite sure whether he had seen her before or he hadn't. At first he thought he had, then he thought he hadn't, but whether he had or he hadn't, he knew there would be no harm in bowing, so he just promiscuated one to her, which she acknowledged with a best feathery curtsy. A great cry of conversation, or rather of random observation, then ensued, in the midst of which the Major slipped out, and from his sanctum he overheard Monsieur getting up much the same sort of entertainment in the kitchen. 
there was such laughing and giggling and hee-hawing among the maids that the major feared the dinner would be neglected. The major's dining room, though small, would accommodate a dozen people, or incommode eighteen, which latter number is considered the most serviceable sized party in the country where people feed off their acquaintance, more upon the debtor and creditor system than with a view to making pleasant parties, or considering who would like to meet. Even when they are what they call alone, they can't be alone, but must have in as many servants as they can raise, to show how far the assertion is from the truth. Though the Yammertons sat down but six on the present occasion, and there were the two accustomed dumbwaiters in the room, three live ones were introduced, viz. Monsieur, the Bumbler, and Solomon, whose duty seemed to consist in cooling the victuals by carrying them about, and in preventing people from helping themselves to what was before them, by taking the dishes off the steady table and presenting them again on very unsteady hands. No one is ever allowed to shoot a dish sitting if a servant can see it. How pleasant it would be if we were watched in all the affairs of life as we are in eating. Monsieur, we may observe, had completely superseded the bumbler, just as a colonel supersedes a captain on coming up. I am Colonel Crushington of the Royal Plungers, proclaims the colonel, stretching himself to his utmost altitude. And I am Captain Succumber of the Sugar Candy Hussars, vows the captain with the utmost humility, whereupon the captain is snuffed out and the colonel reigns in his stead. I am Monsieur Johnny Roger, valet de chambre to me, Lord Pringle, and I sail taking the potage de soup observed Roger, coming downstairs in his first-class clothes and pushing the now yellow-legged bumbler aside. And these hobbled ahoys never being favorites with the fair, the maids saw him reduced without remorse. So the dinner got set upon the table without a fight, and though Monsieur allowed the bumbler to announce it in the drawing-room, it was only that he might take a suck of the sherry while he was away. But he was standing as bolt upright as a sergeant major on parade when Milor entered the dining room with Mrs. Yammerton on his arm, followed by the Graces, the major having stayed behind to blow out the composites. They were soon settled in their places, Grace said, and the assault commenced. The major was rather behind Imperial John in magnificence, for John had got his plate in the drawing room, while the major still adhered to the good old fashioned blue and red and golden green crockery ware of his youth. Not but that both Mama and the young ladies had often represented to him the absolute necessity of having plate, but the Major could never fall in with it at his price, that of German silver or Britannia metal, perhaps. We dare say Fine Billy would never have noticed the deficiency if the Major had not drawn attention to it by apologizing for his absence, and fearing that he would not be able to eat his dinner without, though we dare say if the truth were known, our readers, our male readers at least, will agree with us that a good hot well-washed china dish is a great deal better than a dull lukewarm hand-rubbed silver one. It's the whittles people look to, not the wear. Then the major was afraid his wine wouldn't pass muster after the earls, and certainly his champagne was nothing to boast of, being that ambiguous stuff that halts between the price of gooseberry and real, in addition to which the major had omitted to pay it the compliment of icing it, so that it stood forth in all its native imperfection. However, it hissed and fizzed and popped and banged, which is always something exciting at all events, and as the major sported needle-case-shaped glasses which he had got at a sale, very cheap, we hope. There was no fear of people getting enough to do them any harm. Giving champagne is one of those things that has passed into custom almost imperceptibly. Twenty or five and twenty years ago, a mid-rank-of-life person giving champagne was talked of in a very shake-the-head, solemn, I-wish-it-may-last style. Now everybody gives it of some sort or other. We read in the papers the other day of ninety dozen for which the holder had paid four hundred pounds, being sold for thirteen shillings, six pence a dozen. What a chance that would have been for our major! We wonder what that had been made of. It was a happy discovery that giving champagne at dinner saved other wine after, for certainly nothing promotes the conviviality of a meeting so much as champagne, and there is nothing so melancholy and funereal as a dinner party without it. Indeed, giving champagne may be regarded as a downright promoter of temperance, for a person who drinks freely of champagne cannot drink freely of any other sort of wine after it, so that champagne may be said to have contributed to the abolition of the old port wine toping wherewith our fathers were wont to beguile their long evenings. Indeed, light wines in London clubs have about banished an inebriety from anything like good society and large newspapers, too, have contributed their quota, whereby a man can read what is passing in all parts of the world, instead of being told whose cat has kittened in his own immediate neighborhood. With which philosophical reflections, let us return to our party. 
Although youth is undoubtedly the age of mature judgment and connoisseurship in everything, and Billy was quite as knowing as his neighbors, he accepted the major's encomiums on his wine with all the confidence of ignorance, and what is more to the purpose, he drank it. Indeed, there was nothing faulty on the table that the major didn't praise, on the old horse-dealing principle of lauding the bad points and leaving the good ones to speak for themselves. So the dinner progressed through a multiplicity of dishes, for to do the ladies justice, they always give good fare. It is the men who treat their friends to mutton chops and rice puddings. Betty Bone, too, was a noble-hearted woman, and would undertake to cook for a party of fifty. Roasts, boils, stews, soups, sweets, savories, sauces, and all. And so, what with a pretty girl alongside of him and two sitting opposite, Billy did uncommonly well, and felt far more at home than he did at Tantivy Castle with the Earl and Mrs. Moffat, and the stiff dependents his lordship brought in to dine. The Major stopped Billy from calling for Burgundy after his cheese by volunteering a glass of home-brewed ale. b b boodled he said, when he came of age, though in fact it had only arrived from Alo, the chemist at Hinton, about an hour before dinner. This being only sipped and smacked and applauded, grace was said, the cloth removed, the Major was presently assuring Billy in a bumper of moderate juvenile port how delighted he was to see him, how flattered he felt by his condescension in coming to visit him at his humble abode, and how he oped to make the visit agreeable to him. This piece of flummery being delivered, the bottles and desserts circulated, and in due time the ladies retired, the misses to the drawing-room, madam to the pantry, to see that the bumbler had not pocketed any of the cheesecakes or tarts, for which, boy-like, he had a propensity. The major, we are ashamed to say, had no mirror in his drawing-room wherein the ladies could now see how they had been looking. So, of course, they drew to that next attraction, the fire, which, having duly stirred, Miss Yammerton and Flora laid their heads together, with each a fair arm resting on the old-fashioned grey-veined marble mantelpiece, and commenced a very laughing, whispering conversation. This, of course, attracted Miss Harriet, who tried first to edge in between them, and then to participate at the sides, but she was repulsed at all points, and at length was told by Miss Yammerton to get away, as she had nothing to do with what they were talking about. "'Yes, I have,' pouted Miss Harriet, who guessed what the conversation was about. "'Now you haven't,' retorted Miss Flora. "'It's between Flora and me,' observed Miss Yammerton dryly, with an air of authority. Oh, "'But that's not fair,' exclaimed Miss Harriet. "'Yes, it is,' replied Miss Yammerton, throwing up her head. "'Yes, it is,' asserted Miss Flora, supporting her elder sister's assertion. "'No, it's not,' retorted Miss Harriet. "'You weren't here at the beginning,' observed Miss Yammerton, alluding to the expedition to Tantivy Castle. "'That was not my fault,' replied Miss Harriet firmly. I would go in the coach. Never mind, you were not there, replied Miss Yammerton tartly. Well, but I'll ask Mama if that's fair, rejoined Miss Harriet, hurrying out of the room. End of chapter 17, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 18 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 18. A Little Contretemps. The Major, having inducted his guest into one of those expensive articles of dining room furniture, an easy chair, the expensive inasmuch as they cause a great consumption of candles by sending their occupants to sleep, now set a little round table between them, to which, having transferred the biscuits and wine, he drew a duplicate chair to the fire for himself, and, sousing down in it, prepared for a tete-a-tete -tete chat with our friend. He wanted to know what Lord Ladythorne said of him, to sound Billy, in fact, whether there was any chance of his making him a magistrate. He also wanted to find out how long Billy was going to stay in the country, and see whether there was any chance of selling him a horse. So he led up to the points by calling upon Billy to fill a bumper to the Merry Harriers, observing casually as he passed the bottle that he had now kept them for even thirty years without a subscription, and was as much attached to the sport as ever. This toast was followed by the Foxhounds and Lord Ladythorne's health, which opened out a fine field for general dissertation and sounding, commencing with Mr. Bogledyke, who the Major not liking, of course, he condemned and Mrs. Pringle, having expressed an adverse opinion of him too, Billy adopted their ideas and agreed that he was slow and ought to be drafted. With his magisterial inquiry, the Major was not so fortunate, his lordship being too old a soldier to commit himself before a boy like Billy, and the Major, after trying every muse and every twist and every turn with the proverbial patience and pertinacity of a hare-hunter, was at length obliged to whip off and get upon his horses. 
when a man gets upon his horses especially after dinner and that man such an optimist as the major there is no help for it but either buying them in a lump or going to sleep and as we shall have to endeavor to induce the reader to accompany us through the major's stable by and by we will leave billy to do which he pleases while we proceed to relate what took place in another part of the house for this purpose it will be necessary to ease her back her as the thames steamboat boys say our story a little to the close of the dinner Monsieur Jean Roger, having taken the general bearings of the family as he stood behind Milord Pringle's chair, retired from active service on the coming in of the cheese, and proceeded to Billy's apartment, there to arrange the toilet table and see that everything was comme le faux. Billy's dirty boots, of course, he took downstairs to the bumbler to clean, who in turn put them off upon Solomon. Very smart everything in the room was. The contents of the gorgeous dressing case were duly displayed on the fine white damask cloth that covered the rose-color lined muslin of the gracefully fringed and festooned toilette cover, whose flowing drapery presented at once an effectual barrier to the legs, and formed an excellent repository for old crusts, envelopes, curl papers, and general sweepings. Solid ivory hair brushes with tortoiseshell combs, cosmetics, curling fluids, oils, and essences without end mingled with the bichoterie and knick-knacks of the distinguished visitor. Having examined himself attentively in the glass and spruced up his bristles with Billy's brushes, Jack then stirred the fire, extinguished the toilet table candle, which he had lit on coming in, and produced a great blue blouse from the bottom drawer of the wardrobe, in which, having enveloped himself in order to prevent his fine clothes catching dust, he next crawled backwards under the bed. He had not lain there very long, ere the opening and shutting of downstairs doors with the ringing of a bell was followed by the rustling of silks, and the light tread of airy steps hurrying along the passage and stopping at the partially open door. Presently, increased light in the apartment was succeeded by less rustle and tiptoe treads passing the bed and making up to the looking glass. The self inspection being over, candles were then flashed about the room in various directions, and Jack, having now thrown all his energies into his ears, overheard the following hurried sotto voce exclamations. First voice Lock, what a little dandy it is! Second voice Look, I say, look at his boots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pair as I live, besides Jackson Tops. First voice. And shoes in proportion, the speaker running her candle along the line of various patterned shoes. Second voice, advancing to the toilet table. Let's look at his studs. What an assortment. Wonder if those are diamonds or paste they has on. First voice. Oh, diamonds, to be sure, with an emphasis on diamonds. You don't suppose such a little swell as that would wear paste. See, there's a pearl and diamond ring. Just fits me, I do declare, added she, trying it on. Second voice. What beautiful carbuncle pins. First voice. Oh, what studs. Second voice. Oh, what chains. First voice. Oh, what pins. Second voice. Oh, what a love of a ring. And so the ladies continue, turning the articles hastily over. Oh, how happy he must be, sighed a languishing voice as the inspection proceeded. See, here's his little silver shaving box, observed the first speaker, opening it. Wonder what he wants with a shaving box, got no more beer than I have, replied the other, taking up Billy's badger hair shaving brush and applying it to her own pretty chin. Oh, smell what delicious perfume, now exclaimed the discoverer of the shaving box. Essence of rondalicia, I do believe. No, extract de mil flores, added she, scenting her kerchief with some. Then there was a hurried, frightened hush, followed by a tick care that ugly man of his doesn't come. Did you ever see such a monster? ejaculated the other earnestly. Kept his horrid eyes fixed upon me the whole dinner, observed the first speaker. Frights they are, rejoined the other. He must keep him for a boil, suggested the first. Let's go, or we'll be caught, replied the alarmist, and forthwith the rustling of silks was resumed, the candles hurried past, and the ladies tripped softly out of the room, leaving the door ajar with Jack under the bed to digest their compliments at his leisure. But Monsieur was too many for them. Miss had dropped her glove at the foot of the bed, which Jack found on emerging from his hiding place, and waiting until he had the whole party reassembled at tea, he walked majestically into the middle of the drawing room with it extended on a plated tray, his horrid eyes combining all the venom of a Frenchman with the hauteur of an Englishman, and inquired in a loud and audible voice, Please, has any lady or gentleman lost its glove? Yes, I have, replied Miss hastily, who had been wondering where she had dropped it. Indeed, ma'am, replied Monsieur, bowing and presenting it to her on the tray, adding in a still louder voice, I found it in Monsieur Pringle's bedroom. And Jack's flashing eye saw by the brightly coloring girls which were the offenders. 
very much shocked was Mama at the announcement, and the young ladies were so put about that they could scarcely compose themselves at the piano, while Miss Harriet's voice soared exultingly as she accompanied herself on her harp. End of chapter 18, read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 19 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Loner. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 19. The Major's Stud. Mrs. Yammerton carried the day, and the young ladies carried paper-booted Billy, or rather walked him up to Mrs. Wasperton's at Prospect Hill and showed him the ugly girls, and also the beautiful view from Eagleton Rocks over the wide-spreading vale of Bemerley beyond, which, of course, Billy enjoyed amazingly, as all young gentlemen do enjoy views under such pleasant circumstances. Perhaps he might have enjoyed it more if two out of three of the dear charmers had been absent, but then things had not got to that pass, and Mama would not have thought it proper, at least not unless she saw her way to a very decided preference, which, of course, was then out of the question. Billy was a great swell, and the Chaws who met him stared with astonishment at such an elegant parasoled exquisite, picking his way daintily along the dirty, sloppy, ruddy lanes. Like all gentlemen in similar circumstances, he declared his boots wouldn't hike in wet. Of course, Mama charged the girls not to be out late, an injunction that applied as well to precaution against the night air as to the importance of getting Billy back by afternoon stable time, when the Major purposed treating him to a sight of his stud and trying to lay the foundation of a sale. Perhaps our sporting readers would like to take a look into the Major's stable before he comes in with his victim, Fine Billy. If so, let them accompany us. Meanwhile, our lady friends can skip the chapter if they do not like to read about horses, or here, if they will step this way, and here comes the dairy maid, they can look at the cows. Real Durham shorthorns with great milking powers and most undeniable pedigrees. Uh, we thought they would tickle your fancy. The cow is to the lady what the horse is to the gentleman, or on the score of usefulness, what hare hunting is to fox hunting, or shooting to hunting. Master may have many horses pulled backwards out of his stable without exciting half the commiseration among the fair that the loss of one nice, quiet, milk-giving, cushy cow affords. Cows are friendly creatures. They remember people longer than almost any other animal, dogs not excepted. Well, here are four of them, Old Lily, Strawberry Cream, Red Rose, and Toy. The house is clean and sweet and smells of milk and well-made hay, instead of the nasty brown-colored snuff-smelling stuff that some people think good enough for the poor cow. The Major is proud of his cows, and against the whitewashed wall he has pasted the description of a perfect one, in order that people may compare the originals with the portrait. Thus it runs. She's long in the face, she's fine in the horn, she'll quickly get fat without cake or corn. She's clean in her jaws and full in her chine. She's heavy in flank and wide in her loin. She's broad in her ribs and long in her rump, a straight and flat back without ever a hump. She's wide in her hips and calm in her eyes. She's fine in her shoulders and thin in her thighs. She's light in her neck and small in her tail. She's wide at the breast and good at the pail. She's fine in her bone and silky of skin. She's a grazer's without, and a butcher's within. Now for the stable. This way, through the saddle room, and mind the whitening on the walls. Stoop your head, for the Major being low himself has made the door on the principle of all other people being low, too. There, there you are, you see, in a stable as neat and clean as a London dealer's. A new market straw plate, a sanded floor with a roomy bench against the wall, on which the Major kicks his legs and stutters forth the merits of his steeds. There are six in number, and before he comes, we will just run the reader through the lot with the aid of truth for an accompaniment. This gray, or rather white one next the wall, White Surrey as he calls him, is the old quivering-tailed horse he rode on the De Glancy day, and pulled up to save from the price-depressing inconvenience of being beat. He is eighteen years old, the Major having got him when he was sixteen, in a sort of part-purchase, part-swap, part-barter deal. He gave young Mr. Megason of Spoonbill Park thirteen pounds ten shillings, an old mahogany pianoforte by Broadwood, six and a half octaves, a squirrel cage, two sunblinds, and a very feeble old horse called Nonpare, that Tom Rivet the blacksmith declared it would be like robbing Megason to put new shoes onto for him. He is a game, good-shaped old horse, but having frequently in the course of a checkered career been in that hardest of all hard places, the hands of young single horse owners, White Surrey has done the work of three or four horses. 
he has been fired and blistered and blistered and fired till his legs are as round and as callous as those of a mahogany dining table. Still, it is wonderful how they support him, and as he has never given the major a fall, he rides him as though he thought he never would. His price is sometimes fifty, sometimes forty, sometimes thirty, and there are times when he might be bought for a little less, two sovereigns perhaps returned out of the thirty. The next one to him, the white-legged brown, is of the antediluvian order too. He is now called Woodpecker, but he may be traced by half a dozen aliases through other staples, Buck Hunter, Captain Tart, Flea Catcher, Sportsman, Mark Antony, etc. He is nearly, if not quite, thoroughbred, and the ignoble purposes to which he has been subjected to false start-making, steeple-chasing, flat and hurdle racing, accounts for the number of his names. The Major got him from Captain Carrot of the Apple Pie Hussars, when that gallant regiment was ordered out to India, taking him all the way together, saddle, bridle, clothing, etc., for twenty-three pounds, a strong iron-bound chest, fit for sea purposes, as the Major described it, and a spying glass. This horse, like all the rest of them, indeed, is variously priced, depending upon the party asking. Sometimes fifty, sometimes five and twenty would buy him. The third is a mare, a black mare, called Star, late the property of Mr. Hazy, the horse-stealing master of the Sweezington Hounds. Hazy sold her in his usual course of horse-stealing, cheating to young Mr. Spriggenson of Marigold Lodge for a hundred and twenty guineas, the shillings back. Hazy's discrimination enabling him to see that she was turning weaver, and Spriggenson, not liking her, returned to her on the warranty. When, of course, Hazy refusing to receive her, she was sent to the Eclipse livery and bait stables at Hinton, where, after weaving her head off, she was sold at the hammer to the Major for twenty-nine pounds. Sprigg then brought in action against Hazy for the balance, bringing half a dozen witnesses to prove that she wove when she came. Hazy, of course, bringing a dozen to swear that she never did nothing of the sort with him, and must have learnt it on the road and the jury being perplexed, and one of them having a cow to cab, another wanting to see his sweetheart, and the rest wanting their dinners, they just tossed up for it. Heads for Sprig, tails for Hazy, and Sprig won. There she goes, you see, weaving backwards and forwards like a caged panther in a den. Still, she is far from being the worst that the Major has. Indeed, we are not sure that she is not about the best, only, as Solomon says with reference to her weaving, she gets the lang of the war, sir. Number four is a handsome, whole-colored, bright bay horse, Napoleon the Great, as the Major calls him, in hopes that his illustrious name will sell him, for of all bad tickets he ever had, the Major thinks, Nap is the worst. At starting, he is all fire, frisk, and emulation, but before he has gone five miles, he begins to droop, and in hunting, knocks up entirely before he has crossed half a dozen fields. He is a weak, watery, washy creature, wanting no end of coddling, boiled corn, and linseed tea. One hears of two days a week horses, but Napoleon the Great is a day and two weeks one. The reader will wonder how the Major came to get such an animal, still more how he came to keep him, above all how he ever came to have him twice. The mystery, however, is explained on the old bartering, huckstering, half-and-half -half system. The Major got him first from Tom Brandysneak, a low public housekeeping leather plater, one of those sporting men, not sportsmen, who talk about supporting the turf as if they did it like the noblemen of old upon principle, instead of for what they can put into their own pockets. And the Major gave Sneak an old green dog cart, a melon frame, sixteen volumes of the racing calendar bound in calf, a ton of seed hay, fifty yards of Krogan's asphalt roofing felt, and three golden sovereigns for him. Knapp was then doing duty under the title of Johnny Raw, his calling being to appear at different posts whenever the cruel conditions of a race required a certain number of horses to start in order to secure the added money. But Johnny enacted that office so often for the benefit of the Honorable Society of Confederated Legs that the stewards of races framed their conditions for excluding him, and Johnny's occupation being gone, he came to the Major in manner aforesaid. Being, however, a horse of prepossessing appearance, a good bay with four clean black legs, a neat well-set-on head, with an equally neat Satan tail, a flowing mane, and other etceteras, he soon passed into the possession of young Mr. Taverton of Green Linnet Hill, whose grandmama had just given him a hundred guineas wherewith to buy a good horse. A real good one he was to be, a hundred guinea one, in fact. Taverton soon took all the gay insolence out of Johnny's tail, and brought him back to the major, sadly dilapidated, a sad satire upon his former self. Meanwhile, the Major had filled up his stall with a handsome, rich-colored brown mare with a decidedly doubtful foreleg, and the Major, all candor and affability, readily agreed to exchange on condition of getting five and twenty pounds to boot. The mare presently went down to exercise, confirming the Major's opinion of the instability of her leg, and increasing his confidence in his own judgment. Napoleon the Great, late Johnny Raw, now reigns in her stead, and very well he looks in the straw. 
Indeed, that is his proper place, and as many people only keep their horses to look at, there is no reason why Napoleon the Great should remain in the Major's stables. He certainly won't if the Major can help it. Number five is a vulgar-looking little dunduckety mud-colored horse with long white stockings and a large white face called Bulldog that Solomon generally rides. Nobody knows how old he is, or how many masters he has had, or where he came from, or who his father was, or whether he had a grandfather, or anything whatever about him. The Major got him for a mere nothing, nine pounds, at Joe Seaton's, the runaway vet's sale about five years ago, and being so desperately ugly and common-looking, no one has ever attempted to deprive the Major of him, either in the way of barter or sale. Still, Bully is a capital slave, always ready either to hunt or hack or go in harness, and will pass anything except a public house, being familiarly and favorably known at the doors of everyone in the county. Like most horses, he has his little peculiarity, and his consists of a sort of rheumatic affection of the hind leg, which causes him to catch it up and sends him limping along on three legs like a lame dog. But still, he never comes down, and the attack soon goes off. Solomon and he look very like their work together. The next horse to Bulldog, and the last in the stable, is Golden Drop, a soft and mealy chestnut, of all colors the most objectionable. He is a hot, pulling, hauling, rushing, rough-actioned animal that gives a rider two days' exercise in one. The worst of him is he has the impudence to decline harness, for though he doesn't mill, as they call it, he yet runs backwards as fast as forwards, and would crash through a plate-glass window, a gate, a conservatory, or anything else that happened to be behind. As a hack, he is below mediocrity, for in his walk he digs his toes into the ground about every tenth step, and either comes down on his nose or sets off at a score for fear of a licking, added to which he shies at every heap of stones and other available object on the road, whereby he makes a ten miles journey into one of twelve. The major got him off Mr. Brisket, the butcher at Hinton, being taken with the way in which his hatless lad spun him about the ill-paved streets, with the meat basket on his arm, the full trot it may be observed being the animal's pace. But having got him home, the more the Major saw of him, the less he liked him. He had a severe deal for him, too, and made two or three journeys over to Hinton on market days, and brought a pennyworth of whipcord of one saddler, a set of spur leathers of another, a pot of harness paste of a third, in order to pump them about the horse ere he ventured to touch. He also got Mr. Paul Stradler, the disengaged gentleman of the place, whose greatest pleasure is to be employed upon a deal, to ferret out all he could about him, who reported that the horse was perfectly sound and a capital feeder, which indeed he is, for he will attack anything from a hay band down to a hedge stake. You see, he's busy on his betting now. Brisket, knowing his man, and that the Major killed his own mutton, and occasionally beef in the winter, so that there was no good to be got of him in the meatway, determined to ask a stiff price, viz. twenty-five pounds, Brisket having given fourteen pounds, which the Major, having beat down to twenty-three pounds, commenced on the mercantile line which Brisket's then approaching marriage favored, and the Major ultimately gave a four-post mahogany bedstead with blue damask furniture, palisade, and mattress to match, and mahogany toilet mirror, 23 inches by 28, a hot water pudding dish, a silver-edged cake basket, a bad barometer, a child's birchwood's crib, a chessboard, and two pounds ten shillings in cash for him, the two pounds ten shillings being, as the Major now declares, to himself, of course, far more than his real worth. However, there the horse stands, and though he has been down twice with the Major and once with the Humbler, these little forepaws, faux pas, as the Major calls them, have been on the soft, and the knees bear no evidence of the fact. Such is our friend's present stud, and such its general character. But stay, we are omitting the horse in this large family pew-looking box at the end, whose drawn curtains have caused us to overlook him. He is another of the Major's bad tickets, and one of which he has just become possessed in the following way. Having, in furtherance of his character as a uh, thorough sportsman, and to preserve the spirit of impartiality so becoming an old master of harriers, gone to Sir Moses Mainchance's opening day as well as to my lord's, Sir Moses, as if in appreciation of the compliment, had offered to give the horse on which his second whip was blundering among the blind ditches. The Major jumped at the offer, for the horse looked well with the whip on him, and as he accepted, Sir Moses increased the stream of his generosity by engaging the Major to dine and take him away. Sir Moses had a distinguished party to meet him, and was hospitality itself. He plied our Major with champagne and hock and barsack and sauterne and port and claret and compliments, but never alluded to the horse until about an hour after dinner, where Mr. Smoothly, the jackal of the hunt, brought him on the tapis. Ah, exclaimed Sir Moses, as if in sudden recollection, that's true. Major, you're quite welcome to Little Bow Peep. 
for so he had christened him in order to account for his inquisitive manner of peering. You're quite welcome to little Bo Peep, and I hope he'll be useful to you. Thank you, Sir Moses, thank you, bobbed the grateful major, thinking what a good chap the baronet was. Not a bet, replied Sir Moses, chucking up his chin just as if he was in the habit of giving a horse away every other day in the week. Not a bet. Keep him as long as you like, all the season if you please, and send him back when you are done. Then, as if in deprecation of any more thanks, he plied the wine again and gave the major and his harriers in a speech of great gaminosity. The major was divided between mortification at the reduction of the gift into a loan and gratification at the compliment now paid him, but was speedily comforted by the flattering reception his health and the stereotyped speech in which he returned thanks met at the hands of the company. He thought he must be very popular. Then, when they were all well wined and had gathered round the sparkling fire with their coffee or their kiroka in their hands, Sir Moses buttonholed the major with a loud familiar, I'll tell you what, Yamerton, you're a devilish good feller, and there shall be no obligation between us. You shall just give me forty puns for little Bo Peep, and that's making you a present of him, for it's a hundred less than I gave. Oh, that's the way you do it, exclaimed Mr. Smoothly, as if delighted at Sir Moses having dropped upon the right course. Oh, that's the way to do it, repeated he, swinging himself gaily round on his toe, with a loud snap of his finger and thumb in the air. And Sir Moses said it in such a kind, considerate, matter-of-course sort of way, before a company, too, and smoothly clenched it so neatly that our wine-flushed major, acute as he is, hadn't presence of mind to say no. So he was saddled with little Bo Peep, who has already lost one eye from cataract, which is fast going with the other. But see, here comes Solomon, followed by the bumbler and fustian, and the boy from the farm, and we shall soon have the major and Billy, so let us step into Bo Peep's box, and I hear the major's description of the stud. Scarcely have the grooms dispersed the fast-gathering gloom of a November afternoon by lighting the mold candles and the cord-suspended lanterns slung along the ceiling, and began to hiss at the straw, when the major entered, with our friend Billy at his heels. The bumbler and Shaw then put on extra activity, and the stable being presently righted, heads were loosened, water supplied, and the horses excited by Solomon's well-known peregrination to the crushed corn bin. All ears were then pricked, eyes cast back, and hindquarters tucked under to respond gaily to the come-over of the feeder. The late watchful whinnying restlessness is succeeded by gulping, diving, energetic eating. Our friend, having passed his regiment of horses in silent review while the hissing was going on, now exchanges a few confidential words with the stud groom, as if he left everything to him, and then passes upwards to where he started from. Solomon, having plenty to do elsewhere, presently retires, followed by his helpers, and the Major and Billy seat themselves on the bench. After a few puffs and blows of the cheeks and premonitory jerks of the legs, the Major nods an approving, Nice walls, that, to Napoleon the Great, standing opposite, who is the first to look up from his food, being with it as with his work, always in a desperate hurry to begin, and in an equally great one to leave off. Nice walls, that, repeats the Major, nodding again. Yes, it looks like a nice horse, replied Billy, which is really as much as any man can say under the circumstances. That horse should have won the derby in Nobler's year, observed the Major. Only they drugged him the night before starting, and he didn't get half round the course. Which was true enough, only it wasn't owing to any drugging, for he wasn't worth the expense. That horse should be in Leicestershire, observed the Major. He has all the commanding stature requisite to make large fences look small and the smoothest, oiliest action imaginable. Yosh, replied Billy, wondering what pleasure there was in looking at a lot of blankets and hoods upon horses, which was about all he could see. He should be a Melton, observed the Major, still harping on Napoleon. Wasted upon hires, added he. Yosh, replied Billy, not caring where he was. The Major then took a nod at the weaver, who, as if in aid of her master's design, now stood bolt upright, listening, as it were, instead of reeling from side to side. "'That's a sweat mare,' observed the Major, wishing he was rid of her. "'I don't know whether I would rather have her or the horse nap,' which was true enough, though he knew which one he would like to sell to Billy. "'You'll remember the grey, the white,' continued he, looking on at the old stager against the wall. That's the horse I rode with the peer on the castle day, and an undeniable good one he is. 
but knowing that he was not a young man's horse, moreover not wanting to sell him, he returned to Napoleon, whose praises he again sounded considerably. Billy, however, having heard enough about him, and wanting to get into the house to the ladies, drew his attention to Bulldog, now almost enveloped in blankets and straw. But the Major, not feeling inclined to waste any words on him either, replied, "'But he was only a servant's horse.' He, however, spoke handsomely of Golden Drop, declaring he was the fastest trotter in England, perhaps in Europe, perhaps in the world, and would be invaluable to a deductor or any man who wanted to get over the ground. And then, thinking he had said about enough for a beginning, it all at once occurred to him that Billy's feet must be wet. And though our friend asserted most confidently that they were not, as all townsmen do assert who walk about the country in thin soles, the Major persisted in urging him to go in and change which Billy at length reluctantly assented to do. End of chapter 19, read by Ryan Lohner. Chapter 20 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Lohner. Ask Mama or the Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 20. Cards for a spread. The Major's menage, not admitting of two such great events as a hunt and a dinner party taking place on the same day, and market interfering as well, the hunt again had to be postponed to the interests of the table. Such an event as a distinguished stranger, the friend of an earl too, coming into the country could not but excite convivial expectations, and it would ill become a master of hounds and a mother of daughters not to parade the acquisition. Still, raising a party under such circumstances required a good deal of tact and consideration, care, of course, being taken not to introduce any matrimonial competitor, at the same time to make the gathering sufficiently grand, and to include a good bellman or two to proclaim its splendor over the country. The major, like a country member with his constituents, was somewhat hampered with his hounds, not being able to ask exactly who he liked for fear of being hauled over the coals. These warned off the land of those who might think they ought to have been included, and altogether the party required a good deal of management. Inclination in these matters is not of so much moment, it being no uncommon thing in the country for people to abuse each other right well one day and dine together the next. The gap which the Major prized so much with his hounds he strongly objected to with his parties. Stopping gaps, indeed sending out invitations at all in the country so as not to look like stopping gaps, requires circumspection where people seem to have nothing whatever to do but to note their neighbor's movements. Let anyone watch the progress of an important trial, one for murder, say, and mark the wonderful way in which country people come forward long after the event to depose to facts that one would imagine would never have been noticed. The passing of a man with a cow, for instance, just as they dropped their noses upon their bacon plates, the suspension of payment by their clock on that morning, or the post messenger being a few minutes late with the letters on that day, and so on. What, then, is there to prevent people from laying that and that together, where John met James or Michael saw Mary, so as to be able to calculate whether they were included in the first, second, or third batch of invitations? Townspeople escape this difficulty, as also the equally disagreeable one of having it known whether their previous engagements are real or imaginary, but then, on the other hand, they have the inconvenience of feeling certain that as sure as ever they issue cards for a certain day, everyone else will be seized with a mania for giving dinners on the same one. No one can have an idea of the extent of London hospitality who has not attempted to give a dinner there. Still, it is a difficult world to please, even in the matter of mastication, for some people who abuse you if you don't ask them to dine abuse you quite as much if you do. Take the Reverend Mr. Tightlace, the rector, and his excellent lady, for instance. Tightlace was always complaining, at least observing that the Yammertons never asked them to dine, wondered why the Yammertons never asked them to dine, was very odd they never asked him to dine, and yet, when Miss Yammerton's best copperplate handwriting appeared on the highly must best cream laid satin notepaper requesting etc., Tightlace pretended to be quite put out at the idea of having to go to meet that wild sporting youth, who he'd be bound to say could talk of nothing but hunting. Indeed, having most reluctantly accepted the invitation, he found it necessary to cram for the occasion and having borrowed a copy of that veteran volume, The British Sportsman, he read up all the long chapter on racing and hunting, how to prepare a horse for a hunting match or plate, directions for riding a hunting match or plate, of hunting the hare, and hunting the fox, 
with directions for the choice of a hunter and the management of a hunter, part of which latter consisted in putting him to grass between May and Bartholomew Tide, and comforting his stomach before going out to hunt with toasted bread and wine, or toasted bread and ale, and other valuable information of that sort, all of which Tite lay stored in his mind for future use, thinking to reduce his great intellect to the level of Billy's capacity. Mr. and Mrs. Rocket Larkspur of Ninny and Green were also successfully angled for and caught. Indeed, Mrs. Larkspur would have been much disappointed if they had not been invited, for she had heard of Billy's elegant appearance from her maid, and being an aspiring lady had a great desire to cultivate an acquaintance with high life, in which Billy evidently moved. Rocket was a good, slow sort of gentleman farmer, quite a contrast to his fast wife, who was all fire, bustle, and animation, wanting to manage everybody's house and affairs for them. He had married her, it was supposed, out of sheer submission, because she had made a dead set at him and would not apparently be said nay to. It is a difficult thing to maneuver a determined woman in the country, where your habits are known and they can assail you at all points. Church, streets, fields, roads, lanes, all are open to them. Or they can even get into your house under plea of a charity subscription if needs be. Mr. and Mrs. Dotherington of Goney Garth were invited to do the morning post department, and because there was no fear of Miss Dotherington, who was very amiable, interfering with Art Billy, Mrs. Dotherington's other forte, besides propagating parties, consisted in angling for legacies, and she was continually on the trot looking after or killing people from whom she had or fancied she had expectations. I've just been to see poor Mrs. Snuff, she would say, drawing a long face. She's looking wretchedly ill, poor thing, fear she's not long for this world. Or with a grin, I suppose you've heard old Mr. Weasington has had another attack in the night which nearly carried him off. Nothing pleased her so much as being told that anyone for whom she had expectations was on the wane. She could ill conceal her satisfaction. So far, so good. The party now numbered twelve, six of themselves and six strangers, and nobody to interfere with fine Billy. The question then arose whether to ask the Blurkinses or the Fairies or the Crickletons, and this caused an anxious deliberation. Blurkins was a landowner over whose property the Major frequently hunted, but then, on the other hand, he was a most disagreeable person, who would be sure to tread upon everybody's corns before the evening was over. Indeed, the Blurkins family, like noxious vermin, would seem to have been sent into the world for some inscrutable purpose, their mission apparently being to take the conceit out of people by telling them home truths. Lord bless us, how old you have got. Why, you've lost a front tooth. I declare I shouldn't have known you. Or, your nose and your chin have gotten to fearful proximity, was the sort of salute Blurkins would give an acquaintance after an absence. Or, if the Feather Bedfordshire Gazette or the Hedham and Holdhamshire Herald had an unflattering paragraph respecting a party's interference at the recent elections or on any other subject, Blurkins was the man who would bring it under his notice. That's a, that's see what they say about you, he would say, coming up in the newsroom with the paper neatly folded to the paragraph and presenting it to him. The fairies of Yarrowcourt were the most producible people, but then Miss was a beauty who would even presume to vie with the Yammertons, and they could not ask the old people without her. Besides which, it had transpired that a large deal box, carefully covered with glazed canvas, had recently arrived at the Rosedale station, which it was strongly suspected contained a new dinner dress for Madame Glaces in Hanover Street and it would never do to let her sport it at Yammerton Grange against their girls rather soiled, but still by candlelight extremely passable, watered silk ones. So, after due deliberation, the fairies were rejected. The Crickleton's claims were then taken into consideration. Crick was the son of Crickleton, the late eminent chiropodist of Bolton Row, whom many of our readers will remember parading about London on his piebald pony with a groom in a yellow coat, red plush breeches, and boots, and the present Crickleton was now what he called seeking repose in the country, which in his opinion consisted in setting all his neighbors by the ears. He rented Lavender Lodge and Farm, and being a thorough cockney with a great inclination for exposing his ignorance both in the sporting and farming way, our knowing major was making rather a good thing of him. At first there was a little rivalry between them as to which was the greater man, Crickleton affirming that his father might have been knighted, the major replying that as long as he wasn't knighted it made no matter. The major, however, finding it his interest to humor his consequence, composed matters by always taking in Mrs. Crickleton, a compliment that Crick returned by taking in Mrs. Yammerton. Though the major used when in the running down track to laugh at the idea of a knight's son claiming precedence, yet when on the running up one he used to intimate that his friend's father might have been knighted and even sometimes assigned the honor to his friend himself. So he talked of him to our Billy. 
the usual preponderating influence setting in in favor of acceptances, our host and hostess were obliged to play their remaining card with caution. There were two sets of people with equal claims, the Impolos of Buckup Hill and the Basky Fields of Lingworth Lawn. The Impolos, if anything, having the prior claim inasmuch as the Yammertons had dined with them last. But then, on the other hand, there was a very forward young Impolo whom they couldn't accommodate. That is to say, didn't want to have. While, as regarded the Basky Fields, Old Basky and Crickledon were at daggers drawn about a sow Basky had sold him, and they would very likely get to loggerheads about it during the evening. A plan of the table was drawn up to see if it was possible to separate them sufficiently, supposing people would only have the sense to go to their right places, but it was found to be impracticable to do justice to their consequence and preserve the peace as well. So the idea of having the Basky Fields was obliged to be relinquished. This delay was fatal to the Impolos, for John Giles, their man of all work, having seen Solomon scouring the country on horseback with a basket in search of superfluous poultry, had reported the forthcoming grand spread at the Grange to his missus, and after waiting patiently for an invitation, it at length came so late as to be an evident convenience, which they wouldn't submit to. So, after taking a liberal allowance of time to answer, in order to prevent the Ammertons from playing the same base trick upon anyone else, they declined in a stiff, non-reason-assigning note. This was the first check to the hitherto prosperous current of events, and showed our sagacious friends that the time was past for stopping gaps with family people, and threw them on the other resources of the district. The usual bachelor stopgaps of the neighborhood were Tom Hetherington of Bearbinder Park and Jimmy Jarperson of Fothergill Burn, both of whom had their disqualifications, Jarperson's being an acute, nerve-shaking sort of laugh that set everyone's teeth on edge who heard it, and earned for him the title of the Laughing Hyena. The other's misfortune being that he was only what may be called an intermediate gentleman. That is to say, he could act the gentleman up to a pint of wine or so, after which quantity nature gradually asserted her supremacy, and he became himself again. Our friend Paul Stradler of Hinton at one time had had the call of them both, but the major, considering that Stradler had not used due diligence in the matter of Golden Drop, was not inclined to have him. Besides which, Stradler required a bed, which the major was not disposed to yield. A bed involving a breakfast and perhaps a stall for his horse, to say nothing of an out-of-place groom Stradler occasionally adopted, and who could eat as much as any two men. So the Laughing Hyena and Hetherington were selected. And now, gentle reader, if you will have the kindness to tell them off on your fingers as we call them over, we will see if we have got a country and as many as ever the Major can cram into his dining room. Please count. Major, Mrs., three Mrs. Yammerton, and Fine Billy. Six. The Reverend Mr. and Mrs. Tightlace. Two. Mr. and Mrs. Rocket Larkspur, two. Mrs. and Miss Dotherington, two. Mr. and Mrs. Blurkins, two. Mr. and Mrs. Crickleton, two. The Hyena and Hetherington, two. All right, eighteen. Fourteen for dining room chairs and four for bedroom ones. There are but twelve champagne needle cases, but the deficiency is supplied by half a dozen ale glasses at the low end of the table, which the Major says will never be seen. So now, if you please, we will go and dress, dinner being sharp six, recollect. End of chapter 20, read by Ryan Loner. Chapter 21 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. June 20th, 2021, Westford, Massachusetts. Ask Mama, or the Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 21. The Gathering, the Grand Spread Itself. If a dinner party in town, with all the aids and appliances of sham butlers, job cooks, area sneak entrees, and extraneous confectionery causes confusion in an establishment. How much more so must a party in the country, where in addition to the guests, their servants, their horses, and their carriages are to be accommodated? What a turning out and putting up and makeshifting is there! What a grumbling and growling and not getting into the best stable, or at not having the state vehicle put into the coach house! If Solomon had not combined the wisdom of his namesake with the patience of Job, he would have succumbed to the pressure from without. As it was, he kept persevering on until having got the last Shandry Dan deposited under the hay house. 
he had just time to slip upstairs to clean himself and be ready to wait at dinner. But what a commotion the party makes in the kitchen. Everybody is in a state of stew, from the gallant Betty Bone down to the Heinz little girl from Bonnie Riggs' farm, whom they have got in for the occasion. Nor do their anxieties end with the dishing up of the dinner, for no sooner is it dispatched than that scarcely less onerous entertainment, the supper for the servants, has to be provided. Then comes the coffee, then the tea, then the tray, and then the carriage is wanted, then good night, good night, good night, most agreeable evening, no idea it was so late, and getting away. But the heat and steam and vapor of the kitchen overpowers us, and we gladly seek refuge in the newly done-up drawing room. In it, behold the major, the major in all the glory of the Yammerton Harrier uniform, a myrtle green coat with a gold embroidered hair on the myrtle green velvet collar, and puss with her ears well back striding away over a dead gold surface, and with a raised burnished rim of a button, a nicely washed, stiffly starched white vest with a yellow silk one underneath, black shorts, black silk stockings, and patent leather pumps. He has told off his very rare and singularly fine port wine, his prime old Madeira, matured in the West Indies, his nutty sherry, and excellently flavored claret, all recently bought at the auction mart, not forgetting the ginger pop like champagne, allowing the liberal measure of a pint for each person of the latter and he is now trying to cool himself down into the easy-minded, unconcerned, everyday dinner-giving host. Mrs. Yammerton, too, on whom devolves the care of the wax and the moderators, is here superintending her department. Seeing that the hearth is properly swept, and distributing the punches and posts, and ask mamas judiciously over the fine variegated table cover, she is dressed in a rich silvery gray, with a sort of thing like a silver cow tie, with full tassels, twisted and twined serpent-like into her full, slightly streaked dark hair. The illumination being complete, she seats herself fan in hand on the sofa, and a solemn pause ensues, broken only by Billy's and Monsieur's meanderings overhead and the keen whistle of the November wind careering among the hollies and evergreens which the major keeps interpreting into wheels. Then his wife and he seek to relieve the suspense of the moment by speculating on who will come first. Those nasty tight laces for a guinea, observed the major, polishing his nails while Mrs. Yammerton predicted the larkspurs. No, the tights, reiterated the major, jingling his silver. Tights always come first, thinks to catch one unprepared. At length the furious bark of the inhospitable terrier, who really seemed as if he would eat horses, vehicle, visitors, and all, was followed by a quick grind up to the door, and such a pull at the bell as made the major fear would cause it to suspend payment for good. Ring, 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 it went, as if it was never going to stop. Pulled the bell out of the socket for a guinea, exclaimed the major, listening for the letting down of steps, iron or recessed. Recessed had it. Mrs. D., said the major, figuring her old landelot in his mind. Ladies, evidently, assented Mrs. Yammerton, as the rustle of silks on their way to the put-up-to-right sanctum sounded past the drawing-room door. Major then began speculating as to whether they would get announced before another arrival took place or not. Presently, a renewed rustle was succeeded by the now yellow-legged, brown-backed bumbler, throwing open the door and exclaiming in a stentorian voice as if he thought his master and mistress had turned suddenly deaf. Mrs. and Miss Dotherington, and in an instant, the four were hugging and grinning and pump-handling each other's arms as if they were going into ecstasies, 
Mrs. Dotherington interlarding her gymnastics with Mrs. Yammerton, with sly squeezes of the hand, suited to sotto voce observations not intended for the major's ears of, So happy to hear it. So glad to congratulate you. So nice. And with an inquisitive whisper of, Which is it? Which is it? Do tell me. Wow, 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 went the clamorous fury again. Ring, 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 went the aggravated bell, half drowning Mrs. Yammerton's impressive, Oh dear, nothing of the sort, nothing of the sort, only a fox-hunting acquaintance of the majors, only a fox-hunting acquaintance of the majors. And then the major came to renew his affectionate embraces, with inquiries about the night and the looks of the moon. Was it hazy, or was it clear, or how was it? Mr. and Mrs. Rocket Larkspur, exclaimed the bumbler, following up the keynote in which he had pitched his first announcement, and forthwith the hugging and grinning was resumed with the newcomers, Mrs. Larkspur presently leading Mrs. Yammerton off sofa words in order to poke her inquiries unheard by the major, who was now opening a turnip dialogue with Mr. Rocket. Yellow bullocks, purple tops, and so on. Well, tell me, which is it? ejaculated Mrs. Rocket Larkspur, looking earnestly in Mrs. Yammerton's expressive eyes. Which is it? repeated she, in a determined sort of take-no-denial tone. Oh, dear, nothing of the sort, nothing of the sort, I assure you, whispered Mrs. Yammerton anxiously, well knowing the danger of hallowing before you are out of the wood. Oh, tell me, tell me, whispered Mrs. Rocket coaxingly. I am not like Mrs. Blank, um, there, looking at Mrs. Dotherington, who would blab it all over the country. Really, I have nothing to tell, replied Mrs. Yammerton serenely. Why do you mean to say he's not after the Blankums? demanded Mrs. Rocket eagerly. I don't know what you mean, laughed Mrs. Yammerton. Bow, wow, 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 wow went the terrier again, giving Mrs. Yammerton an excuse for sidling off to Mrs. Um, who with her daughter were lost in admiration at a silk floss cockatoo perched on an orange tree, the production of Miss Flora. Oh, it was so beautiful. Oh, what a love of a screen it would make. What would she give if her Margaret could do such work? Inwardly thinking how much better Margaret was employed making her own. We will not say what. Bow, wow, 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 went Fury again, the proceeds of this bark being Mr. and Mrs. Tightlace, who now entered, the former hoping they weren't late, as he smirked and smiled and looked round for the youth on whom he had to vent his British sportsman knowledge, the latter speedily drawing Mrs. Yammerton aside to the ladies know what, but it was a no-go again. Mrs. Yammerton really didn't know what Mrs. Tightlace meant. No, she really didn't. Nor did Mrs. Tightlace's assurance that it was the talk of the country afford any clue to her meaning. But Mrs. Tightlace's large miniature brooch being luckily loose, Mrs. Yammerton essayed to fasten it, which afforded her an opportunity of bursting into transports of delight at its beauty mingled with exclamations as to its wonderful likeness to Mr. T, though in reality she was looking at Mrs. Tithlate's berth to see whether it was machinery lace or real. Then the grand rush took place, and Fury's throat seemed wholly inadequate to the occasion, as first Blurkin's Brougham, then Jasperson's Gig, then the Corncutter's Caliache, and lastly Hetherington's dog cart whisked up to the door, causing a meeting of the highly decorated watered silks of the house and the hooded enveloped visitors hurrying through the passage to the cloakroom. By the time the young ladies had made their obeisances and got congratulated on their looks, and the now metamorphosed visitors came trooping in, flourishing their laced kerchiefs and flattening their chapeau macani as they entered, then the full chorus of conversation was established. Moon, hounds, turnips, horses. Parliament with the usual, I see by the papers that Her Majesty is gone to Osborne, or 
I see by the papers that the comet is coming. While Mrs. Rocket Luxburg draws Miss Yammerton aside to try what she can fish out of her. But here comes fine Billy. And if ever Hero realized an author's description of him, assuredly it is our friend. For he sidles as unconcernedly into the room as he would into a club or casino, with all the dreamy listlessness of a thorough exquisite, apparently unconscious of any change having taken place in the party. But if Billy is unconscious of the presence of strangers, his host is not, and forthwith he inducts him into their acquaintance, Hetheringtons, hyenas, and all. It is doubtless very flattering of great people to vote all the little ones one of us, and not to introduce them to anybody. But we take leave to say that society is considerably improved by a judicious presentation. We talk of our advanced civilization, but manners are not nearly so good or so at ease setting as they were with the last generation of apparently stiffer, but in reality easier, more affable gentlemen of the old school. But what a note of admiration our Billy is! How gloriously he is attired! His natural curling hair, how gracefully it flows! His elliptic collar, how faultlessly it stands! His cravat, how correct! His shirt, how wonderfully fine! And oh, how happy he must be with such splendid, sparkling diamond studs! Such beautiful amethyst buttons at his wrists! And such a love of a chain disporting itself over his richly embroidered bloodstone buttoned vest! Altogether, such a first-class swell is rarely seen beyond the bills of mortality. He looks as if he ought to be kept under a glass shade, but here comes the bumbler, and now for the agony of the entertainment. The major, who for the last few minutes has been fidgeting about pairing parties off according to written program he has in his waistcoat pocket, has just time to assign Billy to Mrs. Rocket Lockspur to assuage her anguish at not being taken in before Mrs. Crickleton, when the bumbler's half-fledged voice is heard proclaiming at its utmost altitude, Denar as sir! Then there is such a bobbing and bowing and backing of chairs and such inward congratulations that the foreign half hour is over and hopes from some that they may not get next to the fire while others wish to be there though the Major could not, perhaps, manage to get 20,000 men out of Hyde Park, he can, nevertheless, maneuver a party out of his drawing room into his dining room, and forthwith he led the way, with Mrs. Crickleton under his arm, trusting to the real winding off right at the end, and right it most likely would have wound off had not the leg protruding bumbler's tongue buckle caught the balloon-like amplitude of Mrs. Rocket Larkspur's dress and caused a slight stoppage in the passage, during which time two couples slipped past and so deranged the entire order of the table. However, there was no great harm done as far as Mrs. Larkspur's consequence was concerned, for she got next to Mr. Tightlace, with Mr. Pringle between her and Miss Yammerton, whom Mrs. Larkspur had just got to admit that she wouldn't mind being Mrs. P. And, Miss, having been thus confidential, Mrs. was inclined, partly out of gratitude, partly perhaps because she couldn't help it, to befriend her. She was a great mouser and would promote the most forlorn hope sooner than not be doing. We are now in the dining room, and very smart everything is. In the center of the table, of course, stands the Yammerton Testimonial, a savory, chaste, silver-plated candelabrum with six branches all lighted up and an ornamental center flower basket decorated with evergreens and winter roses presented to our friend on his completing his five-and-twentieth year as Master of Harriers and in gratitude for the unparalleled sport he had uniformly shown the subscribers. Testimonializing has become quite a mania since the Major got his, and no one can say whose turn it may be next. It is not everybody who, like Mr. Daniel Whittle Harvey with the police force one, can nip them in the bud, 
but Inspector Field, we think, might usefully combine testimonial detecting with his other secret services. He would have plenty to do, especially in the provinces. Indeed, London does not seem to be exempt from the mania, if we may judge by Davis, the Queen's huntsman's recent attempt to avert the intended honour, neatly informing the projectors that their continuing to meet him in the hunting field would be the best proof of their approbation of his conduct. However, the Major got his testimonial, and there it stands, flanked by two pretty imitation Dresden vases decorated with flowers and evergreens also. And now the company being at length seated, and Grace said, the reeking covers are removed from the hair and mock turtle terrines, and the confusion of tongues gradually subsides into sip-sip-sipping of soup. And now Jarperson having told his newly caught footman groom to get him hare soup instead of mock turtle, the lad takes the plate of the latter up to the tureen of the former, and his master gets a mixture of both, which he thinks is very good. And now the nutty sherry comes round, which the major introduces with a stuttering exordium that would induce anyone who didn't know him to suppose it costs at least 80 shillings, a dozen instead of 36 shillings, bottles included, and this being sipped and smacked and pronounced excellent. Two fishes replace the soups, and the banquet proceeds, Mr. Tightlace trying to poke his sporting knowledge at Billy between heats, but without success, the commoner not rising at the bait, indeed rather shirking it. The long-necked green bottle of what the bumbler calls blue cellus then goes its rounds, and the first qualms of hunger being appeased, the gentlemen are more inclined to talk and listen to the luncheon dining ladies. Mrs. Rocket Larkspur has been waiting most anxiously for Billy's last mouthful in order to interrogate him as well as to London fashion as to his opinions of the Miss Ums. Of course, with Miss Um sitting just below Billy, the latter must be done through a medium of the former, so she leads off upon London. She supposed he'd been very gay in London. Yarst, drawled Billy in true dandified style, drawing his napkin across his lips as he spoke. Mrs. Rocket wasn't so young as she had been, and Billy was too young to take up with what he profanely called old ladies. He'd live at the West End, she supposed. Yars, replied Billy, feeling his amplified tie. Did he know Billiter Square? Yars, replied he, running his ringed fingers down his studs. Was it fashionable? asked Mrs. Rocket. She had a cousin lived there who had asked her to go and see her. Yars, I should say it is, drawled Billy, and now playing with a bunch of trinkets, a gold miniature pistol, a pearl and diamond studded locket, a gold pencil case, and a white cornelian heart suspended to his watch change. Yars, I should say it is, repeating he, adding, not so fashionable as Belgrave. Excuse me, sir, interrupted Monsieur Jean Rougier from behind his master's chair. Excuse me, is it no fashionable, sir? Is it not near the palace de part of Hyde, sir? Put down among them base mechanics in the east, beyond the mansion house, in fact? Oh, ah, yours, true, replied Billy, not knowing where it was, but presuming from Mrs. Larkspur's inquiry that it was some newly sprung up square on one of the western horns of the metropolis. Taking advantage of the interruption, Mr. Tightlace again essayed to edge in his British sportsman knowledge, beginning with an inquiry if the Earl of Ladythorn had a good set of dogs this season. But the bumbler soon cut short the thread of his discourse by presenting a bottle of brisk gooseberry at his ear. The fizzing stuff then went quickly round, taxing the ingenuity of the drinkers to maneuver the frothy fluid out of their needle-case-shaped glasses. Then, as conversation was beginning to be restored, the door suddenly flew open to a general rush of returning servants. There was Solomon carrying a sirloin of beef, 
followed by Mr. Crickleton's gaudy red and yellow young man with a boiled turkey, who in turn was succeeded by Mr. Rocket Larkspur's hobbledehoy with a ham and Mr. Tightlaces with a stew. Pâtés and cotelettes and minces and messes followed in quick succession, and these having taken their seats immediately vacate them for the Chiltern hundreds of the hand. A shoal of vegetables and sundries alight on the side table, and the feast seems fairly under way. But see, somehow it prospers not. People stop short at the second or third mouthful and lay down their knives and forks as if they had had quite enough. Patties and cutlets and sausages and side dishes all share the same fate. Take round the champagne, says the major with an air thinking to retrieve the character of his kitchen with the solids. The juicy roast beef and delicate white turkey with inviting green stulling and rich red ham and turnip and carrot adorned beef stew then made their progresses. But the same fate attends them also. People stop at the second or third mouthful. Some send their plates away slyly and ask for a little of a different dish to what they have been eating, or rather tasting. That, however, shares the same fate. Take round the champagne, again says the major, trying what another cheerer would do. Then he invites the turkey eaters, or leavers rather, to eat beef, and the beef eaters, or leavers, to eat turkey, but they all decline with a thoroughly satisfied no more for me sort of shake of the head. Take away, at length, says the major with an air of disgust, following the order with an invitation to Mrs. Rocket Larkspur to take wine. The guests follow the host's example, and a momentary rally of liveliness ensues. Mrs. Rocket Larkspur and Mr. Tightlace contend for fine Billy's ear. But Miss Yammerton interposes with a sly whisper, supersedes them both. Mrs. Rocket construes that accordingly. A gentle chirp of conversation is presently established, interspersed with heavy demands upon the bread basket by the gentlemen. Presently, the door is thrown open and a grand procession of sweets enters. Jellies, blancmange, open tarts, shut tarts, meringues, plum pudding, macaroni, black puddings. We know not what besides, and the funds of conviviality again look up. The rally is, however, but of momentary duration. The same evil genius that awaited on the second course seems to attend on the third. People stop at the second or third mouthful and send away the undiminished plate slyly as before. Some venture on other dishes, but the result is the same. The plate vanishes with its contents. There is, however, a great run upon the cheese, Cheshire and Gloucester, and the dessert suffers severely. All the make-weight dishes even disappear, and when the gentlemen rejoin the ladies in the drawing room, they attack the tea as if they had not had any dinner. At length, a most agreeable evening is got through, and as each group whisks away, there is a general exclamation of, what a most extraordinary taste of everything had of blank. What do you think, gentle reader? Can't guess, can't you? What do you think, Mrs. Brown? What do you think, Mrs. Jones? What do you think, Mrs. Robinson? What? None of you able to guess, and yet everybody at table hit off directly. All give it up, Brown, Jones, and Robinson? Yes, yes, yes. Well then, we'll tell you. Everything tasted of castor oil. Castor oil, exclaims Mrs. Brown. Castor oil? Sheeks Mrs. Jones. Castor oil, shudders Mrs. Robinson. Oh, how nasty! But how came it there? asked Mrs. Brown. We'll tell you that, too. The Major's famous cow strawberry cream's calf was ill, and they had tapped a pint of fine coal drawn for it, which Monsieur Jean Rogier happened to upset, just mopped it up with his napkin, and chucking it away, it was speedily adopted by the Heinz little girl in charge of the plates and dishes, 
who imparted a most liberal castor oil flavor to everything she touched. And that entertainment is now known by the name of Castor Oil Dinner. End of chapter 21. Chapter 22 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Ballard. Ask Mama or The Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. A Hunting Morning, Unkenneling. What a commotion there was in the house the next morning! As great a disturbance as if the major had been going to hunt an African lion, a royal Bengal tiger, or a bison itself. Ring, 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 ring went one bell, tinkle, tinkle, tinkle went another, ring, ring, ring went the first again, followed by exclamations of, There's Master's Bell again, with such a running downstairs and such a getting up again. Master wanted this. Master wanted that. Master had carried away the buttons at his knees. Master wanted his other pair of white, what do you call em's, not cords, but moleskins, that treacherous material being much in vogue among masters of harriers. Then Master's boots wouldn't do. He wanted his last pair, not the newly footed ones, and they were on the trees. And the bumbler was busy in the stable, and Betty Bone could not skin the trees, and altogether there was a terrible hubbub in the house. His overnight exertions, though coupled with the castor-oil catastrophe, seemed to have abated none of his ardor in pursuit of the hare. Meanwhile, our little dandy, Billy, lay tumbling and tossing in bed, listening to the dread preparations, wishing he could devise an excuse for declining to join him. The recollections of his bumps and his jumps and his falls arose vividly before him, and he would fain have said no to any more. He felt certain that the Major was going to give him a startler, more dreadful perhaps than those he had had with his lordship. Would that he was well out of it! What pleasure could there be in galloping after an animal they could shoot? In the midst of these reflections, Monsieur Rosier entered the apartment and threw further light on the matter by opening the shutters. "'You saw get up, sir, and pursue the vile beast of the woods. De Major is a goin' to hunt.' "'Ye arse,' replied Billy, turning over. "'I saw get out your habit vared, your green coat, that is to say.' "'No, no,' roared Billy. "'The red, the red!' "'De red!' exclaimed Monsieur in astonishment. De red not for de soup dogs. You only hunt bold Reynard in de red. Oh, yes, you do, retorted Billy. Didn't the major come to castle in red? Because he came to hunt de fox, replied Monsieur. If he had come for to hunt poor puss, he would have had on his green or his gray or his some other color. Billy now saw the difference, and his mortification increased. "'Well, I'll breakfast in red at all events,' said he, determined to have that pleasure. "'Well, sir, you can pleasure yourself in that matter, but it's so much ridicule if you pursued a puss in it.' "'But why not?' asked Billy. "'Hunting's hunting all the world over.' "'I cannot tell you why, sir, but it is not etiquette, and I, as a professor of garniture, toggery what you call, so lose cast with my comrades if I lived with a me, Lord Vot hunted poor puss in the pink. Huh, grunted Billy, bouncing out of bed, thinking what a bore it was paying a man for being his master. He then commenced the operations of the occasion, and with the aid of Monsieur was presently attired in the dread costume. He then clonk, clonk, clonked down the stairs with his jersey-patterned spurs, toes well out to clear the steps, most heartily wishing he was clonking up again on his return from the hunt. Monsieur was right. The major is in his myrtle green coat, a coat not built after the fashion of the scanty swallow-tailed red in which he appears at page 65 of this agreeable work 
but with the more liberal allowance of cloth peculiar to the period in which we live. A loosely hanging garment, and not a straight waistcoat, in fact a fashion very much in favor of bunglers, seeing that anybody can make a sack while it takes a tailor to make a coat. The majors cost him about two pounds five, the cloth having been purchased at a clothier's and made up at home by a three-shilling-a-day man and his meat. We laugh at the ladies for liking to be cheated by their milliners, but young gentlemen are quite as accommodating to their tailors. Let any man of forty look at his tailor's bill when he was twenty and see what a liberality of innocence it displays and that not only in matters of taste and fashion, which are the legitimate loopholes of extortion, but in the sober articles of ordinary requirement. We saw a once celebrated West End tailor's bill the other day, in which a plain black coat was made to figure in the following magniloquent item. A superfine black cloth coat, lapels sewed on. We wonder if they are usually pinned or glued lapels sewed on cloth collar cotton sleeve linings velvet hand facings most likely cotton too embossed edges and fine woven buttons how much does the reader think four guineas four pound ten five guineas no five pound eighteen and sixpence an article that our own excellent tailor supplies for three pounds fifteen in a tailor's case that was recently tried, a party swore that fourteen guineas was a fair price for a taglioni, when everybody knows that they are to be had for less than four. But boys will be boys to the end of the chapter, so let us return to our sporting major. He is not so happy in his nether garments as he is in his upper ones. Indeed, he has on the same boots and moleskins that Leech drew him in at Tantivy Castle for these lower habiliments are not so easy of accomplishment in the country as coats, and though most people have tried them there, few wear them out. They are always so ugly and unbecoming. As, however, our major doesn't often compare his with town-made ones, he struts about in the comfortable belief that they are all right, very smart. He is now in a terrible stew, and has been backwards and forwards between the house and the stable, and in and out of the kennel, and has called Solomon repeatedly from his work to give him further instructions, and further instructions still, until the major has about confused himself and everybody about him. As soon as ever he heard by his tramp overhead that Billy had got into his boots, he went to the bottom of the stairs and halloed along the passage toward the kitchen. Betty. Betty, Betty, send in breakfast as soon as ever Mr. Pringle comes down. Ah, there is the major, observed Monsieur, pausing from Billy's hair arranging to listen. Him kick up the devil's own dust on a hunting morning. What's happened him? asked Billy. Don't know, but Von would think he was going to storm a city. Take Sebastopol himself, replied Monsieur, shrugging his broad shoulders. He then resumed his valeting's operations and crowned the whole by putting Billy into his green cutaway without giving him even a peep of the pink. Meanwhile, Mrs. Yammerton has been holding a court of inquiry into the kitchen and larder as to the extent of the overnight mischief, smelling at this dish and that, criticizing the spoons, and subjecting each castor-oily offender to severe ablution in boiling water. Of course, no one can tell in whose hands the bottle of cold drawn had come in two, but Monsieur was too good a judge to know anything about it, so as the mischief couldn't be repaired, it was no use bewailing it farther than to make a knot in her mind to be more careful of such dangerous commodities in future. Betty Bone had everything, tea, coffee, bread, cakes, eggs, ham, fried so as to hide the spurious flavor, honey, jam, and company, ready for Miss Benson, who had been impressed into the carrying service, vice the bumbler turned whip, to take in as soon as Mr. Pringle descended, a fact that was announced to the household by the Major's uproarious greeting of him in the passage. He was overjoyed to see him. He hoped he was none the worse for his overnight festivities, and without waiting for an answer to that, he was delighted to say that it was a fine hunting morning, and as far as human judgment could form an opinion, a good scenting one. 
but after five and thirty years' experience as a master of harriers, he could conscientiously say that there was nothing so doubtful or ticklish as scent, and he made no doubt Mr. Pringle's experience would confirm his own. That many days when they had might expect it to be first-rate, it was bad, and many days when they might expect it to be bad, it was first-rate. To all which accumulated infliction, Billy replied with his usual imperturbable yars, and passed on to the more agreeable occupation of greeting the young ladies in the dining-room. Very glad they all were to see him as he shook hands with all three. The major, however, was not to be put off that way and as he could not get Billy to talk about hunting, he drew his attention to breakfast, observing that they had a goodish trot before them, and that punctuality was the politeness of princes. Saying which, he sat down, laying his great gold watch open on a plate beside him, so that its noisy ticking might remind Billy of what they had to do. The major couldn't make it out how it was that the souls of the young men in the present day are so difficult to inflame about hunting. Here was he, turned of blank, and as eager in the pursuit as ever. Must be that they smoke all their energies out, thought he, and then applied himself vigorously to his tea and toast, looking up every now and then with irate looks at his wife and daughters, whose volubility greatly retarded Billy's breakfast proceedings. He nevertheless made sundry efforts to edge in a hunting conversation himself, observing that Mr. Pringle mustn't expect such an establishment as the peers, or perhaps many that he was accustomed to, that they would have rather a shortish pack out, which would enable them to take the field again at an early day, and so on, all of which Billy received with the most provoking indifference, making the major wish he mightn't be a regular crasher, who cared for nothing but riding. At length, tea, toast, eggs, ham, jam, all had been successively taxed, the major closed and pocketed his noisy watch, and the doomed youth rose to perform the dread penance with the pack. Goodbyes, good mornings, hope you'll have good sport, followed his bowing, spur-clanking exit from the room. A loud crack of the major's hammer-headed whip now announced their arrival in the stable-yard, which was at once a signal for the hounds to raise a merry cry, and for the stablemen to loosen their horses' heads from the pillar reins. It also brought a bevy of caps and curl-papers to the back windows of the house to see the young earl, for so Rogier had assured him that his master was heir to the earldom of Lady Thorn, Mount. At a second crack of the whip, the stable door flew open, and as a shirt-sleeved lad receded, the grey-headed, green-coated sage Solomon advanced, leading forth the sleek, well-tended, well-coddled Napoleon the Great. Amid the various offices filled by this Matthews at home of a servant, there was none perhaps in which he looked better or more natural than in that of a huntsman. Short, spare, neat, with a bright black eye, contrasting with the sobered hue of his thin gray hair, no one would suppose that the careless little yellow and brown liveried coachman of the previous night was the trim, neatly booted, neatly tied huntsman now raising his cap to the richest commoner in England and his great master Major Yammerton, major of the Feather Bedfordshire Militia, master of harriers, and expectant magistrate well solomon said the major acknowledging his salute as though it was their first meeting of the morning well solomon what do you think of the day well sir i think the day is well enough replied solomon who was no waster of words i think so too said the major drawing on his clean doeskin gloves the pent-up hounds then raised another cry that's pretty exclaimed the major listening that's beautiful added he like an enthusiastic admirer of music at the opera imperturbable billy spoke not perhaps you'd like to see them unkenneled said the major thinking to begin with the first act of the drama yars replied billy feeling safe as long as he was on foot 
The major then led the way through a henhouse looking door into a little green courtyard separated by peeled larch palings from a flagged one beyond, in which the expectant pack were now jumping and frisking and capering in every species of wild delight. Ah, you beauties, exclaimed the major, again cracking his whip. He then paused, thinking there would surely be a little praise. But no, Billy just looked at them as if he would at a pen full of stock at a cattle show. But beauties, aren't they? stuttered the major. Yars, replied Billy, thinking they were prettier than the great lounging, slouching foxhounds. Capital hounds, observed the major. No response from Billy. Undeniable b -b blood, continued our friend. No response again. F -f Foxhounds on m -m miniature, observed the major. Yars, replied Billy, who understood that. Lovely, 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 there's a beautiful bitch, continued the major, pointing to a richly pied one that began frolicking to his call. Bracelet, bracelet, bracelet hallowed he to another pretty bitch that pure sir dashwood king's blood just the right size for a harrier shouldn't be too large i hold with the so so somerville continued the major waxing warm either with his subject or at billy's indifference that one should a d d difference hound for every chase select with judgment nor the timorous hare or or match destroy but leave that vile offence to the mean murderous coursing crew intent on blood and spoil yars replied billy turning on his heel as though he had had enough of the show at this juncture the mayor drew the bolt open flew the door and out poured the pack Ruffler and Bustler dashing at Billy and streaking his nice cream-colored leathers down with their dirty paws, while Thunder and Victim nearly carried him off his legs with the couples. Billy was in a great fright, never having been in such a predicament before. The Major came to the rescue, and with the aid of his whip and his voice, and his, For shame, Ruffler! For shame, Bustler! with cuts at the coupled ones, succeeded in restoring order. Let's mount, said he thinking to get Billy out of further danger. So saying, he wheeled about and led the way through the outer yard, with the glad pack gambling and frisking around him to the stables. The hounds raise a fresh cry of joy as they see Solomon with his horse ready to receive them. End of chapter 22 Read by Michelle Ballard Chapter 23 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ask Mama or the Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Showing a Horse, the Meat. The Bumbler, like our Matthews at home of a huntsman, is now metamorphosed, and in lieu of a little footman, we have a capped and booted whip. Not that he is a whip, for Solomon carries the couples as well as the horn, and also a spare stirrup leather slung across his shoulder, but our major has an eye as well to show as to business, and thinks he may as well do the magnificent, and have a horse ready to change with Billy as soon as Napoleon the Great seems to have had enough. To that end the bumbler now advances with the weaver, which he tenders to Billy, with a deferential touch of his cap. "'Ah, that's your horse!' exclaimed the major, making for White Surrey to avoid the frolics and favors of his followers, adding as he climbed on, "'You'll find here a c -c -c capital hack and a first-rate hunter. "'Here, elope, hounds, elope,' added he, turning his horse's head away to get the course clear for our friend to mount unmolested. Billy then affects the ascent of the black mare, most devoutly wishing himself safe off again.' The stirrups being adjusted to his length, he gives a home thrust with his feet in the irons, and gathering the thin reins, feels his horse gently with his left leg, just as Solomon mounts Napoleon the Great and advances to relieve the major of his charge. The cavalcade then proceed, Solomon with the now clustering hounds leading, the major and Billy riding side by side, and the bumbler on bulldog bringing up the rear. 
caps and curl papers and disappear to attend to the avocations of the house, the wares all agreeing that Mr. Pringle is a very pretty young gentleman and quite worthy of the pick of the young ladies. Crossing Cowslip Garth at an angle, they get upon Greenbet Pasture, where the first fruits of idleness are shown by Twister and Towler breaking away at the cows. Yow, yow, they go in full enjoyment of the chase. It's a grand chase for the bumbler who, adjusting his whip thong, sticks spurs into bulldog and sets off as hard as ever the old horse can lay legs to the ground. Get round them, man, get round them, shouts the major, watching Billy's leg-tied endeavors, the old horse being a better hand at walking than galloping. At length they are stopped and chided and for shamed, and two more fields land our party in Hollington Lane, which soon brings him into the Lingitine and Ewhurst Road, whose liberal width and ample siding bespeaks the neighborhood of a roomier region. Solomon, at a look from the major, now takes the grass siding with his hounds, while the gallant master just draws his young friend alongside of them on the road, casting an unconcerned eye upon the scene, in the hope that his guest will say something handsome at last. But no, Billy doesn't. He is fully occupied with his boots and breeches, whose polish and virgin purity he still deplores. There is a desperate daub down one side. The major tries to engage his intention by coaxing and talking to the hounds. Cleaver, good dog, cleaver. Chaunter, good dog, chaunter. Throwing them bits of biscuit, but all his efforts are vain. Billy plods on at the old postboy pace, apparently thinking of nothing but himself. Meanwhile, Solomon ambles cockily along on Napoleon with a backward and forward move of his leg to the horse's action, who ducks and shakes his head and plays good-naturedly with the hounds, as if quite delighted at the idea of what they are going to do. He shows to great advantage. He has not been out for a week, and the coddling and linseeding have given a healthy bloom to his bay coat, and he has taken a cordial ball with a little catechu and ten grains of opium to aid his exertions. Solomon, too, shows him off well. Though he hasn't our friend Dickie Bogledike's arified manner, like him he is little and light, sits neatly in his saddle, while his long coat lap partly conceals the want of ribbing, home of the handsome but washy horse. His boots and breeches, drab cords and brown tops are good, so are his spurs, also his saddle and bridle. There is a difference of 20% between the looks of a horse in a good, well-made London saddle and in one of those great, spongy, pulby, puddingly things we see in the country. Again, what a contrast there is between a horse looking through a nice, plain-fronted, plain-buckled, thin rein, town-made bridle and in one of those gaudy-fronted things all over buckles with reins thick enough for traces to the Lord Mayor's coach. All this adornment, however, is wasted upon fine Billy, who hasn't got beyond the mane and tail beauties of a horse. Action, strength, stamina, symmetry are as yet sealed subjects to him. The Major was a man who could enlighten him, if Billy would only let him do it, on the two words for himself and one for Billy Principal. Do it he would, too, for he saw it was of no use waiting for Billy to begin. Nice oss, that, now observed the Major, casually, nodding towards Knapp. Yarsh, replied Billy, looking him over. That's the oss I showed you in the stable. Is it, observed Billy, who didn't recognize him. Ought to be at Mama Melton, that oss, observed the Major. Why isn't he, asked Billy, in the innocence of his heart. Don't know, replied the Major, carelessly, with a toss of his head. Don't know. The fact is, I'm idle. No one to send with him, too old to go myself. Harriers keep me at home. Year too short to do all one has to do. See what a length he is. Lord bless us, he'd go over Ashby p -p -p pastures like a comet. Billy had now got his eyes well fixed upon the horse, which the Major, seeing, held his peace, for he was a capital seller and had the great gift of knowing when he had said enough. He was not the man to try and bore a person into buying, or spoil his market by telling a youngster that the horse would go in harness, or by not asking enough. So with Solomon still to and froing with his little legs, the horse still lively and gay, the hounds still frisking and playing, the party proceeded through the fertility-diminishing country, 
until the small fields with live fences gradually gave way to larger, drabber enclosures with stone walls, and Broadstruther Hill, with its heath-burnt summit and quarry-broken side at length, announces their approach to the moors. The moors. Who does not feel his heart expand and his spirit glow as he comes upon the vast, ocean-like space of moorland country? Leaving the strife, the cares, the contentions of a narrow, elbow-jostling world, for the grand enjoyment of pure, unrestricted freedom. The green streak of fertile soil, how sweet it looks, lit up by the fitful gleam of a cloud-obscured sun, the distant sky-touching cairn, how tempting to reach through the many intricacies of mountain ground, so easy to look at, so difficult to travel. The ink rises gaily in our pen at the thought, and pressing on, we cross the rough, picturesque stone bridge over the translucent stream, so unlike the polished, chiseled structures of town art, where nothing is thought good that is not expensive. And now, shaking off the last enclosure, we reach the sandy road below the watcher's hill-ensconced hut, and so wind round into the panorama of the hills within. "'Ah, there we are!' exclaimed the Major, now pointing out the myrtle-green gentlemen with their white cords, moving their steeds to and fro upon the bright sward below the gray rocks, of Cushat Law Hill. There we are, repeated he, eyeing them, trying to make out who they were, so as to season his greetings accordingly. There was Farmer Rintall on the white, and Godfrey Falder, the cattle jobber on the gray, and Caleb Benison, the horsebreaker, in his twilled fustian frock, ready to ride over a hound as usual, and old Duffield, the horse leech, in his low crowned hat, black tops and one spur and Dick Trail, the auctioneer, on his long-tailed nag, and Bonnet, the billiard-table keeper of Hinton, in his odious white hat, gray tweed, and collar-marked screw. But who the cluster of men are on the left, the Major can't for the life of him make out. He had hoped that Crickleton might have graced the meat with his presence, but there's no symptom of the yellow-coated groom, and Paul Stradler would most likely be too offended at not being invited to dine, and have gone to Sir Moses' hounds at the cow and calf on the Fixton and Primrose Bank Road. Still, there were a dozen or fourteen sportsmen, with two or three more coming over the hill, and distance hiding the deficiencies as well of steeds as of costume. The whole has a very lively and inspiriting effect. At the joyous, well-known, here they come, of the lookers out, a move is perceptible among the field, who forthwith set off to meet the hounds, and as the advancing parties near, the Major has time to identify and appropriate their faces and their persons. First comes Captain Nabley, the Chief Constable of Featherbeds, who greets our master with the friendliness of a brother soldier, one of us in arms, and is forthwith introduced to our Billy. Next is Fat Farmer Nettlefold, who considers himself entitled to a shake of the hand in return for the Major's frequent comings over his farm at Carroll Hill Green, which compliment being duly paid, the great master then raises his hat in return for the salutes of Falder, Renison, and Trail, and again stops to shake hands with an aged, well-whiskered dandy in mufti, one Mr. Watherspoon, now farming or starving a little property he purchased with his butlerage savings under the great Duke of Thunderdownshire. Watherspoon apes the manners of high life with a brandified face of low talks Parliament, and takes snuff from a gold box with a George the Fourthian air. He now offers the Major a pinch, who accepts it with graceful concession. The seedy-looking gentleman in black, on the two palpable three and sixpence a cider, is Mr. Catoicide, the county court bailiff, with his pocket full of summonses, who thinks to throw around with the Major into the day's hire of his broken-kneed chestnut, and the greasy-haired, shining-faced youth with him, on the long-tailed white pony, is Ramshaw, the butcher's boy, on the same sort of speculation. Then we have Mr. Megason's coachman, availing himself of his master's absence, to give the family horse a turn with the hounds instead of going to Coles, as he ought, with Mr. Dotherington's young man, halting on his way to the doctor's with a note. He will tell his mistress the doctor was out and he had to wait ever so long till he came home. The four truants seemed to herd together on the birds of a feather principle. 
and now the reinforced party reached the meat below the gray, ivy-tangled rocks, and Solomon pulls up at the accustomed spot to give his hounds a roll and let the major receive the ecomians of the encircling field. Then there is a repetition of the kennel scene. Lovely, 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 beautiful bitch that, chaunter, chaunter. Chaunter, there's a handsome hound. Bustler, good dog. Only each man has his particular favorite or hound that he has either bred or walked or knows the name of, and so most of the pack come in for more or less praise. It is agreed on all hands that they never looked better or the establishment more complete. Couldn't be better if it had cost 5000 a year. Most grateful were their commendations to the major after the dry, monotonous yarses of Billy, who sits looking unconcernedly on, a regular sleeping partner in the old established firm of Laudation and Company. The major inwardly attributes his indifference to conceited fox-hunting pride, looks down upon harriers. The field, however, gradually got the steam of praise up to a very high pitch. Indeed, had not Mr. Watherspoon, who was only an air and exercise gentleman, observed, after a pompous pinch of snuff, that he saw by the papers at the House of Lords, of which he considered himself a sort of supernumerary member, were going to do something or not to do something, caused a check in the cry. There is no saying, but they might altogether have forgotten what they had come out about. As it was, the mention of Mr. Watherspoon's favorite branch of the legislature, for which they had all suffered more or less severely, operated like the hose of a fire engine upon a crowd, sending one man one way, another another, until Watherspoon had only Solomon and the hounds to finish off before. Indeed, sir, was all the encouragement he got from Solomon, but let us get away from the insufferable, rumagan, brandy-faced old boar by supposing Solomon transferred from Napoleon the Great to Bulldog. Billy mounted on the washy horse instead of the weaving mare, the major's girths drawn, clay pipes deposited in the breast pockets of the owners, and thongs unloosened to commence the all-important operation of thistle-whipping. At a nod from the major, Solomon gives a wave of his hand to the hounds, and putting his horse on, the tide of sportsmen sweep after, and cutchet law rocks are again left in their pristine composure. Despite Billy's indifference, the major is still anxious to show to advantage, not knowing who Billy may relate his day's sport to, and therefore arranged with Solomon not to cast off until they got upon the more favorable ground of Sunny Law's moor. This gives Billy time to settle in his new saddle and scrape acquaintance with Napoleon, whom he finds a very complacent, easy-going horse. He has a light, playful mouth, and Billy doesn't feel afraid of him. Indeed, if it wasn't for the idea of the jumps, he would rather enjoy it. His mind, however, might have been easy on that score, for they are going into the hills instead of away from them, and the major has scuttled over the ground so often that he knows every bog and every crossing and every vantage-taking line, where to view the hare and where to catch up his hounds to a nicety. At length they reached a pretty amphitheaterish piece of country, encircled by grassy hills, folding gracefully into each other with the bolder outline of the Arkin Hill moors for the background. A silvery stream meanders carelessly about the lowland, occasionally lost to view by sand reefs and gravel beds thrown up by impetuous torrents rushing down from the higher grounds. The field is here reinforced by Tom Springer, the generally out-of-place watcher, and his friend Joe Pitfall, the beer shop keeper of Wetton Hill, with their temporary wide-awakes, well-worn baggy-pocketed shooting coats, and strong oak staffs suitable either for leaping or poking poles. The major returns their salute with a lowering brow, for he strongly suspects they are there on their own account, and not for the sake of enjoying a day with his unrivaled hounds. However, as neither of them has leave over the ground, they can neither of them find fault, and must just put up with each other. So the major, addressing Springer, says, I'll give you a shilling if you find me a hare, as he turns to the bumbler and bids him uncouple Billy's old friends, Ruffler and Bustler. This done, the hounds quickly spread to try and hit off the morning scent, while the myrtle greeners and others distribute themselves, cracking, hopping, and hissing, here, there, and everywhere. 
Springer and Pitball go poke, poke, tap, tap, peep, peep at every likely bush and tuft, but both the major and they are too often over the ground to allow of hares being very plentiful. When they do find them, they are generally well in wind from work. Meanwhile, Mr. Watherspoon, finding that Billy Pringle is a friend of Lord Ladythorne's, makes up to him and speaks of his lordship in the kind, encouraging way, so becoming a great man, speaking of a lesser one. Oh, he knew his lordship well. Excellent man he was. Knew Mrs. Moffat, too. Handsome woman she was. Not so handsome, perhaps, as Mrs. Spangles, the actress, but still very handsome woman. Ah, he knew Mrs. Spangles, poor thing, long before she came to Tantivy, when she was on the stage, in fact. And here the old buck, putting his massive gold-mounted riding whip under his arm, heaved a deep sigh, as though the mention of her name recalled painful recollections, and producing his gold snuff-box after offering it to Billy, he consoled himself with a long-drawn respiration from its contents. He then flourished his scarlet, adder of rose-scented bandana, and seemed lost in contemplation of the stripes down his trousers and his little lacquer-toed boots. Billy rode silently on with him, making no doubt he was a very great man, just the sort of man his mama would wish him to get acquainted with. End of chapter 23, read by Bryce Cries, December 2021. Chapter 24 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ask Mama or the Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 24 The Wild Beast Itself. Just as the old buck was resuming the thread of his fashionable high life narrative, preparatory to sounding Billy about the Major and his family, the same sort of electric thrill shot through the field that characterized a terrible Gnur along, don't you see the hounds are running? The glancy day with the Earl. Billy felt all over, he didn't know howish, very wish he was at homish. The horse, too, began to caper. The thrill is caused by a shilling's worth of wide awake on a stick held high against the skyline of the gently swelling hill on the left, denoting that the wild beast is found, causing the major to hold up his hat as a signal of reply, and all the rest of the field to desist from their flopping and thistle-whipping and rein in their screws for the coming conflict. "'Now, s -s -s sir,' exclaimed the stuttering major, cantering up to our billy, all flurry and enthusiasm. "'Now, s -s sir, we ha have her, and you'll have to f f f follow me. I'll show you her.' thinking he was offering Billy the greatest treat imaginable. So saying, the major drops his hands on White Surrey's neck, rises in his stirrups, and scuttles away, bounding over the gorse bushes and broom that intervene between him and the still stick-hoisted tenpenny. "'Where is she?' demands the major. "'Where is she?' repeats he, coming up. "'Hey, major, he mun give us half-croon any ho this time,' exclaims our friend, Tom Springer, whose headgear it is that has been hoisted. "'Deed mun ye,' asserts Pitfall, who has now joined his companion. "'No, no,' retorts the Major angrily. "'I said a shillin. "'A shillin's my price, and you know it.' "'Well, but consider what a time we've been a-lookin' for her, Major,' replied Springer, mopping his brow. "'Well, but consider that you are about to partake of the enjoyments as well as myself.' "'and that I find the whole of this expensive establishment,' retorted the Major, looking back for his hounds, "'not a farthing subscription.' "'Say two shillin', then,' replied Springer, coaxingly. "'No, no,' replied the Major. "'A shillin's plenty.' "'Make it eighteen pence, then,' said Pitfall, "'and oop she goes for the money.' "'Well, come,' snapped the Major hurriedly, "'as Billy now came elbowing up. "'Where is she? Where is she?' demanded he. "'Eh, hey, she's not here, she's not here, but I see her in her form thonder,' replied Springer, nodding towards the adjoining bush-dotted hill. "'Go to her then,' said the Major, jingling the eighteen pence in his hand, to be ready to give him on view of the hare. The man that led the way through rushes, brambles, and briars, keeping a steady eye in the spot where she sat. At length he stopped. 
There she, see, said he, sato voci, pointing to the green hillside. I have her, whispered the major, his keen eyes sparkling with delight. Come here, said he to Billy, and I'll show her to you. There, said he, there you see that patch of gorse with the burnt stick stumps at the low end. Well, carry your eye down the slope of the land, past the old willow tree, and you have her as plain as a pike staff. Billy shook his head. He saw nothing but a tuft or two of rough grass. Oh, yes, you see your large eyes watching us, continued the major, thinking she sees us without our seeing her. No, our friend didn't. Very odd, laughed the major, very odd, with the sort of vexation a man feels when another can't be made to see the object he does. Will you give them a view now, asked Springer, or put her away quietly? Oh, put her away quietly, replied the major, put her away quietly, and let them get their noses well down to the scent, adding, I've got some strange hounds out, and I want to see how they work. The man then advanced a few paces, and touching one of the apparently lifeless tufts with his pole, out sprang Puss, and went stodding and dotting away with one ear back and the other forward, in a state of indignant perturbation. Buck, exclaims Pitfall, watching her as she goes. Doubt it, replied the Major, scrutinizing her attentively. Nay, look at its head and shoulders. Did you ever see sick red shoulders as those on a doe? asked Springer. Well, said the Major, here's your money, handing Springer the eighteen pence, and I hope she'll be worth it, but mine for the future a shillin's my price. After scudding up the hill, Puss stopped to listen and ascertain the quality of her pursuers. She had suffered persecution from many hands, shooters, coursers, snarers, and once before from the Major and his harriers. That, however, was on a bad scenting day, and she had not had much difficulty in beating them. Meanwhile, Solomon has been creeping quietly on with his hounds, encouraging such to hunt as seemed inclined that way, though the majority were pretty well aware of the grand discovery and leaned towards the horsemen in advance. Puss, however, had slipped away unseen by the hounds, and Twister darts at the empty form, thinking to save all trouble by a chop. Bracelet then strikes a scent in advance, Ruffler and Chaunter confirm it, and after one or two hesitating rashes and flourishes, increasing in intensity each time, a scent is fairly established, and away they drive full cry amid exclamations of, beautiful, beautiful, never saw anything puttier, from the major and the field, the music of the hounds being increased and prolonged by the echoes of the valleys and adjacent hills. The field then fell into line, silent Solomon first, the major of course next, fine Billy third, and Watherspoon and Nettlefold rather contending for his company. Nabley, Duffield, Bonnet, Reunison, Fandler, Catchaside, Truants all mixed up together in heterogeneous confusion, jostling for precedence as men do when there are no leaps. So they round Hawthorne Hill and pour up the pretty valley beyond, each man riding a good deal harder than his horse, the hounds going best pace, which, however, is not very great. Give me, inwardly praised the major, cantering consequentially along with his thong-gathered whip held up like a sword. Give me five and twenty minutes, the first fifteen, a burst, then a fault well hit off, and the remaining ten without a turn, thinking to astonish the supercilious fox hunter. Then he takes a sly look to see how Napoleon is faring, it being by no means his intention to let fine Billy get to the bottom of him. On, on, the hounds press, for now is the time to enjoy the scent with a hare, and they have run long enough together to have confidence in their leaders. Now Lovely has the scent, now Lilter, now Ruffler flings in advance and again is superseded by Twister. They brush through the heathery open with an increasing cry and fling at the crossroad between Burswell Mill and Capstone with something like the energy of foxhounds. Twister catches it up beyond the sandy track and hurrying over it some twenty yards further on is superseded by Lovely who hits it off to the left. Away she goes with the lead. Beautiful, beautiful, exclaims the Major, hoping the fox hunter sees it. Beautiful, beautiful, echoes Nettlefold, as the clustering pack drops their sterns to the scent 
and push forward with renewed velocity. The Major again looks for our friend Billy, who is riding in a very careless, slack-range sort of style, not at all adapted for making the most of his horse. However, it is no time for remonstrance, and the music of the hounds help to make things pleasant. On, on they speed, up one hill, down another, round a third, and so on. One great advantage of hunting in a strange country undoubtedly is that all runs are straight, with harriers as well as foxhounds, with some men who ride over the same ground again and again without knowing that it is the same, and Billy was one of this sort. Though they rounded Hawthorne Hill again, it never occurred to him that it was the second time of asking. Indeed, he just cantered carelessly on like a man on a watering place hack, thinking when his hour will be out, regardless of the beautiful hits made by Lovely and Lilter or any of them, and which almost threw the major and their respective admirers into ecstasies. Great was the praise bestowed upon their performances, it being the interest of every man to magnify the run and astonish the stranger. Had they but known as much of the richest commoner as the reader does, they would not have given themselves the trouble. Away they pour over the hill and dale, over soft ground and sound, through reedy rushes and sedgy flats, and over the rolling stones of the fallen rocks. Then they score away full cry on getting upon more propitious ground. What a cry they make, and Echo seemingly takes pleasure to repeat the sound. Napoleon the Great presently begins to play the castanets with his feet, an ominous sound to our major, who looks back for the bumbler, and inwardly wishes for a check to favor his design of dismounting our hero. Half a mile or so further on, and the chance occurs. They get upon a piece of bare heather burnt ground, whose peaty smell baffles the scent, and brings the hounds first to a check, then to a standstill. Solomon's hand in the air beckons a halt, to which the field gladly respond, for many of the steeds are eating new oats and do not get any great quantity of those, while some are on swedes and others only have hay. Altogether their condition is not to be spoken of. The major now all hurry scurry, just like a case of second horses, second horses, where's my fellow with my second horse, at a check in Leicestershire, beckons the bumbler up to Billy, and despite of our friend's remonstrance, who has got on such terms with Napoleon as to allow of his taking the liberty of spurring him, and would rather remain where he is, insists upon putting him upon the mare again, observing that he couldn't think of taking the only spare horse from a gentleman who had done him the distinguished honor of leaving the earl's establishment for his humble pack, and so, in the excitement of the moment, Billy has hustled off one horse and hurried on to another, as if a moment's hesitation would be fatal to the fray. The major then, addressing the bumbler in an undertone, says, Now walk that horse quietly home and get him some linseed tea, and have him done up by the time we get in. He then spurs gallantly up to the front, as though he expected the hounds to be off again at score. There is no need of such energy, for Puss has set them a puzzle that will take them some time to unravel. But it saved an argument with Billy, and perhaps a credit of the bay. He now goes drooping and slouching away, very unlike the cock horse he came out. Meanwhile, the hounds have shot out and contracted, and shot out and contracted, and tried and tested, and tried and tested, every tuft and every inch of burnt ground, while Solomon sits motionless between them and the head-mopping, chattering field. Must be on, observes Caleb Renison, the horsebreaker, whose three-year-old began fidgeting and neighing. Back, I say, speculated Bonnet, whose domicile lay to the rear. Very odd, observed Captain Nebley. They ran her well to hear. Hares are queer things, said old Duffield, wishing he had her by the ears for the pot. Far more hunting with a hare nor a fox, observed Mr. Rintoll, who always praised his department of the chase. Must have squatted, observed old Watherspoon, taking a pinch of snuff and placing his double gold eyeglasses on his nose to reconnoiter the scene. Lies very close if she has, rejoined Godfrey Falder, flopping at a first bush as he spoke. Lost her, I fear, ejaculated Mr. Trail, who meant to beg her for a christening dinner if they killed. 
The fact is, Puss having, as we said before, had a game at romps with her pursuers on a bad scenting day, when she regulated her speed by their pace, has been inconveniently pressed on the present occasion, and feeling her strength fail, has had recourse to some of the many arts for which hares are famous. After crossing the burnt ground, she made for a greasy sheep track, up which she ran some fifty yards, and then deliberately retracing her steps, threw herself with a mighty spring into a rushy furze patch at the bottom of the hill. She now lies heaving and panting and watching the success of her stratagem from her ambush with the terror-striking pack full before her. And now having accommodated Mr. Pringle with a second horse, perhaps the reader will allow us to take a fresh pen and finish the run in another chapter. End of chapter 24 Read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown Chapter 25 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ask Mama or the Richest Commoner in England by Robert Smith Surtees. A Cruel Finish Every hound having at length sniffed and snuffed and sniffed and snuffed to satiety, Solomon now essays to assist them by casting round the flat of smoke-infected ground. He makes the head good first, which maneuver hitting off the scent, he is hailed and applauded as a conqueror. Never was such a huntsman as Solomon, first harrier huntsman in England, worth any money as a huntsman. The again clamorous pack bustle up the sheep path at such a pace as sends the leaders hurrying far beyond the scent. Then the rear rush to the front, and a general spread of bewildered, benighted confusion ensues. Where has she got to, is the question. Doubled, mutters the disappointed major, reining in his steed. Squatted, exclaimed Mr. Rentoll, who always sported an opinion. Hold hard, cries Mr. Trail, though they were all at a standstill, but then he wished to let them know he was there. The leading hounds retrace their steps and again essay to carry the scent forward. The second effort is attended with the same result as the first. They cannot get it beyond the double. Cunning animal, mutters the major, eyeing their endeavors. Far more hunt with a hare nor a fox, now observed Mr. Bonnet, raising his white hat to cool his bald head. Far, replied Mr. Falter, thinking he must be off. If it weren't for the redcoats, there wouldn't be so many fox hunters, chuckles old Duffield, who dearly loves roast hare. Solomon is puzzled, but as he doesn't profess to be wiser than the hounds, he just lets them try to make it out for themselves. If they can't wind her, he can't, so the old sage sits like a statue. At length, the majority give her up. And now Springer and Pitfall and two or three other pedestrians who have been attracted from their work by the music of the hounds and have been enjoying the panorama of the chase with their pipes from the summit of an inside hill descend to see if they can either prick her or pull her. Down go their heads as if they were looking for a pin. The hounds, however, have obliterated all traces of her and they soon have recourse to their staves. Bang, bang, bang! They beat the gorse and broom and juniper bushes with vigorous sincerity. Crack, flop, crack, go the field in aid of their endeavors. Solomon leans with his hounds to the left, which is lucky for Puss, for though she withstood the downward blow of a springer's pole on her bush, a well-directed side thrust sends her flying out in a state of the greatest excitement. What an outburst of joy the sight of her occasioned. Hounds, horses, riders all seemed to participate in the common enthusiasm. How they whooped and hallooed and shouted, enough to frighten the poor thing out of her wits. Billy in the field have a grand view of her, for she darts first to the right, then to the left, then off the right and again the left, ere she tucks her long legs under her and strides up Cleope Hill at a pace that looks quite unapproachable. Falder alone remains where he is, muttering fresh horror as she goes. The Major and all the rest of the field hug their horses and tear along in a state of joyous excitement, for they see her life is theirs. They keep the low ground and jump with the hounds at the bridle gate between Greenlaw Sheepwalks and Hindhope Cairn, 
just as Lovely hits the scent off over the boundary wall and the rest of the pack endorse her note. They are now on fresh ground, which greatly aids the efforts of the hounds, who push on with the head that the Major thinks ought to procure them a compliment from Billy. Our friend, however, keeps all his compliments for the ladies, not being aware that there is anything remarkable in the performance, which he now begins to wish at an end. He has ridden as long as he likes, quite as much as Mr. Spavin or any of the London livery stable keepers would let him have for half a guinea. Indeed, he wishes he mayn't have got more than is good for him. The Major, meanwhile, all energy and enthusiasm, rides gallantly forward, for though he is no great hand among the enclosures, he makes a good fight in the hills, especially when, as now, he knows every yard of the country. Many's the tall he's had over it, though to look at his excited face one would think this was his first hunt. He'll now bet a half-crown they kill her, He'll bet a guinea they kill her. He'll bet a five-pun note they'll kill her. He'll bet half the national debt they'll kill her, as dainty and lovely and bustler, after dwelling and hesitating over some rushy ground, at length proclaim the scent beyond. Away they all sweep with a careering wind. On follow the field in glorious excitement. A flock of black-faced sheep next foil the ground, Sheep as wild, if not wilder, than the animal the hounds are pursuing. We often think when we see these strong-scented animals scouring the country that a good beast of chase has been overlooked for the stag. Why shouldn't an old, wiry, black-faced top with his wild, sparkling eyes and spiral horns afford as good a run as a home-fed deer? Start the top in his own rough region, and we will be bound to say he will give the hounds and their followers a scramble. The Major now denounces the flying flock. Oh, those nasty muttons, exclaims he. Bags of bone, rather, for they won't be meat these five years. Wonder how any sane people can cultivate such animals. The hounds hunt well enough through the difficulty, or the Major would have been more savage still. On the go, yapping and toweling and howling as before, the Major's confidence in a kill increasing at every stride. The terror-striking shouts that greeted poor Puss's exit from the bush have had the effect as well of driving her out of her country as of pressing her beyond her strength, and she has no sooner succeeded in placing what she hopes is a comfortable distance between herself and her pursuers than she again has recourse to those tricks with which nature has so plentifully endowed her. Sinking the hill, she makes for the little enclosed allotments below, and electing a bare fallow, bare except in the matter of wick and grass, she steals quietly in and commences her performance on the least verdant part of it. First she described a small circle, then she sprung into the middle of it and squatted. Next she jumped up and bounded out in a different direction to the one by which she had entered. She then ran about twenty yards up a furrow, retracing her steps backwards and giving a roll near where she started from. Then she took three bounding leaps to the left, which landed her on the hard headland, and creeping along the side of the wall, she finally popped through the water hole and squeezed into an incredibly small space between the curbstone and the gatepost. There she lay with her head to the air, panting and heaving, and listening for her dread pursuers coming. Oh, what agony was hers! Presently the gallant band came howling and toweling over the hill, in all the gay delirium of a hunt without leaps, the Major with difficulty restraining their ardor as he pointed out the brilliance of the performance to Billy. Most splendid running, most capital hunting, most superb pack, with a sly pish and shaw at foxhounds in general, and Sir Mosey's in particular. The Major hadn't got over the Bo Peep business and never would. The pack now reached the scene of Puss's frolics, and the music very soon descended from a towering tenor to an insignificant whimper, which at length died out altogether. Solomon and Bulldog were again fixtures, Solomon as usual with his hand up, beckoning silence. He knew how weak the scent must be and how important it was to keep quiet at such a critical period, and let the hounds hit her off if they could. Puss had certainly given them a Gordian knot to unravel, and not all the hallowing and encouragement in the world could drive them much beyond the magic circle she had described. 
Whenever the hunt seemed likely to be reestablished, it invariably resulted in a return to the place from whence they started. They couldn't get forward with it at all and poked about and tested the same ground over and over again. It was a regular period or full stop. Very rum, observed Caleb Brennison, looking first at his three-year-old, then at his watch, thinking that it was about pudding time. She's surely a witch, said Mr. Watherspoon, taking a prolonged pinch of snuff. We'll roast her for one at all events, laughed Mr. Trail, the auctioneer still hoping to get her. First catch your hair, says Mrs. Somebody, responded Captain Nebley, eyeing the sorely puzzled pack. Oh, catch her. We're sure to catch her, observed Mr. Nettlefold, chucking up his chin and dismounting. Not so clear about that, muttered Mr. Rintoll, as Lovely and Bustler and Lilter again returned to repeat the search. If those hounds can't own her, there are no hounds in England can, asserted the Major, anxious to save the credit of his pack before the, he feared, too critical stranger. At this depressing moment again came the infantry and commenced the same system of peering and poking that marked their descent on the former occasion. And now poor Puss, being again a little recruited, steals out of her hiding place and crosses quietly along the outside of the wall to where a flock of those best friends to a hunted hare, some newly smeared white-faced sheep, were quietly nibbling at the half-grass, half-heather, at the little moor-edge farm of Moss Hugh Law, whose stone-roofed buildings, washed by a clear mountain stream and sheltered by a clump of venerable scotch firs, stand on a bright green patch, a sort of oasis in the desert. The sheep hardly deign to notice the hare, far different to the consternation bold Reynard carries into their camp when they go circling round like a squadron of dragoons, drawing boldly up to charge when the danger's past. So poor, weary, Footsore, fur-matted puss goes hobbling and limping up to the farm buildings as if to seek protection from man against his brother man. Now it so happened that Mrs. Kidwell, the half-farmer, half-shepherd's pretty wife, was in the fold-yard washing her churn along with her little chubby-faced Jessie, who was equally busy with her mama munching away at a very long slice of plentifully buttered and sugared bread. And Mama, chancing to look up from the churn to see how her darling progressed, saw Puss halting at the threshold, as if waiting to be asked in. "'It's that mad old Major and his dogs,' exclaimed Mrs. Kidwell, catching up the child lest its red petticoat might scare away the visitor, and popping into the dairy, she saw the hare, after a little demur, hobble into the cowhouse. Having seen her well in, Mrs. Kidwell emerged from her hiding place, and locking the door, she put the key in her pocket and resumed her occupation with her churn. Presently, the familiar melody, the yow, yow, yap, yap, yow, yow of the hounds, broke upon her ear, increasing in strength as she listened, making her feel glad she was at hand to befriend the poor hare. The hunt was indeed revived, the hounds, one and all, having declared their inability to make anything more of it. Solomon had set off on one of his cruises, which resulted in the yeoman prickers and he meeting at the gate where the hare had squatted when Lovely gave tongue just as Springer, with his eyes well down, exclaimed, Here she is! Bustler and Bracelet and Twister and Chaunter confirmed Lovely's opinion, and away they went with the feeble scent peculiar to the sinking animal. Their difficulties are further increased by the sheep, it requiring Solomon's oft-raised hand to prevent the hounds being hurried over the line, as it is the hunt was conducted on the silent system for some little distance. The pace rather improved after they got clear of the smear and foil of the muttons, and the major pulled up his gills, felt his tie, and cocked his hat jauntily as the hounds pointed for the pretty farmhouse, the major thinking to show off to advantage before Mrs. Kidwell. They presently carried the scent up to the still open gates of the fold yard. Lovely now proclaims where Puss has paused. Things look very critical. Good morning, Mrs. Kidwell, exclaimed the gallant major, addressing her. Pray, how long have you been at the churn? Oh, this twenty minutes or more, major, replied Mrs. Kidwell, gaily. You haven't got the hair in it, have you? asked he. 
Not that I know of, but you can look if you like, replied Mrs. Kidwell, coloring slightly. Well, I know we'll take your word for it, rejoined the Major gallantly. Must be on, Solomon, must be on, said he, nodding his huntsman to proceed. Solomon is doubtful, but master being master, Solomon holds his hounds on past the stable, round the lambing sheds and stackyard, to the front of the little three windows and adored farmhouse, without eliciting a whimper, no, not even from a babbler. Just at this moment, a passing cloud discharged a gentle shower over the scene, and when Solomon returned to pursue his inquiries in the fold yard, the last vestige of scent had been effectually obliterated. Mrs. Kidwell now stood watching the inquisitive proceedings of the party, searching now the hen house, now the pigsty, now the ash hole, and when Solomon tried the cow house door, she observed carelessly, Ah, that's locked, and he passed on to examine the straw shed adjoining. All places were overhauled and scrutinized. At length, even Captain Nabley's detective genius failed in suggesting where puss could be. Where did you see her last? asked Mrs. Kidwell with well-feigned ignorance. Why, we've not seen her for quite some time, but the hounds hunted her up to your very gate, replied the Major. Dreary me, how strange, and you've made nothing of her since, observed she. Nothing, assented the Major, reluctantly. Very odd, observed Mr. Catchaside, who was anxious for a kill. Never saw nothing like it, asserted Mr. Rentoll, looking again into the pigsty. She must have doubled back, suggested Mr. Nettlefold. Should have met her if she had, observed old Duffield. She must be somewhere hereabouts, observed Mr. Trail, dismounting and stamping about on foot among the half-trodden straw of the fold yard. No push there. Hard upon the hounds, observed Mr. Watherspoon, replenishing his nose with a good charge of snuff. Cruel indeed, assented the Major, who never gave them more than entrails. Never saw a hare better hunted, exclaimed Captain Nabley, lighting a cigar. Nor I, assented fat Mr. Nettlefold, mopping his brow. How long was it, asked Mr. Rintall. An hour and five minutes, replied the Major, looking at his watch. Five and forty minutes in reality. Very good running, elaborates old dandy Watherspoon. I see by the post that... Well, I suppose we must give her up, interrupted the Major, who didn't want to have the contents of his own second-hand copy forestalled. Pity to leave her, observed Mr. Trail, returning to his horse. What can you do, asked the Major, adding, it's no use sitting here. None, assents Captain Nabley, blowing a cloud. At a nod from the Major, Solomon now collects his hounds, and passing through the scattered group, observes with a sort of Wellingtonian touch of his cap, in reply to their condolence, Yes, sir, but it takes a slee chap, sir, to kill a more edge hare, sir. So the poor major was foiled out of his fur, and when the cows came lowing down from the fell to be milked, kind Mrs. Kidwell opened the door and out popped Puss, as fresh and lively as ever, making for her old haunts, where she was again to be found at the end of a week. End of chapter 25, read by Bryce Cries, Youngstown. Chapter 26 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ask Mama, or the Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 26 The Pringle Correspondence. The reader will perhaps wonder what our fair friend Mrs. Pringle is about, and how there happens to be no tidings from Curtain Crescent. Tidings there were, only the Tantivy Castle servants were so oppressed with work that they could never find time to redirect her effusions. At length Mr. Beveridge, the butler, seeing the accumulation of letters in Mr. Packwood, the house steward's room, suggested that they might perhaps be wanted, whereupon Mr. Packwood huddled them into a fresh envelope, and sent them to the post along with the general consignment from the castle. Very pressing and urgent the letters were, increasing in anxiety with each one, as no answer had been received to its predecessor. Were it not that Mrs. Pringle knew the Earl would have written, she would have feared her Billy had sustained some hunting calamity. 
The first letter merely related how Mrs. Pringle had gone to Uncle Jerry's, according to appointment, to have a field day among the papers, and how Jerry had gone to attend an anti-Sunday band meeting, leaving seed cake and sponge cake and wine, with a very affectionate three-cornered note, saying how deeply he deplored the necessity, but how he hoped to remedy the delay by another and an early appointment. This letter enclosed a very handsome large coat of arms seal, made entirely out of Mrs. Pringle's own head, containing what the heralds call assumptive arms, divided into as many compartments as a backgammon board, which she advised Billy to use judiciously, hinting that Major H, meaning our friend Major Y, would be a fitter person to try it upon than Lord L. The next letter, among many other things of minor importance, reminded Billy that he had not told his mamma what Mrs. Moffat had on, or whether they had any new dishes for dinner, and urging him to write her full particulars, but to be careful not to leave either his or her letters lying about, and hoping that he emptied his pockets every night instead of leaving that for Rogier to do, and leaving him much other good and wholesome advice. The third letter was merely to remind him that she had not heard from him in answer to either of her other two, and begging him just to drop her a single line by return of post, saying he was well, and so on. The next was larger, enclosing him a double-crest seal containing a lion on a cap of dignity, and an eagle for sealing notes in aid of the great seal, and saying that she had had a letter from Uncle Jerry, upbraiding her for not keeping her appointment with him, whereas she had never made any, he having promised to make one with her, and again urging Billy to write to her if only a single line, and when he had time, to send her a full account of what Mrs. Moffat had on every day, and whether they had any new dishes for dinner, and all the news, sporting and otherwise, urging him as before to take care of Daub, meaning himself, and hoping he was improving in his hunting, able to sit at the jumps and enjoying himself generally. The fifth, which caused the rest to come, was a mere repetition of her anxieties and requests for a line, and immediately produced the following letter. Mr. William to his mamma. Hamilton Grange. My dearest mamma, your letters have all reached me at once. For though both Rogier and I especially charged the butler and another fine fellow, and gave them heads to put on, to send all that came immediately, they seem to have waited for an accumulation so as to make one sending do. It is very idle of them. The seals are beautiful, and I am very obliged to you for them. I will seal this letter with the large one by way of a beginning. It seems to be uncommonly well quartered, quite noble. I will now tell you all my movements. I have been here at Major Yammerton's, not Hammerton's as you call him, for some days, enjoying myself amazingly, for the Major has a nice pack of harriers that go along leisurely, instead of tearing away at the unconscionable pace the earls do. Still, a canter in the park at high tide, in my opinion, is a much better thing with plenty of ladies looking on. Talking of cantering reminds me I've bought a horse of the Major's, bought him all except paying for him, so you had better send me the money. One hundred guineas. For though the Major says I may pay for him when I like, and seems quite easy about it, they say horses are already ready money, so I suppose I must conform to the rule. It is a beautiful bay, with four black legs and a splendid mane and tail, very blood-like and racing. Indeed, the Major says if I was to put him into some of the spring handicaps, I should be sure to win a hatful of money with him, or perhaps a gold cup or two. The Major is a great sportsman, and has kept hounds for a great number of years, and altogether he is very agreeable, and I feel more at home here than I did at the castle, where, though everything was very fine, still there was no fun, and only Mrs. Moffat to talk to, at least in the lady way, for though she always professed to be expecting lady callers, none ever came that I saw or heard of. I really forgot all about the dinners there, except that they were very good and lasted a long time, we had a new dish here the other night, which if you want a novelty you can introduce, namely, to flavor the plates with castor oil. You will find it a very serviceable one for saving your meat, as nobody can eat it. Mrs. Moffat was splendidly dressed every day, sometimes in blue, sometimes in pink, sometimes in green, sometimes in silk, sometimes in satin, sometimes in velvet with a profusion of very lovely lace and magnificent jewelry. Rogier says, she makes the hay feel the sun does shine. I don't know how long I shall stay here, certainly over Friday, and most likely until Monday, after which I suppose I shall go back to the castle. 
The major says I must have another day with his hounds, and I don't care if I do, provided he keeps in the hills and away from the jumps, as I can manage the galloping well enough. It's the jerks that send me out of my saddle. A hare is quite a different animal to pursue to a fox, and seems to have some sort of consideration for its followers. She stops short every now and then, and jumps up in view, instead of tearing away like an express train on a railway. The girls here are very pretty. Miss Yammerton extremely so. Fair, with beautiful blue eyes, and such a figure. But Rogier says they are desperately bad-tempered, except the youngest one, who is dark and like her mamma but I shouldn't say Monsieur is a particularly sweet-tempered gentleman himself. He is always grumbling and groaning about what he calls his grob, and declares the Major keeps his house on sturdy mutton and stale beer. But he complained at the castle that there was nothing but port and sherry, and composite candles to go to bed with, which he declared was an insult to his station, which entitles him to wax. You can't think how funny and small this place looked after the castle. It seemed just as if I had got into a series of closets instead of rooms. However, I soon got used to it, and like it amazingly. But here comes Monsieur with my dressing things, so I must out with the great seal and bid you good-bye for the present, for the Major is a six o'clock man and doesn't like to be kept waiting for his dinner. So now, my dearest Mamma, believe me to remain ever your most truly affectionate son, William Pringle to which we need scarcely say, the delighted Mrs. Pringle replied by return of post, writing in the following loving and judicious strain. Twenty-five, Curtain Crescent, Belgrave Square, my own beloved darling, I was so overjoyed you can't imagine to receive your most welcome letter, for I really began to be uneasy about you, not that I feared any accident out hunting, but I was afraid you might have caught cold or be otherwise unwell. Mind, if ever you feel in the slightest degree indisposed, send for the doctor immediately. There is nothing like taking things in time. It was very idle of the servants of Tatini Castle to neglect your instructions so. But for the future, you had better always write a line to the postmaster of the place where you are staying, giving him your next address to forward your letters to, for it is the work for which they are paid, and there is no shuffling of it off to anyone else's shoulders. The greatest people are oft times the worst served, not because the servants have any particular objection to them personally, but because they are so desperately afraid of being what they call put upon by each other, that they spend double the time in fighting off doing a thing than it would take to do it. This is one of the drawbacks upon rank. Noblemen must keep a great staff of people, whom in a general way they cannot employ, and who do nothing but squabble and fight with each other who is to do the little there is, the greatest man among servants being he who does the least. However, as you have got the letters at last, we will say no more about it. I hope your horse is handsome, and neighs and paws the ground prettily. You should be careful, however, in buying, for few people are magnanimous enough to resist cheating a young man in horses. Still, I am glad you have bought one if it suits you, as it is much better and pleasanter to ride your own horse than be indebted to other people for mounts. Nevertheless, I would strongly advise you to stick to either the fox or the stag, with either of which you can sport pink and look smart. Harriers are only for bottled-nosed old gentlemen with gouty shoes. I can't help thinking that a day with a milder, more reasonable fox than the ones you had with Lord Ladythorne would convince you of the superiority of foxhounds or harriers. I was asking Mr. Ralph Rasper, who called here the other day, how little Tom Stout of the Albany managed with the Queens, and he said Tom always shoes his horses with country nails, and consequently throws a shoe before he has gone three fields, which enables him to pull up and lament his ill luck. He then gets it put on, and has a glorious ride home in red, landing at the Piccadilly end of the Albany about dusk. He then goes down to the Acacia, or some other club, and having ordered his dinner, retires to one of the dressing-rooms to change, having had, to his mind, a delightful day. Beware of the girls! There's nothing so dangerous as a young man staying in a country house with pretty girls. He is sure to fall in love with one or other of them imperceptibly, or one or other of them is sure to fall in love with him, and then, when at length he leaves, there is sure to be a little scene arranged, Miss with her red eyelids and lace-fringed kerchief, Mama with her smirks and smiles, and hopes that he'll soon return, and so on. 
There are more matches made up in country houses than in all the West End London ones put together. Indeed, London is always allowed to be only the cover for finding the game in, and the country the place for running it down. Just as you find your fox in a wood and run him down in the open. Be careful, therefore, what you are about. It is much easier to get entangled with a girl than to get free again for though they will always offer to set a young man free, they know better than to do it, unless, indeed, they have secured something better. Above all, never consult a male friend in these matters. The stupidest woman that ever was born is better than the cleverest man in love affairs. In fact, no man is a match for a woman until he's married. Not all, even then. The worst of young men is, they never know their worth until it is too late. They think the girls are difficult to catch, whereas there is nothing so easy, unless, as I said before, the girls are better engaged. Indeed, a young man should always have his mamma at his elbow, to guard him against the machinations of the fair. As, however, that cannot be, let me urge you to be cautious what you are about, and as you seem to have plenty of choice, don't be more attentive to one sister than to another by which means you will escape the red eyelids, and also escape having Mamma declared you have trifled with Maria or Sophia's feelings, and all the old women of the neighborhood denouncing your conduct and making up to you themselves for one of their own girls. Some ladies ask a man's intentions before he is well aware that he has any himself, but these are the spoilsport order of women. Most of them are prudent enough to get a man well hooked before they hand him over to Papa, it is generally a case of ask mamma first. Beware of brothers. I have known undoubted heiresses crumpled up into nothing by the appearance, after the catch, of two or three great heavy dragooners. Rogier will find all that out for you. Be cautious, too, about letter writing. There is no real privacy about love letters, any more than there is about the flags and banners of a regiment, though they occasionally furl and cover them up. The love letters are a woman's flags and banners, her trophies of success, and the more flowery they are, the more likely to be shown, and to aid in enlivening a Christmas tea party. Then the girls' mamas read them, their sisters read them, their maids read them, and ultimately, perhaps, a boisterous, energetic barrister reads them to an exasperated jury, some of whose daughters may have suffered from similar effusions themselves. <sighs> Altogether, I assure you, you are on very ticklish ground and I make no doubt if you could ascertain the opinion of the neighborhood, you are booked for one or other of the girls. So again I say, my dearest boy, beware what you are about, for it is much easier to get fast than to get free again. Get a lady of rank and not the daughter of a little scrubby squire, and whatever you do, don't leave this letter lying about, and mind, empty your pockets at night, and don't leave it for Rogier to find. Now, about your movements... I think I wouldn't go back to Lord L's unless he asks you, or unless he named a specific day for your doing so when you came away. Mere general invitations mean nothing. They are only the small coin of good society. Sorry you're going. Hope we shall soon meet again. Hope we shall have the pleasure of seeing you to dinner some day. Is a very common mean-nothing form of politeness. Indeed, I, I question that your going to a master of harriers from Tetteby Castle would be any great recommendation to his lordship, for masters of foxhounds and masters of harriers are generally at variance. Altogether, I think I would pause and consider before you decided upon returning. I would not talk much about your lordship where you now are, as it would look as if you were not accustomed to great people. You'll find plenty of friends ready to bring him in for you just as Mr. Handicock brings in Lord Privilege and Peter Simple. We all like talking of titles. Remember, all noblemen under the rank of dukes are lords in common conversation. No earls or marquises, then. It just occurs to me that as you are in the neighborhood, you might take advantage of the opportunity for paying a visit to Yonting and Hot Wells, where you will find a great deal of good society assembled at this time of year and where you might pick up some useful and desirable acquaintances. Go to the best hotel, whatever it is, and put Rogier on board wages, which will get rid of his grumbling. It is impertinent, no doubt, but still it carries weight in a certain quarter. As you have got a hunting horse, you will want a groom, 
and should try to get a nice-looking one. He should not be knock-kneed, on the contrary bow-legged, the sort of legs that a pig can pop through. Look an applicant over first, and if his appearance is against him, just put him off quietly by taking his name and address, and say that there are one or two before him, and that you will write to him if you are likely to require his services. You will soon have plenty to choose from, but it is hard to say whether the tricks of the town ones, or the gaucheries of the country ones, are most objectionable. The latter never put on their boots and upper things properly. A slangy, slovenly-looking fellow should be especially avoided. Also men with great shock heads of hair. If they can't trim themselves, there will not be much chance of them trimming their horses. In short, I believe a groom, a man who really knows and cares anything about horses, is a very difficult person to get. There are plenty who can hiss and fuss and be busy upon nothing, but very few who can both dress a horse and dress themselves. I know Lord Ladythorne makes it a rule never to take one who has been brought up in the racing stable, for he says they are all hurrying and gallop, and for putting two hours' exercise into one. Whatever you do, don't take one without a character, for however people may gloss over their late servant's faults and imperfections, and however abject and penitent the applicants may appear, rely upon it, nature will out, and as soon as ever they get up their condition, as they call it, or are installed into their new clothes, they begin to take liberties, and ultimately relapse into their old, drunken, dissolute habits. It is fortunate for the world that most of them carry their characters in their faces. Besides, it isn't fair to respectable servants to bring them in contact with these sort of profligates. Whatever you do, don't let him find his own clothes. There isn't one in twenty who can be trusted to do so, and nothing looks worse than the half-livery, half-plain, wholly shabby clothes some of them adopt. It is wonderful what things they will vote good if they have to find others themselves, things that they would declare would not fit to put on and they wouldn't be seen in if master supplied them. The best of everything, then, is only good enough for them. Some of them will grumble and growl whatever you give them, declare this man's cloth is bad and another's boots inferior, and recommend you go to Mr. Somebody Else, who Mr. This or Captain That employs, Mr. This or Captain That having, in all probability, been recommended to this Mr. Somebody by some other servant. The same with the saddlers and tradespeople generally. If you employ a saddler who does not tip them, there will be nothing bad enough for his workmanship, or they will declare he does not do that sort of work, only farmer's work, cart trappings, and such like things. The remedy for this is to pay your own bills and give the servants to understand at starting that you mean to be master. They are to be had on your own terms, if you only begin as you mean to go on. If the worst comes to the worst, a month's notice or a month's pay settles all differences and it is no use keeping and paying a servant that doesn't suit you. Perhaps you will think Rogier trouble enough, but he would be highly offended if you were to ask him to valet a horse. I will try, if I hear of anything likely to suit you, but the old saying, who shall counsel a man in the choice of a wife or a horse, applies with equal force to grooms. And now, my own dearest boy, having given you all the advice and assistance in my power, I will conclude by repeating what joy the arrival of your letter occasioned me, and also my advice to beware of the girls, and request that you will not leave this letter in your pockets, or lying about, by signing myself ever, my own dearest son, your most truly loving and affectionate mamma, Emma Pringle. P.S. I will enclose the halves of two fifty-pound notes for the horse, the receipt of which please to acknowledge by return of post, when I will send the other halves. P.S. Mind the red eyelids. There's nothing so infectious. End of chapter 26. Recording by Todd. Chapter 27 of Ask Mama. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ryan Williams. Ask Mama, or The Richest Commoner in England, by Robert Smith Surtees. Chapter 27. Sir Moses Mainchance. Our friend Billy, as the foregoing letter shows, was now very comfortably installed in his quarters, 
and his presence brought sundry visitors, as well to pay their respects to him and the family, as to see how matters were progressing. Mr. and Mrs. Rocket Larkspur, Mrs. Blurkins, and Mrs. Dotherington. Also, Mrs. Crickleton came after their castor oil entertainment, and Mrs. and Miss Wasperton, accompanied by their stiff friend, Miss Freezer, who had the reputation of being very satirical. Then there were Mr. Tight and Miss Neat, chaperoned by fat Mrs. Plumberry of Hollingdale Lodge and several others. In fact, Billy had created a sensation in the country, such godsends as a London dandy not being of everyday occurrence in the country, and everybody wanted to see the great catch. How they magnified him! His own mother wouldn't have known him under the garbs he assumed. Now, a lord's son. Now, a baronet's. Now, the richest commoner in England. With, oh, glorious recommendation. No papa to consult in the matter of a wife. Some said not even a mama, but there the reader knows they were wrong. In proportion as they lauded Billy, they decried Mrs. Yammerton. She was a nasty, cunning, designing woman, always looking after somebody. Mrs. Wasperton, alluding to Billy's age, declared that it was just like kidnapping a child, and she inwardly congratulated herself that she had never been guilty of such meanness. Billy, on his part, was airified and gay, showing off to the greatest advantage, perfectly unconscious that he was the observed of all observers. Like Mrs. Moffat, he never had the same dress on twice, and was splendid in his jewelry. Among the carriage company who came to greet him was the sporting baronet, Sir Moses Mainchance, whose existence we have already indicated being the same generous gentleman that presented Major Yammerton with a horse, and then made him pay for it. Sir Moses had heard of Billy's opulence, and being a man of great versatility, he saw no reason why he should not endeavor to partake of it. He now came grinding up in his dog-cart with his tawdry cockaded groom, for he was a deputy lieutenant of Hitham at Haltamshire to lay the foundation of an invitation, and was received with the usual, wow, 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 of fury, the terrier, and the coat shuffling of the bumbler. If the late handsome recorder of London had to present this ugly old file to the judges as one of the sheriffs of London and Middlesex, he would most likely introduce him in such terms as the following. My lords, I have the honor to present to your lordships <coughs> Notice Sir Moses Mainchance, <coughs> Baronet, and <coughs> Fox Hunter, who had been unanimously chosen by the <coughs> Livery of London to fill the high and important <coughs> office of Sheriff of that ancient and opulent city. My lords, Sir Moses, as his name indicates, is of Jewish origin. His great-grandfather, Mr. Moses Levy, I believe dealt in complicated penknives, dog collars, and street sponges. His grandfather, more ambitious, enlarged his sphere of action and embarked in the old clothesline. He had a very extensive shop in the minories and dealt in rhubarb and gum arabic as well. He married a lady of the name of Smith, not an uncommon name in this country, who, inheriting a large fortune from her uncle, Mr. Mainchance, Mr. Moses Levy embraced Christianity, and dropping the name of Levy, became Mr. Mainchance, Mr. Moses Mainchance, the founder of the present most important and distinguished family. His son, the sheriff-elect's father also carried on the business in the minories, adding, very largely to his already abundant wealth, 
and espousing a lady of the name of Brown. In addition to the hereditary trade, he opened a curiosity shop in the west of London, where, being of highly benevolent disposition, he accommodated young gentlemen whose parents were penurious, unjustly penurious, of course, with such sums of money as their stations in life seemed likely to enable them to repay. But, my lords, the usury laws, as your lordships will doubtless recollect, being then in full operation, to the great detriment of heirs at law, Mr. Mainchance, feeling for the difficulties of the young, introduced an ingenious mode of evading them, whereby some article of vertu, generally a picture or something of that sort, was taken as half, or perhaps three-quarters of the loan, and having passed into the hands of the borrower, was again returned to Mr. Mainchance at its real worth. A Carlo Dolce, or a coal pit, as your lordships doubtless know, being capable of representing any given sum of money. This gentleman, my lords, the sheriff-elect's father, having at length paid the debt of nature, the only debt I believe that he was ever slow in discharging. The opulent gentleman who now stands at my side, and whom I have the honor of presenting to the court, was enabled through one of these monetary transactions to claim the services of a distinguished politician, now no more, and obtain the hereditary rank which he so greatly adorns. On becoming a baronet, Sir Moses Mainchance withdrew from commercial pursuits and set up for a gentleman, purchasing the magnificent estate of Pangburn Park, in Hitham and Holdhamshire, of which county he is a deputy lieutenant, getting together an unrivaled pack of foxhounds, second to none, as I am instructed, and hunting the country with great circumspection, and he requests me to add, he will be most proud and happy to see your lordships, to take a day with his hounds whenever it suits you, and also to dine with him this evening, in the splendid guild hall of the ancient and renowned city of London. The foregoing outline, coupled with Sir Moses's treatment of the major, will give the reader some idea of the character of the gentleman who had sought the society of our hero. In truth, if nature had not made him the meanest, Sir Moses would have been the most liberal of mankind, for his life was a continual struggle between the magnificence of his offers and the penury of his performances. He was perpetually forcing favors upon people and then backing out when he saw they were going to be accepted. It required no little face to encounter the victim of such a recent due as the Major's, but Sir Moses was not to be foiled when he had an object in view. Telling his groom to stay at the door, and asking, in a stentorian voice, if Mr. Pringle is at home, so that there may be no mistake as to whom he is calling upon, the baronet is now ushered into the drawing-room, where the dandified Billy sits in all the dangerous proximity of three pretty girls without their mamma. Mrs. Yammerton knew when to be out. "'Good morning, young ladies,' exclaims Sir Moses gaily greeting them all round. Mr. Pringle, continued he, turning to Billy, allow me to introduce myself. I believe I have the pleasure of addressing a nephew of my excellent old friend, Sir Jonathan Pringle, and I shall be most happy if I can contribute in any way to your amusement while in this neighborhood. Tell me now, continued he, without waiting for Billy's admission or rejection of kindred with Sir Jonathan. Tell me now, when you are not engaged in this delightful way, smiling round on the beauties, would you like to come and have a day with my hounds? Billy shuddered at the very thought, but quickly recovering his equanimity, he replied, Yars, he should like it very much. Oh, Mr. Pringle's a mighty hunter, exclaimed Miss Yammerton, who really thought he was. Very good, exclaimed Sir Moses. Very good. Then I'll tell you what we'll do. 
We meet on Monday at the Crooked Billet on the Bushmead Road, Tuesday at Stubbington Hill, Thursday, Woolerton by Heckfield, Saturday, the Kennels. Suppose now you come to me on Sunday. I would have said Saturday, only I'm engaged to dine with Lord Oilcake. But you wouldn't mind coming over on Sunday, I dare say, would you? And without waiting for an answer, he went on to say, Come on Sunday. I'll send my dog cart for you, the thing I have at the door. We'll then hunt Monday and Tuesday, dine at the club at Hinton on Wednesday, where we have always a capital dinner, and a party of excellent fellows, good singing, and all sorts of fun, and take Thursday at Woolerton, in your way home, draw Shawley Moss, the Wilthy Beds at Langton, Tangleton Break, and so on, but sure to find before we get to the break, for there were swarms of foxes on the moss the last time we were there, and the capital good ones they are. Dommed if they aren't, so no, I think you couldn't be better Thursday, and I'll have two stalled stable ready for you on Sunday. So that's a bargain. Ay, young ladies, isn't it? Appealing to our fair friends. And now, fine Billy, who had been anxiously waiting to get a word in sideways, while all of this dread enjoyment was paraded, proceeded to make a vigorous effort to deliver himself from it. He was very much obliged to this unknown friend of his unknown uncle, Sir Jonathan, but he had only one horse, and was afraid he must decline. "'Only one horse!' exclaimed Sir Moses. "'Only one horse! Who had heard he had ten? Ah, well... Never mind, thinking he would sell him one. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll mount you on the Tuesday. I'll mount you on the Tuesday. Dommed if I won't. And that'll make it all right. And that'll make it all right. So extending his hand, he said, Come on Sunday, then. Come on Sunday. And, bowing round to the ladies, he backed out of the room, lest his friend the major might appear and open his grievance about the horse. Billy then accompanied him to the door, where Sir Moses, pointing to the gaudy vehicle, said, Ah, there's the dog cart, you see. There's the dog cart. Much at your service. Much at your service. Adding, as he placed his foot upon the step to ascend, Our friend the major here, I make no doubt, will lend you a horse to put in it and between ourselves, concluded he in a lower tone, you may as well try if you can't get him to lend you a second horse to bring with you. So saying, Sir Moses again shook hands most fervently with his young friend, the nephew of Sir Jonathan, and mounting the vehicle, soused down in his seat, and drove off with the air of a Jew bailiff in his Sunday best. End of Chapter 27 Read by Ryan Williams